2023, our 11th annual festival of behavioral science. Woo! I'm Carla Hendra. I'm the global CEO of Ogilvy Consulting, and I'm joined here today by Ann Higgins, uh, who is our CEO for consulting in EMEA and looks after behavioral science globally. And behavioral science is, uh, consulting is the home for it within the Ogilvy network. We're both really, really thrilled to see everybody, the sold out room, which is great, as well as the thousands who are live streaming uh, around the world to the world's biggest festival of creativity and behavioral science. So fasten your seatbelts, as the screen just told us. It's going to get messy. That's on purpose. That's the theme. We want everybody to let their minds be free, uh, and we're going to put those minds in the hands of our behavioral science team. Just before we do that, I'd like to just talk for a minute about Ogilvy, uh, and uh, on behalf of our global CEO, Devika Bulchandani, who has been leading the company for just under a year, and who set a vision for us that Ogilvy would inspire brands and people to impact the world. And that's partly why we're here today, is to talk about how we use behavioral science and creativity to create impact, because it has immense power. The way that we've um, used the, the science and, the, and sometimes the art of, of behavioral science uh, is really interesting, and we've done it for over 10 years, and with some fantastic leadership by, of course, the inimitable uh, Rory Sutherland, who's here today, and you're going to hear from a lot, Chris Graves, who's also here, and Sam Tatum. So thank you to all of our brilliant leadership. Uh, but what they've taught us to do is to learn how to uncover and to discover, to reveal what, what really our, our consumers, the people, the, the, everyone that we try to convince through our creative work, we, we can't really get them to tell us, even if we ask and even if they really want to, how they really feel, what they, uh, whatever they may think or say, there's something else. And so getting underneath the hood and understanding what people are really about and what really moves them and what could change them. That is why we do this work. Um, as with last year, uh, when we were only virtual for the last couple of years, we have thousands online and we have a big diversity in, uh, in, in the attendees today. And that's not an accident because we think the impact comes from being able to bring great diversity of thought, great diversity of ideas together with our knowledge of behavioral science, and, and we have this powerful, powerful combination. And that's where the impact comes from. So without any more, I'm going to turn over to Ann Higgins. She's going to introduce the day, and we'll take it from there. I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you. As Carla said, behavioral science is it's central to what we do in Ogilvy Consulting. It's central to what we do uh, in Ogilvy more broadly. And what you'll see today is the potential for behavioral science insights to become the impact unlock for a whole host of challenges, to drive preference for brands and services, to create passion among advocates and communities, to innovate new products and services, and to drive policy change and enduring change in society and for the planet. We're gonna hear from leading academics and experts and practitioners. We'll see examples of behavioral science in action, We'll discuss and debate, uh, and over and above the amazing agenda in store, I'm really thrilled to welcome over 100 brands and other organizations here in the Tru Truman Brewery, and to welcome the thousands registered to join us online from more than 60 countries. So welcome everybody also on the live stream. And for those who have been to Nudge Talk before, isn't it great to be back in the room together after three years of virtual nudge stock? Just have a moment of gratitude. Um, our last IRL nudge stock was in Folkestone in 2019, and now we've come full circle back to Shoreditch where we had the first ever nudge stock in 2013. So great to be back in Shoreditch. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, get ready for live experimentation, a lot of mess, a lot of Rory, Quite frankly, anything could happen. Uh, it is my pleasure now to hand you over to our hosts to kick off the day's proceedings. Please put your hands together 
for our behavioural science practice lead in the UK, Dan Bennett, and consulting partner, Tara Austin. We already did it. Hello, Hello Nudge Suckers! Hello! Hands up if you think the world is a bit of a mess right now. Keep them up if you want to understand the mess. And keep them up if you think you are a little bit messy. Well, we've got the rest of the day to persuade any of you that didn't have your hands up of your own messy makeup. How are we going to do that, Dan? We're going to do that by uniting the planet's boldest and brightest thinkers. And in this day of, of incredible variety, you're going to learn everything from how artificial intelligence is going to change your vote and how sounds are going to get help you spend more. And talking of AI, every word you're going to hear today is going to emanate from the mouths and the messy minds of uniquely human intelligence, which actually brings us to our theme, because it wasn't prompted by a prompt and a billion data points. It was prompted, it was stimulated, if you will, by a tweet from one of our favorite old nudge dockers, uh, Jeffrey Miller, back in January this year, and it reads, evolution, your moral intuitions and values evolve to promote survival and reproduction, not to be logically consistent with each other. Moral philosophers, but they must be made logically consistent. Evolution, good luck. Moral philosophers try for 2,500 years and fail. This tweet, in its very own messy way, stimulated us, our team, to think about the fact that evolution has not designed us to be consistent. It has not even designed us to be homogeneous as a species. Each one of you sitting here today is in possession of the most complex object in the known universe. Every single one of you is more complicated than the stars. You're a magnificent machine. And you've been formed, yes, by evolution, by genetics, by nature, nurture, and noise by the random experiences of your lives. And we're hoping to throw a little bit more random noise into that messy system today, because evolution didn't design you to be consistent, and it didn't design you to fit neatly into a PowerPoint deck. Humanity is not meant to fit neatly into a PowerPoint deck, and that is OK. So we could deny this complexity, but we thought we'd take a good Friday all together to embrace it together. So instead of burying our heads into the sands, collectively, we will embrace this chaos across four broad themes today. Our first theme is all about our messy and chaotic world. By the end of the morning, you'll be able to better persuade people with numbers. You'll know why we're coming at the AI conversation from completely the wrong direction. And at the end of Rory's talk, you'll know why you're a little bit too more, you're a little bit too more argumentative than you should be. After our first uh, break, we will then give some guidance on how to manage the mess. And we'll learn from some masters of the mess, some global brands like Heineken and Hellman's, some behavioral thinkers working with some of the world's biggest vaccine manufacturers. And the reason for this is that Nudge Talk is not just a conference of behavioral science. It is a celebration of creativity within behavioral science, the kind of creativity, the kind of innovation and ingenuity that is driving our field forward. And, and this kind of innovation is what we want you to experience and see today from behind the scenes. Talking of innovation, we'll then learn how to measure our mess. How do you measure an attitude like misogyny? How does your vagus nerve tell us which is your favorite nudge stock speaker? What even is your vagus nerve? All will be <laughs> revealed. And for those of you in the room, some of you in the room, there's going to be some live experiments conducted. Lastly, when we're really settling into the afternoon, uh, we're going to talk about you. We're going to talk about your messy humanity, the humanity that you share with everybody else in this room, everyone you've ever tried to influence, and everyone you are ever going to try to influence. And there'll be uh, professors of sleep, of brain health, and there'll even be a surprise performance um, to bring to life how we might even biohack our own bodies. Talking of biohacking, we will break for the all-important toilet, which are at the back of the venue and on your right-hand side on the way out. We're not planning a fire alarm today, so if you do hear one, please note your nearest emergency exit now.
And that was for the people in the room, not the people on the Zoom. Um, but we have, this is the world's biggest festival of behavioral science. And you guys get to be here. And you guys get to be here. And I hear that we have in the room Lithuania. <laughs> the Netherlands. We have some French people, I think, some France. <laughs> they all sound different, don't they? <laughs> Woohoo! Um, and, uh, and USA. Yeah, there we go. And online, we have Australia, we have India. At some point later today, we'll have Colombia waking up. Um, <laughs> there we go. He's here already. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> On which note, come in Ho Chi Minh. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Hello, Ho Chi Minh. The there you will see a watch party in Ogre, Vietnam. You have Paolo Mercado, our head of behavioral science in the APAC region, waving behind that man's head there. And um, Paolo, what are you most excited about? We're excited about. <laughs> Paolo, step to the side, Paolo. Step to the side. You know, we, we are so clever that we created a theme where if anything goes wrong, it's just messy. It's like, if you ever shot. doubted the intelligence of the Ogilvy Behavioral Science Practice, you know now. Brilliant, perfect, and he's in shot. Thank you. Go, Paolo. Yes. So we're, we're very excited joining you in this uh, live and over to you there in London. We're most excited about the, uh, the topic of mess and messiness and then right, uh, walking around, running around the streets of Vietnam, where you can get hit by a motorcycle at any time. I think we really live. Where you fear it, but you don't get hit. So there is magic in the mix. Well, we we might need so, Paolo uh, closer yeah. to the mic. Some oh, waves, some waves. Thank, waves. You, Thank you so much, Thank Paolo. You, it's we did say it's going to be a mess, didn't it? we? It's good to be back. <laughs> um, I just hope they can hear us better than we can hear them. We are proud to bring together even like that, a global event for you today. Whether you're a curious newcomer or a behavioral old hand, everyone's welcome. And nudge talk. Above all, we want to stimulate you today. That's right. And we want to stimulate you with something that's outside of your day job, outside of your current thinking. And then maybe we even want to help you apply that. Because this is not training, and this is not really a conference. It is a festival. It is a festival of everything that we are as the human species, everything that we understand about ourselves and the, and the future of our species. On which note, we will welcome the first speaker to the stage, the best of our species. As founder of Ogilvy Consulting's behavioral science practice, Rory Sutherland is why many of us in the room and on the stream even know about behavioral science in the first place. He's a TED legend, he's the wiki man, he's an alchemist, he's also the vice chairman of Ogilvy UK. We never know what he's going to say next, but we can guarantee it's brilliance. Please put your hands together for Rory Sutherland. <laughs> this. I think there's a really vital question, which is that um, about 90% of success in business, actually most success in uh, science in pharmaceuticals, is actually highly messy, non-linear, non-directional. Most of the effort in business is devoted to pretending that's not true. It's, it's basically devoted towards pretending upwards uh, that things make much more sense than they really do. And I think there's a cost we pay when we do this, OK? There's a huge cost we pay whenever we pretend things are neat, OK? Which is an opportunity cost, as economists would call it. It's effectively lost creative opportunities, which potential interesting ideas are destroyed whenever you design things to look neat from the top down. And the most interesting ideas tend to emerge from the bottom up. Actually, you know, scientific progress is much more penicillin than it is sequential logical activities all agreed in advance to reach some preordained goal. It's much more Viagra, it's much more penicillin. A huge amount of progress actually happens backwards, but unintentionally, I think, through our love of neatness, we're actually stopping that from happening. We're demanding that everything you do makes sense in advance. And we're designing a world for people who win arguments 
not for people who solve problems. You know, I think that you know, the political class are now designed to win top-down arguments, not to solve problems. In fact, they get into trouble when they solve a problem. I always found it strange that John Major was ridiculed for proposing a Cones hotline. Okay? It was considered far beneath the dignity of a prime minister who was supposed to be talking about interest rates or something. And yet it was at least, it still exists bizarrely, it was at least a small solution to a problem. And I think if we keep on elevating the argument winners over the problem solvers, that's where our fundamental stasis, that's why we get stuck. Because actually, being honest, there's some very senior clients in the room, but is there anybody here who can actually, in a work or institutional context, make a decision on their own? <laughs> I, I'm seriously asking that question. In the old days, you could, okay? But now, it's highly unlikely you can make any decision without reference to HR or the commissariat in finance, okay? Which means you've got to win an argument first before you can do anything. And once you make a requirement of anything you do, the need to win an argument in advance, A, it gives the finance department the right of veto over every single activity in the business, but also it limits the solution space by maybe 95%. If you can't do things that, to some small degree, don't quite make sense in advance, okay, you can't really innovate. And so, if you really want the sort of serious academic stuff about this, there's an extraordinary book called Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott, who rather weirdly wrote, um, wrote a book which is really an attack on the idea of the whole control economy, top-down control. And yet he's an anarchist anthropologist by background. But it's a very, very interesting book. There's a bit more about 19th century and 18th century German forestry than you may fundamentally want. But he, he unless you're really into that, of course, there will be three people in the room who go, hmm, OK. But he made the point that in order to make forestry look neat, the Germans adopted a top-down solution, which was to impose Norwegian spruce, which was the fastest growing form of timber, planted at equal intervals um, uh, everywhere throughout large German forests, because they thought that would maximise efficiency. And by the way, for a few years, it did. It worked very well, because Norwegian spruce grows very, very quickly. And that's one of the problems, by the way, about efficiency-seeking ideas. They tend to work in the short term. Because the actual hidden costs and the problems and the, uh, you know, uh, what you might call the, um, uh, the dangers only become apparent over time. What subsequently happened was a thing called Waldstuben, forest death, which is, first of all, if you're a parasite that pre plays, plays on uh, Norwegian spruce, okay, a monoculture forest is like a complete fantasy. Secondly, you destroyed all the effectively all the undergrowth, you destroyed all the ecosystems that used to survive in uh, mixed-use forestry, uh, which effectively meant that the quality of the soil very, very rapidly degraded. It was a catastrophe. But it made sense from the top. All the people imposing those instructions were going, this is really stupid, my, my patch of forest is totally unsuited to these trees, or it's full of rocks so we can't plant them at equal intervals, or the soil doesn't support this frequency of planting. But they were ignored because the essential thing was it had to make sense from the top. You could call it seeing like a corporation or seeing like a holding company if you wanted to be mischievous about this. But it's the idea that all data, all stories, all facts have to be aligned to be legible by the people at the top. Okay? And there's a massive hidden cost when you do this. I mean, the equivalent of this is Le Corbusier. This thing here is Le Corbusier's plan for Paris. I'm not making this up, OK? So you demolish all the buildings in Paris, you separate regions into work, residential and retail, OK? And he conceived this idea looking at Paris from the air. Now, two things there. One, if there's anything wrong with Paris, it really isn't the buildings, OK? <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah, cook breakfast would be a start, OK? <laughs> and secondly, what the hell is the point of designing a city that looks... That they're, you, you're, you must know Brasilia, right, don't you? OK? Which is a city that makes absolutely perfect sense when viewed from the air. The problem you face there is that most people don't live in the air, and so your efforts to make sense of an architectural conception... This, this comes down to the whole Robert Moses uh, versus Jane Jacobs 
debate. And Chris Graves tells me there was actually an opera composed about the fight in New York between Robert Moses and uh, Jane Jacobs. But this is the vital question. Do you want to solve problems or do you want to win arguments? Because to some degree, these are mutually exclusive, I would argue. That the urge to win arguments and to come to, come to a kind of QED forces you effectively to make assumptions that are highly dangerous, possibly erroneous, or just silly. And actually, the fact that we, we've created a culture, probably with the expansion of higher education, which cherishes argument winning over problem solving, seems to be fundamental. And um, th this is an interesting thing, which is that the, I, I've given you examples of bad top-down thinking. This is really bottom-up thinking, what Conan Doyle called thinking backward. Okay, And this is Sherlock Holmes speaking. In solving a problem of this sort, the grand thing is to be able to reason backward. It's a very useful accomplishment and a very easy one, but people do not practice it much. In the everyday affairs of life, it is more useful to reason forward, and so the other comes to be neglected. There are 50 who can reason synthetically for one who can reason analytically. That we've created a society where the ability to reason forwards is prized, encouraged, even taught, the ability to reason backwards requires creativity. It requires an act of imagination, OK? So reasoning forwards is kind of, this is true and therefore. And whenever you, you, know, whenever you look at most business slides, they're based on some bit of data, and you go, this is true, and therefore we should do something else. Okay? That's just reasoning forwards. And people like it because there's no subjectivity involved, so you can't get blamed for your conclusions. OK? The alternative, the creative alternative, is to ask the question, what, to be, what would have to be true if? If we want more people to do this, can we imagine a world which is designed, an environment, a context, a form of messaging, doesn't matter what, can we invent or imagine something where things would be different? And that is inherently creative. And so we created this world where most of our world is Darwin, but we're pretending it's Newton, effectively. You know, most of the world is, you know, really we need a theory about how things change. But what we're trying to do, as Jeffrey Miller spotted in that tweet, is we're trying to cram them into immutable, consistent laws all the time. And the creative opportunity cost that arises, and I think, by the way, the creative community, the advertising community, have acquired a kind of Stockholm syndrome where they've started to acquire the attributes of their abusers. Instead of saying, you're full of shit, the data you've got is irrelevant, we go, ooh, yes, data and accountability, they're so important, we can do that too. Okay? <laughs> and I think it's fundamentally a mistake. Notice this total asymmetry in all business life. Complete, absolutely unvarying asymmetry. Creative people always have to present their ideas to rational people. By the way, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Okay? What's really weird about it is it never happens the other way around. You never get a bunch of people in the finance department who go, I think the answer is 3.75, but before I present this to the shareholders, I'm going to ask some wacky people whether they've got some alternative ideas. Never fucking happens, right? <laughs> never, ever happens. This is a quote proving, I think, that actually the problem is older than we think. If you really want to go deep into the psychology of this, there are various books by um, Ian McGilchrist, for example, The Master and His Emissary. This is bizarrely, I didn't know this until recently, um, uh, my fourth cousin, Woodrow Wilson, uh, who said, um, I wasn't nearly as surprised when I discovered my third cousin was Miss Teen South Carolina, by the way. <laughs> that, that was a bit more surprising. Okay. We have not given science too big a place in our education, but we've made a perilous mistake in giving it too great a preponderance in method in every other branch of study. In other words, when we can't do science, we pretend we can, and we impose scientific method on problems which are totally ill-suited to that. Hayek went on about this a lot. Okay? And there's a big difference between, if you want to win an argument, you just use the data you have, right? If you want to solve a problem, you ask, what actually do we need to know here to find out what's going on? And maybe you have that data, maybe you don't. But when I first became a creative director in Ogilvy, um, Mike Walsh, who ran Ogilvy Europe at the time, gave me a copy of this fairly hokey book by a guy called, I think, Robert Updegraff, called Obvious Adams. And it's a kind of 1920s American kind of folky business advice book. And I was, I was a tiny bit peaked, you know. I thought, you know, can, can you give me a subscription to Harvard Business Review or something? Rather than, and then actually, 
Two months later, I got round to actually reading the book, and it's fantastic. If nobody's read it, um, th that book, Obvious Adams, is, it's, it's about you know, th you know, 2,000 words or something, or 5,000 words. It's actually brilliant. And it's about a guy who basically solves problems by looking at things and looking at them differently. Now, it occurs to me, okay, this is, a, for those of you who don't know, and um, apologies to people in Ho Chi Minh City for whom this is going to become a bit weird, um, this is, John, this is what used to be the John Lewis store in Tunbridge Wells, in the retail park in Tunbridge Wells. It closed down because it went bust. Now, if you look at the data you have, you'd say, OK, let's look at the demography of Tunbridge Wells. Let's look at the population size. Let's look at the catchment area. We clearly can't make a John Lewis store work in that kind of place. OK? Now, may or may not be true, by the way, but you're only looking at the data you have. If you actually go to Tunbridge Wells and look at the John Lewis with the mind of a Darwin, not of a Newton, OK, what you pretty, pretty quickly realize is, one, it has its own car park. So you have to make a specific journey to go there. You can't go to PC World and then have a shifty around John Lewis. Problem number one. Problem number two, the signage that's at the entrance to that car park uh, is actually after the entrance to the car park. That's not a great idea. Putting signage after the turn, never a great idea. Thirdly, it's only really convenient to turn into the car park uh, when you're leaving the retail park. OK? So people coming in won't go there. It's only people leaving. Fourthly, the signage in the entrance is put on the narrowest edge of the store, which makes the store look about a quarter of the size it actually is. OK? Right? But fifthly, they've called it John Lewis at home for some reason. OK? Why? OK? Well, the reason is, technically, OK, it doesn't sell women's clothes and cosmetics. So why not just call it John Lewis for blokes? OK? <laughs> um, but seriously speaking, why not just call it John Lewis? Because about... I've, and I've spoken to people who live locally. Sorry, just... This is getting a bit Kent-specific, OK? Um, <laughs> Many people who looked locally, and about 60% of them assumed when they saw at home, think home sense, since think home base, they assumed it was just a furniture store. And since only 5% of people are in the market for furniture at any one time, okay, and maybe you know three of those 5% are desperate that their spouse doesn't get the opportunity to look at any furniture, okay, generally, if people think you're a furniture store, you're not going to get great footfall. So what I mean is that if you look for explanations from the top down using data you have, you'll come to totally different conclusions than if you go bottom up and actually say, what is it we need to know? Now, funnily enough, there's actually a film about this. It's called The Big Short. I think it's one of the best films of the last 20 years. And it features very, very interesting people who actually go and find out the data they need. Lots and lots of people in banks in New York all had aggregate data that told them everything was fine. What you needed to do, in this specific case, was go to Florida and speak to a stripper who had eight mortgages. I'm not suggesting that. I mean, that could be a policy for all problem solving. I, I, suspect, <laughs> I, I suspect people would take an issue with it. Uh, WPP travel policy or some tedious document like that. But, but they went and asked the right people. They actually went on the ground and saw that what looked perfectly sensible and neat and comprehensible in New York was a total shit show on the ground. And they actually went and they, they didn't ask the question, what data have we got? They asked the question, what data do we need? And that strikes me as just a fundamentally huge um, distinction. Now, interestingly, and thanks to my colleague David Fanner for this, um, the um, Royal Society of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce recently published a paper on design thinking. And they said, fundamentally, I won't go into the whole detail, but it shows both divergent and convergent thinking in this particular graph. You don't need to understand the whole graph. What's significant about the graph is they call this the missing first diamond, which is a period, I would say, of completely comfortable messiness at the beginning of every brief, whereas rather than trying to proceed down a linear process, we actually go, we ask the question, what is really going on here? In a completely open-minded, experimental, exploratory way. And I think even creative businesses, which should know better, have failed to incorporate this first messy diamond in any process. Before we make any assumptions about what tool might be used to solve this problem, let's just ask various questions about what's really going on. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, by the way, interestingly, Antonis, who I think is here today, is that right? 
Uh, Antonis made the point that um, uh, one of the reasons you have difficulty getting business as a behavioral science practice is because you operate in that missing first diamond. Put bluntly, no one has a budget for solving a problem they didn't know they had. Okay, so the business of diagnostics is being completely underexplored, I think, in the creative world. The other thing is, averages are horrible. What we mostly do when we present information upwards in order to make it comprehensible, because the people at the top don't really know what's going on, okay? I mean, those of you who are at the top will kind of acknowledge that by saying that, you know, the more you get promoted, the less you really have a clue about what's really happening. So in other words, you're forced to live on a diet of averages and aggregations. And yet this scientist here, talking to um, Roger L. Martin, uh, makes the point that he, he's a, a, a specialist in autism spectrum disorder, extremely successful Canadian academic. He says, it's the outliers that tell the story. Never criticize something for being anecdotal. In fact, Jeff Bezos says, uh, when I find a conflict between the data and the anecdotes, I normally find it's the data that are wrong, okay? Anecdotes are important because they tend to be about outliers. And it's the outliers that probably carry the greatest freight in solving a problem. They're useless for winning an argument, but they're really, really useful if you want to solve a problem. And um, the, again, the great problem is that you know, we, um, uh, we've created a world where most people, most of the time, are asked to be performing rational actions. But actually, what we forget and what marketers we need to be more confident about is if you don't actually win at the emotional level, all those 100,000, this is Kumal Galhotra, who's the uh, head of Ford North America, by the way. Um, uh, and they, you know, they learned that, by the way. You know, it's, it's fundamentally true. You can get everything right. One of the strange things that they find Volkswagen an enormous amount of money, considering there were amazingly few Volkswagens in the United States. And the reason for that, by the way, is because they got the 100,000 rational decisions right, but the German engineers in Volkswagen refused to include cup holders in the car. Okay. Now, anybody who knows American car purchasing habits knows that number of cup holders comes somewhere like number two or three in the decision tree, you know, well above cornering ability, okay? <laughs> so, you can win the 100,000 irrational decisions, and lots of people get promoted for doing exactly just that, but if you don't win the emotional decision at the bottom, okay, you don't sell the car. Now, interestingly... This is a perfect case of bottom-up thinking versus top-down thinking in Ford North America. Now, what Ford North America wanted to do was to create a separate electric car division with completely new brands. And they create a new brand in the sports utility vehicle sector, the crossover utility vehicle sector, the subcompact, uh, you know, the pickup truck, okay? And they create new electric brands, and then they keep all the existing brands in the old petrol division because that was neat from the top. It was 18th century German forestry. It all made sense from a top-down perspective, okay? And then Roger Martin, I did ask him permission to tell this story. I don't know if anybody reads his books. The Canadian, he was the dean of the Rotman um, Business School in Toronto, absolutely brilliant guy. He had a massive argument with them, which he eventually won. And he said, looked at from the perspective of the customer, not from the perspective of the managerial suite, you've got five real strengths here if you want to sell an electric car. And they are Mustang, Bronco, Explorer, F-150, Transit. Okay? Go and make electric versions of those instead. Don't make new brands. Take your existing brands and electrify them. And this caused a bit of a row because they said, well, the F-150 customer surely doesn't want an electric vehicle. Actually, if you design an F-150 for electrification, you don't sell it on the basis of its environmental credentials, okay? You sell it on the fact that if your power goes down in your house because it's been cut off by communists, you can run your house off your truck, okay? <laughs> now, that's not great if you belong to Greenpeace, but if you're a bit of a doomsday prepper, that's music, right? <laughs> but what they've done is they've... Must I bought the Mustang myself, okay? It's utterly fantastic. I, and I, people say, why did you do that? And I said, well, if I buy an electric car, I'm cool, but... I want a bit of Detroit in it somewhere, okay? You know, I want a bit of a feeling that it's, you know, metal, that it hasn't just been software, okay? But the point I'm making here is that this was an extraordinary case of thinking of the problem from the customer upwards, not thinking of it from sense-making downwards. And every time you do sense-making downwards, the customer gets left out. The customer gets aggregated. This is probably a quote, yeah, this is Mark Ritson, the average is the enemy of the marketer. Okay. 
What we do when we present information upwards is we aggregate it and average it. The act of aggregation destroys what's really interesting about that data in the first place, which is the anomalies and the outliers. Okay? That was what that scientist in Canada was doing. He said, you know, I look at all these things on a scatter plot, I put a ring around all the things that are clustered together, and then I go and investigate the things that are far out. And in the same way, once you average, okay, it only allows for one answer, so you're massively limiting your creative solution space, and the answer is usually wrong and almost inevitably boring. If you think about it, okay, if through some weird AI genetic program you could produce someone who is the average of all your friends, you probably wouldn't like them very much and they'd be extremely dull, okay? It's a fundamental problem. And this is my fundamental question about what I call the creative opportunity cost. What if, and I think there are, there are far more good ideas we can post-rationalise than are good ideas we can pre-rationalise? In other words, if you demand that someone wins an argument first, and remember, all big data comes from the same place, the past. So big data in itself is skewed because it's skewed towards what used to happen. And even measurement and accountability is heavily skewed towards what happens fast rather than what happens slowly. Okay? Even if you account for those biases, I think that the demand that something makes complete logical and consistent sense is actually a massive limitation on creative discovery. I think it's too big an ask. It's fine in Newtonian physics. It's absolutely fine in engineering. It's fine in any field of science where the laws can only be as they are. Okay? Right? You can't change the laws of gravity, so therefore making the assumption that gravity is going to be the same tomorrow as it was yesterday is a pretty safe bet. You can't do that with a market. You can't do that with human psychology. In human psychology, you can rewrite the rules yourself. Also, when you have an average, you assume there's only one right idea, there's only one good idea. What I discovered is actually, quite often in marketing, the opposite of a good idea is another good idea. And I've got a story to tell you about this, which is slightly distasteful, but I'll tell it anyway. Which is, I'm about to go on stage about four years ago, and I'm wearing beige trousers, and as all speakers do, you go to the loo eight minutes before you go on stage. I don't know why, you just have to, okay? And unfortunately, the wash basin went into spasm and deposited a huge amount of water on the front of my trousers. So I was thinking, what do I do here? Do you want to just do a runner, okay? What do I do? And I tried the hand, the, the hand dryer, and it was hopeless, okay? I'd have had to stand there actually char-grilling my own genitals uh, in order to have any effect for about half an hour. And I went outside in desperation, and then a miracle happened. It started to rain really heavily. And I went out into the street and just stood in the rain, okay? <laughs> for about 10 minutes before I went on stage. Now, admittedly, the people in the audience thought, why has this man fallen into a swimming pool, okay? But it was better than the alternative. <laughs> so sometimes the solution is to dry the wet bit, and sometimes the solution is to wet everything else. The opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. And once you think backwards, you notice that all the time. Because when you think backwards, what you sacrifice is clarity, because there's more than one right answer. What you gain is massive surface area exposure to possible upside creative opportunity. Okay? And what I want to say is that every time you make a decision, there's a chance to have a good idea. We tend to, as ad agencies, try and make creativity seem really scarce and rare and the product of really lengthy processes so we can charge money for it, okay? In reality, okay, you have an opportunity to be creative every time you make a decision. And this was a lovely decision from someone at UNICEF um, who was given a huge donation of Crocs to give away to parts of Africa where people didn't have shoes. And she said, well, the logical thing is just to go and find out where people don't have shoes and hand out Crocs. Perfectly good idea. You never get fired for that, okay? Much, much easier to be fired for being irrational than it is for being unimaginative. That's a kind of weird distortion in employment. You know, if you make a rational decision, it doesn't matter what the consequences are, you keep your job. If you make a weird decision, uh, if it goes well, people claim the credit elsewhere, and if it goes badly, you lose your job, okay? So there are huge incentives within any institution not to be imaginative. And I said, well, of course, <laughs> I had to make the obvious joke, which is, well, the other great thing about Crocs is they're a fantastic contraceptive because uh, it's impossible to become even mildly aroused in the presence of anybody wearing them. <laughs> and, and she said, no, 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 these are for children. I said, OK, sorry, I get the point. <laughs> and um, and um, she then, fantastically, I think, she went to schools 
in areas where people didn't have many shoes. And she gave the, the shoes to the schools and said, when people turn up without shoes on day one of their first day at school, give them a pair of Crocs. And what they did is they went home, and all the other kids said, where did you get those Crocs from? I got them when we went to school. I'm going to school tomorrow. So you both achieve the main objective, which is sh shoeing the unshod, but you also got magic. You got alchemy. You got a bit of extra value out of it because you created a habit and a kind of incentive for people to attend school in their first week, which massively increases the likelihood they'll continue to do so. It's a free lunch. And this is my point. If you look at the world completely rationally and you use Newtonian physics, there's no free lunch. If you look at the world psychologically, there are free lunches everywhere. When you think backwards, I'll come to this point. Here's another example of just doing something much better. It's a restaurant in saint emilion en France, and um, they were going to put up a notice saying mobile phones not allowed, but it's a kind of michelin star place. It's a bit weird bossing your customers around, and it tends to create reactants where people immediately think of a reason why this doesn't apply to them. You know, oh, it's, des I'm, it's important my children can get hold of me, or some something like that. Now, 99.9% .9 of people would have put up that notice. This restaurant didn't. They found a spot which, where the notice was ostensibly targeted at people leaving the restaurant, but was completely visible to everybody walking in. And what the notice said was that. What they did is they created an implicit social norm, which is naturellement our sophisticated customers would not dream of, you know, making loud calls about the Nasdaq in the middle of a Michelin-starred meal, and it basically made people feel, I'd better turn my phone off, because that's what everybody else is doing, and it would look a bit naff not to do it. That's what I mean, that actually, for every logical solution, there's a better solution. When you think backwards, two more minutes, OK? Marketing and innovation are the same thing, OK? Uh, James Watt wanted to sell steam engines to mine owners. They weren't remotely interested in things like cylinder capacity. What James Watt did is he invented a marketing metric. Still in use today, he invented the horsepower, OK? Because you could go to a, a mine owner who didn't give a shit about the cubic capacity or the boiler temperature, but if you said, buy a 25 horsepower engine and you can get rid of 25 horses, ka maths done, problem solved, okay? Bottom-up thinking, this is top-down thinking. We need more capacity from west to east in London, so we spend 20 billion pounds building a tunnel. Perfectly valid, not necessarily wrong. I'm not suggesting that this behavior is always wrong. But there's also bottom-up thinking, where you take railway lines that have always existed, the overground, rebranded the overground, and added to the London tube map, now carries as many people as Crossrail does. But what they did, effectively, by making it cognitively comprehensible, is they created £20 billion pounds worth of transport infrastructure using mostly ink. OK? Simply by changing the way people perceived it, they made it useful, and by making it usable, they made it valuable. That's as much value creation as building a tunnel is, and yet we don't think of it that way. No one has ever said, this is the greatest marketing case study of the last 20 years. Someone's got to do that for solar panels. Find a way. We've cracked the technology. No one's cracked how to sell them. OK? No one wants to spend £25,000 on an experiment that might go badly wrong. If someone can come up with a modular way you can install these, maybe we're off to the races. So what I mean is the future is already here, we just don't know how to sell it yet. That's my final point. When you think backwards, there are free lunches in everywhere. When you think forwards, you end up with one unambiguous solution, which people in managerial positions love because it's inarguable. Unfortunately, along with being inarguable, it's quite possibly really, really bad. If you want to know more, there is a course called Mad Masters, which I host, and it helps you address the challenges of now. So I very much encourage that as a bit of a plug. Uh, I can also plug all the books written by my team and end right there, on time. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you. Oh, pleasure. Eleven Nudgestock keynotes. I never know how I was going to do something new. Chargill genitals is how that happened today. <laughs> um, stay seated and tuned. Rory is going to be back throughout the rest of the day. Um, and all you have to do to get Rory Sutherland to speak your words out loud is go to the Slido. 
So sli.do, hashtag NudgeDoc2023, you can scan the QR code there, it's on your lanyards, you can do it at home, and there's going to be a number of Q&As coming up in which Rory is going to engage with some of our speakers, and he will get gonged off uh, if he overruns too hard. We've, we like to nudge ourselves, so that's, uh, that's what that's all about down there. That's purely for Rory. <laughs> and my fellow introverts in the crowd, you tend not to put your hands up. Slido <laughs> means that you can ask your questions anonymously. We won't just hear from those pesky extroverts the whole day. Well, yeah, extroverts get your cleverest questions ready to impress, <laughs> including for our next speaker. So, Nudge Talk, let's see a sea of hands here. Who has uh, created a graph that they have put into a presentation at some point, ever? OK, so we are all, you are all data visualizers. Um, anyone put their hands up if you were really, really bloody proud of that graph. Like it was absolutely mega. I think there's still some room for improvement there, huh? That's quite a lot. Yeah. As we painfully witnessed during the pandemic, how numbers are presented can dramatically influence our human behavior. Whether you took the vaccine or not may have been by how the numbers were presented to you. And here to help us master the very messy world of, of numbers, of data, is Mona Chalabi. Mona is on a mission to, as she puts it, take the numb out of numbers. In her illustrations, animations, articles for the likes of The Guardian, The New York Times, 538, she covers all kinds of data sets, from affirmative action and disability rights to what people name their dog in New York City and how many Americans eat pizza for breakfast. And I can't tell you how personally glad I was when Mona agreed to jump on a plane and come back to her uh, native Britain. Um, because I've presented her work in presentations millions of times. And the reason I've done that is because I know it will be remembered. So questions on the Slido, please. And Nudge Doc, get ready for some very memorable numbers with data journalist Mona Chalabi. <laughs> How are you all doing? Um, yeah, my name's Mona. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about several things if I can get this to work. Yeah. So um, my job involves finding data wherever I can and translating those statistics. I've actually started to kind of shift away from journalism, which has um, been interesting. But I'm going to be talking about the journalism today. Um, and when I have been translating data, I've basically turned it into written articles and data visualizations, and it's the data visualizations that I wanted to talk about um, to this particular crowd. So when I'm creating data visualizations, right, I'm kind of judging them across two basic um, measures, right? How clear are they and how beautiful are they? And I think that beauty gets really, really underrated when it comes to data visualization. So if I'm judging those data visualizations, right, you can have charts that fail at both. So they're ugly and confusing, like this. Um, you can have charts that are beautiful and confusing, which is potentially even more dangerous, like this. I mean, I actually don't think that's that beautiful, but it's fine. It's just for the purpose of the example. Um, you can have charts that are ugly but clear, like this. You know, you can very clearly see that three groups, something is declining. And then lastly, you can have charts that are both beautiful and clear. Um, it's nice that you're taking a photograph of this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how useful it will be later on, but sure. Um, so all of the examples that I gave of the charts that fall into these three other quadrants, right, so charts that fail, all come from one study. They, they were all just screen grabs from this study, which also has a a ridiculous title um, that is just as incomprehensible as the charts, right? But basically, what this study looked at was which groups in the US are responsible for air pollution emissions and which groups in the US are most vulnerable to the consequences of those emissions. It's really important data. And so often, I'm finding the work that academics are doing, and then I'm trying to translate it, because those academics are used to talking in a language, both a, a verbal language and also a visual language, that only makes sense to one another. So, um, this was my first attempt at kind of taking their charts and translating it for, to be more accessible to a kind of broader general audience. Um, this is bad. I know this is bad. Um, I'm going to be showing you lots of bad examples of my work to kind of show how this process is iterative. So, 
whenever I create these drafts, I always share them on a group thread with people who do nothing whatsoever to do with data, nothing to do with journalism, and my friends uh, very impolitely let me know how bad my work is, which I love. So they were just like, I don't get it. Like, what is a microgram per cubic meter? It weirdly looks like people are breathing into each other's mouths. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> So then I tried adding some arrows, it's still really bad. I tried adding a line to make the distinction that over here we're talking about air pollution caused and over here we're talking about exposure. It's still bad. And then I just simplified it to be bar charts. Very, very simple. And actually, I've gotten rid of any numbers on this. I'll be talking about that a little bit later on, because actually all that you need to make sense of this is a sense of the relative scale between the groups. Um, and then the very last thing that I do is I'm, I'm using Instagram very often to post these illustrations, so I'm using the swipe feature, right? So now I just want to focus on air pollution emitted, and then you can swipe to see air pollution inhaled. Okay, so that's one example. I'm going to be showing you a ton while I'm here. Um, and basically what I'm doing is taking the classic data visualization types that most of you in the audience will be familiar with, line charts, bar charts, pie charts, and I'm kind of making them messy, right? Like, these, I think, overstate the accuracy of the data. They overstate the simplicity of the data. And I want to put back in that mess in a way to build trust with audiences. Um, and so this is the way that I do it. The goal is that when you quickly glance at one of these, you can get a sense of what the subject matter is. So to walk you through a few more examples, here's male circumcision rates. Uh, this is Google searches for a hangover cure, which you see like every Saturday and Sunday morning, people were Googling hangover cure, very dumb. Um, again, the goal is that if you were to cover up that title, maybe you might have some kind of a vague sense what the data is actually about. And that, that affects the retrieval of that data. It makes it more memorable and easier to recollect. Okay, so. In the time that I have left, I'm going to walk through some of the problems that I face when I'm kind of trying to come up with these and how I, come, how I try to overcome them, right? So what, is, what are some of the problems that we face when we're trying to make data visualizations? Problem number one is that um, infographics exist. I'm really sorry to anyone in the audience who makes infographics or works with infographics. To me, it's like such a slur if people describe my work as an infographic. Um, I think they're really hideous. This is so bad. This is so bad. Your eye has no idea where to start, where to go next. You're bombarded by information. It, it's trash. It's like... Um, <laughs> Uh, and this is a really, really important infographic, by the way. It's trying to explain when you might need a hip replacement. But most of the people that need access to this information, or a large share of the people that need access to this information, are people who might have, um, who might need, for example, a larger font size, than, and that this hasn't even taken into consideration. It also expects way too much on the part of the viewer. It would take about, I don't know, maybe five minutes to digest all of this, three minutes. I work on the assumption that I have, at most, three seconds of your time to bring you in and about 10 seconds, maybe, to digest the information. Um, so yeah, this is bad, this is bad, don't say a third and then show a quarter, bad, bad, bad. Um, <laughs> this is just, it's so funny, it always gets like slow giggles at first and then people start to see why it's bad. Do you see why it's bad? No? Okay, I'll just keep going then, never mind. Um, okay, so. The way that I try to overcome that kind of bombardment of information is this idea of sequencing, right? So rather than shoving all of the information in your face, how can I slow it down and show you it iteratively, piece by piece? So there are a number of ways that I can do this, right? One is using that slide feature that I mentioned. So this is the first slide. Very, very, very simple. It took me like, I don't know, a few minutes to make this. It's just showing that in 2011, the NYPD did more stop and frisks of young black men than there were young black men in New York, right? Um, and then the next slide shows, so remember the blue rectangle is um, the number of stop and frisks, and the green rectangle is the number of young black men. In 2017, things look really different. I don't need to relabel those same things. You can just see that the number of stop and frisks, that blue rectangle, radically um, shrinks. This is one of the very few examples I have of like a positive. Most of my work is incredibly bleak because it's talking about inequity. Um, but a judge in New York ruled that the use of stop and frisk was unconstitutional. It was so unfair. So this shows the efficacy of that ruling. What's fascinating about this, and the reason why I included it, is because, and it's one of the reasons why I really love what I do, 
people commented underneath. I hadn't even spotted this as I was like merrily kind of drawing up. They were like, oh, didn't you notice the green rectangle also shrinks? And that's the story of gentrification in New York. Um, and that idea that there's more than one story in one particular graphic, I think, is really, really important. OK, so that's one example of a sequence. Here's another. This is, again, using the swipe feature on Instagram. So of the almost 8,000 times that police officers killed people in the US, less than 1% resulted in a conviction, 1% resulted in a charge but no conviction, and... And then people just have to keep, keep, keep on swiping to see this final bar, which shows that 98.7% resulted in no charges whatsoever. And I know that that swiping almost gets boring, but that's kind of the point. I actually think that data visualization should make you feel something. And that kind of like almost exhaustion, I think, is relevant to the reality of the state of the world, that it does feel quite exhausting, and I'm trying to capture that. OK. Um, so in addition to this idea of sequencing, what I'm trying to do is to re-import this idea of humanity into the data, which I think very often gets lost. So, um, this was an illustration for an article that I did for the New York Review of Books, and it was talking about how expensive funerals have become. There's been this, like, go fund meization of funeral costs. Um, and I used data from the government to evaluate the cost of living versus the cost of dying. Cost of living, many of you are aware of. Use the CPI, it's this basket of goods, but you can do the exact same thing with the cost of dying. And you can see that it's actually risen at a faster rate. So this is the kind of simple data visualization, but I also wanted to include something that kind of conveys the emotional toll of all of this. So I just made a really, really quick, simple animation that I married with the data in order to show this idea that actually a lot of the people who are struggling with these costs are also grieving at the same time as that, and I think that's a really important component of the data. OK, uh, I want to walk through a few quick print examples. I love doing work in print. Um, any of those commissions make me so excited. Um, this was a very simple poster that I sent out as a gift to people. It's just talking about changes in rent and changes in income. This is in New York specifically. And it's really simple. You just cut it out and assemble it. It costs absolutely nothing. So easy. I've worked with um, maths teachers in New York high schools as well to design activities like this that they can print out for virtually no cost and kind of assemble in classrooms. OK. Um, I wanted to really briefly talk about interactives. I suspect some of the people in the audience either enjoy them or use them. I think that they are not great. Um, and this is partly based on data too, right? Like, so at The Guardian, we go into the back end and you can see the way that people are engaging with the site. And what we find very often is that interactives result in bouncers. So a bouncer is someone who just comes to the site, comes to a page, and leaves. I think the definition is less than five seconds after they arrive, which means they're frustrated, right? Like they came for something and they were like, no, 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 and left. Bounce rates for interactives are super high. It puts so much pressure on you, the viewer, to find the story. And I personally think that our job as journalists is to tell a story. It should be a complicated one. Wow, there's a pigeon in the room. That's surprising. Um, it's in the back. Uh, hopefully, it will stay over there. Um, I think it's our job to kind of communicate that story to you, but also give you the levers to kind of explore it further yourself. Um, I also came to this conclusion because I moved to the US a decade ago to work for a guy called Nate Silver, who got really famous for predicting election outcomes. I very quickly became disillusioned with that work. Um, and he used interactives as a large part of doing that. I actually think they're really harmful for democracy, but we can talk about it with Rory afterwards. OK, so this is an interactive... Um, as Tara mentioned before, that is very, very popular in New York, right? This comes from nyc.gov, which is this incredible data set of government data. It's this portal, um, and this, these are all of the dog names in New York, because you have to register your dog. What does this mean? Like, what, what is this showing you? The only thing you can do as you come here is kind of hover on the circles. You hover on the bigger circles to see what the most popular dog names are. Maybe you enter in your name to see how many dogs have got your name. More likely, you enter in the name of an ex, as I did. Um, it just don't, really, really doesn't tell you very much. So I created what I thought was going to be a, like, a quite niche kind of data visualization, just took the most common ones and really, really simplified it, right? And it did really, really well. I was surprised. And it did well because um, I thought it would only be of interest to New York dog owners, but actually, all of the comments were filled with people's Pe the friends of people named Bella and Max tagging their friends, being like, ha ha, you have a dog's name, um, which it turns out is quite a big audience. 
The reason why I show this example is because it was a really, really great opportunity to talk people through exactly how I made it, right? And that's what's so fun about data visualization. You have this opportunity for transparency that is so radical. So this was how I actually downloaded the data set. It's so vast. It has the color of the dog, the zip code where the dog lives in, um, the sex of the dog, whether or not the dog has ever bitten anyone. It's amazing. Then I can talk people through exactly how I drew it. Then I talk people through how I took a photograph of it. The photo Photoshop process is actually really, really important as well because I create graphics in Excel. I create like the standard charts that you're familiar with, and then I line them up with the hand drawn illustration. So, pixel for pixel, it is as accurate as anything you would make in a computer, but I'm trying to convey imprecision with the hand drawn design. Uh, use an actual dog to really get the fur right. Okay, um, so that's the final one. I'm going to show you one more example, I think, of sequencing now, which is this next one. So as Rory mentioned, averages are shit. So much of my work involves trying to get beyond those averages. So this is a kind of national level of data. This, came up, this um, was published during COVID. It was data showing that US employers cut 140,000 jobs, right? And not only is this misleading, but I think it also, again, destroys trust in journalists and in public institutions because this doesn't seem to resonate with what people were feeling in their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, so 140,000 jobs cut. How can we move beyond that average? Well, I can show you that in reality, there are actually more jobs for men and a hell of a lot fewer for women. And that the number is based of, is uh, the aggregate of those two. But I can also show you that in actual fact, there were more jobs for white women and fewer jobs for women of color. And that dissembling of the average, I think, really, really resonates with people. And it is a story that is best told using that sequencing rather than quickly showing you this right up top. Okay, even beyond visuals, so data visualization isn't great if you are visually impaired or blind. So some of my work is about trying to figure out other ways of kind of working on that. And by the way, I really haven't nailed it yet. Data sonification is a, I would say it's a relatively new field that is still underexplored. Um, so this was a painting that I made for an exhibition there are 100 characters in the foreground. 88 of them are white men. And that's because 88% of all of the artists that are exhibited in the 12 largest museums and galleries are white men. This is in the US. Oh, I'm assuming it's just as bad here, if not worse. 11% um, of them are white women. So 11 of the characters in the foreground are white women. And one of them is a man of color. Like the women of color make up less than 1% of all of the artists that are in permanent collections and in galleries and museums. Everyone in the background are the people that need to be added to that space for it to adequately represent the US as a whole. Again, if you're blind or visually impaired, this painting is trash. So I tried to create a tactile version of it, you can barely see it here, where the people who are overrepresented are raised higher and the people that are underrepresented are lower. Honestly, it wasn't great. Um, I, but I think the idea of exploring tactiles, exploring the use of heat, um, and sound to explore visuals feels really compelling and exciting to me. This is a really simple example that I did of trying to use sound, but there's no sound on the video. Oh, there we go. 60 Aimer leopards, 43 Christmas Island geckos, 40 Burmese roof turtles, 30 vaquitas, 29 Guam kingfishers. Next stop, extinction. It's literally just narrating it, really, really simple. Um, that was a data visualization of how all of the remaining number of certain species could all fit onto one New York subway carriage. It might seem counterintuitive, but it's still data visualization, right? I'm trying to use a scale, in this case, a subway carriage, that I think is pretty much relatable to everyone. Whether or not you live in New York, you have a vague sense of the size of like a subway carriage. Um, this was another example that I really quickly did um, about landlords in New York. Um, I worked with an architecture student to actually build that model. It is a replica of a building that that terrible landlord owns. When we exhibited it, we had the housing rights group of that building come down um, and engage with the work. And yeah, it's again that idea of like the visualization should be a reflection of the underlying data. Okay, one last problem possibly that I'm going to really quickly talk through. How am I doing for time? Okay, not great. 
One minute. Okay, thank you. I didn't see the timer. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to really speed through the last bits. Okay, so numbers can be shit. What do you do when the underlying data that you're working with is not great? So this really simply shows the minimum space required per person in US prisons and then how immigrants were detained. This was a fascinating example because there was no data, right? Um, ICE, which I always forget what it stands for, Immigration and Customs Enforcement in the US, published a PDF showing detention facilities. There was no data in it, but what there were were a few photographs. So I worked with the Forensic Architecture Institute at King's College London. They analyzed the photographs, were able to find a photograph of a man holding up an envelope, were able to find that envelope, estimate the dimensions of the envelope, find the, root, the ceiling panels, look at the ratio of the two and count how many heads were in the room to estimate how many people were contained within that room. It was phenomenal. And look at space per person. So it is possible to create data sets where they don't exist currently. Um, this is another huge, huge problem in most of the data sets that I'm facing, right? So by the way, these aren't genders as you may know, um, and I know that this is still relatively controversial in the UK, which kind of shocks me, but this is not the full total representation of gender. So how can I create data visualizations that are using data that is broken down this way while also questioning that representation? At first, I tried to just like, you know, because I hate the, you know, the thing that kind of looks like a print symbol. I never remember which one is man, which one is woman, you know, the circle with the arrow thing. I tried to do hairy arms. It's bad, plenty of women have hairy arms. So it was like, how can I convey man and woman without reinforcing really basic notions of what those two things look like? So I just decided to just go with M's and W's to keep it super simple. This is a visualization about artists. Most of the highest paid artists are men, no surprises. Um, it's just, again, an example of sequencing, showing one year at a time. Um, Depressing, 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 depressing. Um, I'm just going to quickly show you a few last examples in the time that I have left. So I'm going to really briefly talk about some of the public art that I do, which I find a really, really exciting opportunity to bring this work into new communities. Um, this is actually a data visualization. So this is 100 characters, and they represent 100% of New Yorkers. So I use census data to look at the race and ethnicity of New Yorkers, the age, immigration status, disability status, what else, gender. And these characters represent those statistics, right? And then it ended up being exhibited in the World Trade Center over, uh, I think it was summer 2020. Um, and then I also got the opportunity to work with the Brooklyn Museum. So the World Health Organization commissioned me to do an illustration about COVID on the steps of the museum. I found that to be quite stressful because I didn't want it to be really bleak. Um, so I found this incredible study that found that the presence of trees, even when you control for other variables, it was, again, this niche study that wasn't really being shared with a wider audience, reduces COVID transmission rates. So... I wanted to look at trees in New York. Um, really, really fascinating. Once every 10 years, volunteers go out and count every single tree in the city, what its species is, the height of the tree, whether it's dead or alive, incredible resource that actually isn't really utilized that often. This is the data that I downloaded and analyzed. I found visual references for all of the 100 most common trees, as well as the leaves, so that people would be able to identify the tree based on the leaf. Um, drew them all out, took a long time stitch them together. Um, and then this is also really important. Um, I, th the actual illustrations were relatively small, which meant that by the time they were blown up on the steps, you can almost see, I know I'm out of time, Marie. I swear to God, I'm almost done. Um, OK, which is, which is almost also a way of seeing the process, right? The fact that you can see every line allows viewers to see exactly kind of how I created it, stitch them together, the ink and the color. And then lastly, again, because it is a consistent pattern in all of my work. I still wanted to talk about the injustice of this, right? So it's not just a positive message that trees reduce the spread of COVID. Actually, when I downloaded the data, I stitched it together with data on median income so I could see where every single tree in the city was, and I know where rich people are based and where poor people are based. I stitched together the two massive data sets and found that richer neighborhoods have more trees. That is huge. It doesn't just mean that those... It, 
compounds the fact that those richer neighbourhoods were less exposed to COVID. It means those neighbourhoods sound different, like there are fewer cars in those neighbourhoods. It means that they smell different. They, and they also sound different because there's more birds in those neighbourhoods. It's really profound. Anyway, this was the final version, and oh no, I do have a couple more. Yeah, that's right. Go on. Are you sure? Okay. Last thing, I mentioned earlier on that I'm actually trying to eliminate numbers from my work, which sounds really counterintuitive, but there are ways to do it. This was a commission for the New York Times. I'm um, talking about how Wes Anderson casts the same actors over and over and over again. And I just use colour to... I mean, there are technically numbers on it here, so you can see that Bill Murray was cast nine times, Benicio Del Toro once, but, you know, you get the vague sense. This was about the symptoms of coronavirus. There are numbers on it, but there are also very compelling visuals like the diarrhoea in the corner. Um, and this was translated into 14 different languages. I made it right at the start of the pandemic. Um, and it was during that time of, like, utter confusion. Um, oh, no, this is going to take a second. Should we just leave this? And we'll yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do a very quick Q&A then, because I'm sure there are a few people. OK, OK. And then I can always go through them as we're, as we're chatting, shall we? Oh, OK. That's even better. Yeah. yeah. OK. Where shall I Double start? duty. Fantastic. Yeah. Shall I see? So I've got to ask the first question. You mentioned that having worked in political polling, Mm. Uh, you thought that actually it could be extremely dangerous. Yes. Tell, tell me what, what was yeah, the yeah. thing that frightened you most about that? So I think that um, we as journalists are not only trying to communicate information, but we need to be very responsible about the fact that in communicating that, we can also change people's behaviour, right? Yeah. And I think we are very often quite um, keen to kind of wash our hands of that responsibility and say, no, 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 that's not part of it. So when I started working for Nate, I remember like relatively early on when I was there, I, I, um, I took a, a car ride and I was speaking to the, the person who was the taxi driver and he was saying to me, like, I want to vote for this guy. What? Don't, they're putting oh, up the slider. Questions. Okay, okay. Um, I want to vote for, I can't remember which candidate, but they don't have a chance of winning. Yeah. And this idea that actually you don't want your vote to be wasted, so you're looking at the data on who's ahead and placing your bets on the base of that is not democracy. You're supposed to vote for the candidate that you believe in, right? And, of course, the primary system, which is staggered and starts in yeah. a very unrepresentative state, typically, yeah. distorts that even further. Exactly. So a weird group of people in you know, Maine or somewhere and decide uh, so disproportionately Absolutely. determine the fortunes of everybody else. Yeah. And also, I would actually argue personally that counterintuitively, Nate actually had a role in helping Trump to win, because there's two different political theories. There's bandwagon theory and underdog theory. Mm. In 2016, no, not 2016. Yeah. When was it? It was, uh, it was, was 2015. 2015. No, 2016, 2016. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, in 2016, data from the Democratic Party found that when they told, they, they polled like two separate groups, not Democrats, like two national groups. In one of them, they told them that Trump, Hillary Clinton was way ahead, and in the other one, they didn't tell them anything. When they told the group Hillary Clinton was way ahead, Trump got a larger share of the vote, because people were like, fuck you, I'm going to vote for the underdog. Yeah. And so this constant messaging that Trump didn't have a chance actually really galvanized his supporters around him. Again, I just think that's bad for democracy. No, that, that's, that's actually incredibly interesting. I mean, the, the interesting thing I heard from, uh, anecdotally from uh, uh, the American universities was none of the academics believed that Trump could win, except for the primatologists, who oh, all wow. believed that Trump would win. Yeah, yeah. OK. Now, uh, is there also a risk here in that, obviously, you get um, what you might call, you know, uh, essentially, you, you, you get um, uh, various things are correlated. Now, we always have a lot of data on... I was just talking to someone yesterday where I was told that in Singapore, reporting on any ethnically-based statistics is banned. Yeah. And they argue in that France it's inflammatory. Well, Fran France won't France collect do the data same thing. on religion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, the only problem I can see is that, obviously, let's say you're doing something like affirmative action, which I'd support, by the way, mm -hmm. because it's your duty as a university to make sure the student body is interesting as a community... And that means actually fighting against uniform measures of selection. Okay? So personally, I'd support it. But if you always have data available for ethnicity and you don't have other uh, important data facts, like number of books in your parents' home, mm. which is also a very strong predictor, by the way, of, of life outcome, okay? is there a danger that we, we come to overemphasize racial differences at the expense of other really important factors, which, of course, you could tackle much more easily? I, I, I don't even know where to begin with that question, sorry. Um, I feel very, very strongly that actually um, 
and this is again based on a lot of evidence, and I hear you that some of that evidence can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I still believe, and I actually think people are much more willing to acknowledge this in the US than in the UK, mm. race is still one of the largest single predictors of your life outcomes. I would argue yes, no, no. more than books in a household. I do agree with you that it can be... So, OK, let's, let's take the example of France, right? They're confounding variables. I think they're technically... Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, let's take the example of France. France is systematically... <laughs> um, French Muslims are very, very, very ill-treated. Um, they are systematically discriminated against. And there is very little evidence for that because the French government doesn't... Won't collect. allow any kind of publication. Data, yeah. So yeah. how do you start to address that? And for me, I actually think that data is a really important way for underrepresented groups who are typically marginalised to speak with a collective voice rather than, rather than just speaking individually and trying to campaign on an individual basis. So, yeah. I don't I, know if I've really answered your question. I suppose the other, the other danger, which is always worth fighting, which you must oh, We're getting watched. kicked off. We're, we're getting, getting kicked, kicked off. off. You yeah. must have watched from a distance. OK, I'm getting kicked off. all day. OK. Oh, okay. He will talk you, to you, you all day if we now, let him. Do you? Yeah, I'm so Fantastic. sorry. No problem at all. OK, it's thank you. Thank that you was, so much. My thank God, wasn't that wonderful? Thank you. Thank you. Mona Chalabi. Please. Huge, huge round of applause there. She's just everything that we ever hoped for. And I know what you're all thinking. You're just thinking, how can I hire a data visualizer? So many questions that you've got right now. Um, and what we want you to do is focus all of these thoughts, these insights, this inspiration, these messy moments, and we want them to share you to share them with us, of course. Um, on here, on Nudgedoc 2023. So if you go to sli.do and then hashtag Nudgedoc2023, you'll hear about 50,000 words today from all of our speakers combined. What are the 15 that really make you think? Um, but yes, do share with the Twitter. Do share with the Twitter. And it doesn't have to be deep. Uh, this is a festival that's meant to be fun. Last year, we had uh, Nudgestock outfits, Nudgestock pets. We even had Nudgestock babies, I think, on the next slide. Have you got the clicker? There's some nudge dog babies. Um, so what, um, nudge dog bumps, not just fat this <laughs> yes, year. Yes. No. Um, uh, so whatever you've got, send us in at home. You're part of this in the crowd. And we have a very, very, very special prize later. I can't really state this enough. Very special prize. Um, it might involve someone getting wet. It's all very exciting. Please do send in your tweets. The front row look very awkward because they know it's not the back row that get wet. And we also <laughs> do have a couple of people standing at the back, and I think we have some chairs in the middle. So if you have a bag on a chair, it's getting a bit easier. Now. Any Put chair it underneath holds your on the floor, underside, and then put your hand up. So hand up. Come show to... some show some love to the people at the back. So there's some some okay. seats here. Seats here. Follow those Deep hands. Friends. Follow those hands. Okay. So now let's talk about the panel of the moment. Um, artificial intelligence is on everybody's lips right now. It's the tidal wave that's touted to change all of our lives as we know it. Will it be for good, or will it be for evil, or will it be for both? To intro our panel today, we're delighted to have one of our global leaders, Christopher Graves. He's a global leader in behavioral science at Ogilvy and the previous chair and CEO of, of Ogilvy's PR business. Please welcome Christopher Graves. This time of night, I could call you up. I get angry with athletic ease, break common laws in twos and threes. If I die clutching your photograph, don't call me boring, it's just cause I like you. Oh, take me on back, take me on back. Welcome, Nudge Stalkers! Listen, it's getting a little bit warm in here, have you noticed? <laughs> but the geniuses behind Nudge Stock have given you all a personal ventilation device. <laughs> so we won't be offended if we see lots of, isn't that feel good, nice. How many of you really today are not just dabbling in, but using genuine AI? Let's see. Okay, it looks like maybe a quarter or 15 to 20 percent, somewhere in there, would you guess in that? You will probably have known, for those of you in the advertising or perhaps public relations area, that there was a, an event recently in the United States um, called the Advertising Turing Test. And remember, the Turing Test was the test to see whether a computer could fool humans as to whether it was a human. And this 
was AI-created visual advertisements being judged by a panel of experts. And roughly a coin flip, it was 53%, slight edge to the panel, could figure out which was created by humans and which was created by AI. And this is with the earliest, crudest form of AI that in our lifetimes any of us will ever use. So very interesting. But in other realms that you're going to hear about, AI and behavior. Uh, for those of you who are at all interested, recently I wrote a piece in Harvard Business Review using AI as an empathy tool. Uh, ironic, given that it is soulless, it is not salient, uh, uh, sorry, it's not, not uh, 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 cognizant that it is a, a thinking being, so I didn't want to go that far. But you can use it to craft simulations that you might want to have a conversation with somebody. So imagine a doctor with a patient. Imagine a creative and a suit. Imagine all kinds of potentially thorny conversations you can pre-simulate using AI, but being very careful to prompt that AI about the other person, very honestly and in depth. And you're going to learn more about that later this afternoon with a breakthrough approach we have uh, called the sense-making genome. But joining me right now are three experts in AI. To my right is Keith Deere. Keith's Managing Director of Fujitsu's Center for Cognitive and Advanced Technologies. He's um, also was previously served as an expert advisor to the UK Prime Minister on defense modernization and the integrated review leading also the UK space strategy in number 10 and advising on national strategies on emerging technology. He's a lightweight, Forgive him. <laughs> He's going to try to keep up with us here. <laughs> then you have Katie King, another lightweight. She's a published author, keynote speaker, and consultant on artificial intelligence, um, digital STEM leadership, and business transformation. She was voted recently to be a top 10 AI influencer in 2023. And it'll be interesting to talk about AI and influencer marketing. Um, and she's advised many of the world's leading brands and business leaders. And Justin Ibbets. Justin is the CEO of Focal Data. Focal Data is a team of award-winning researchers, polling gurus, PhD scientists, and industry veterans focused on removing the understanding gap between belief and reality through innovative technology. And very importantly, very importantly, because of Justin and Focal Data, we are here today because they are a sponsor of Nudge Stock. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to start with you, Keith, because um, a lot of attempts at personalization, and you will remember the notorious Cambridge Analytica case, trying to personalize by personality in social media, for example, you can see that on the one hand, a very empathetic and a very uh, healthy approach to understanding people better might move them toward healthier behaviors. But on the other hand, if your goals are not aligned with their goals, you could conceivably use AI to nudge them in a very bad way or even create the ultimate personalized disinformation tool. What do you think is going to happen here on both ends of that spectrum? So I think, I think I'd offer two things. One, one is the um, well-rehearsed point now that generative AI allows you to produce personally tailored content at a scale that is unprecedented. And there are huge worries going into the next round of elections in the US and the UK. Uh, there's talk about watermarking to try to identify content. The second thing I would say... Watermarking. Just tell them a second what you mean by so, watermarking. So watermarking would be tr identifying those things that, are, that provide evidence that the model has been produced by a predictive generative AI agent. So understanding that this text has come from a highest probability of what would follow from the text that comes before. There are subtle but incredibly difficult um, difference to detect differences between the way humans write and generative AI writes. Um, there's also a view that 
if people can tend to rely on the very large models, um, that those models themselves might be forced to watermark everything that comes out. So there's nothing you could see, but there's a pattern in the text that another AI could identify. So AI is battling AI. A bit like the way we prevent flash crashes on the stock market with an AI monitoring, you know, human and... Um, so the idea would be I see something and I see along with it a potential warning that there's a, you know, a, a good chance this was not made by a human. Yeah, um, and one argument is that if you know that, therefore you can aim off for it, and therefore um, it will reduce the impact. I I'm not so convinced, but that is an argument for how we will know if we are being kind of constantly bombarded with personally tailored, highly accurate and persuasive content. Um, so that kind of, um, and they call it the infoocalypse sometimes, that, that kind of huge tsunami of, um, of misinformation and disinformation personally tailored to your psychological profile, most likely the ocean or the hexaco model. So we know that that's the best predictor of life outcomes. It's the best way of understanding what's going to influence an individual. And so I just one brief thing there. Uh, Keith mentioned the hexaco model. That is a six-factor personality test. Yeah. Um, like the big five or five factor or ocean you may have heard of. This is not, for those of you who use Myers-Briggs, <laughs> scientists do not use Myers-Briggs. Um, they completely disown it, uh, but Hexaco and Big Five, they've been using for 50 years and do find good predictive value in that. Huge predictive value and, and huge stability over time, whereas Myers-Briggs has so no predictive value. With all your um, understanding uh, and areas perhaps you, you can't even talk about in terms of defense and security, how big is the gap between where we really are and AI and things like disinformation or persuasion versus what we are, think we know. Is there a gap or are we up to speed on the capabilities of AI? No. We mean the non-intelligence community. Uh, look, I think even within the intelligence community, the understanding of these impacts are nascent. I think if you see the ongoing trial in London at the moment of Jaswat Singh, who's the guy who's accused of trying to murder the Queen, uh, there's a story in the papers today about how he was using a chatbot called Replica, um, which was a kind of AI girlfriend, and it was constantly reinforcing his desire to murder the Queen, that he was a good guy, that he wasn't delusional. I mean, that, that's literally evidence presented in court yesterday. So if we're looking at how does this affect radicalization, how does this affect people's views, being able to interact with something as empathetic, something that might even have, you know, we talked about this, but theory of mind, the ability to understand your emotions um, from the way that you interact with it, the, un the ability to therefore understand how it can influence your emotions. That can, of course, be a huge force for good. It can also be a huge force for evil as well. Katie, moving closer to the realm of many of the people in this room, including our clients, what are you seeing uh, in the world of uh, creativity and advertising, marketing, et cetera? Yeah. So it's this paradox, I think I would say, of personalization. We are, um, many of us think, Jesus, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So many of us think that, um, you know, if we're ignorant, if we're not completely sure what AI is, you know, which to my mind is about mimicking intelligent human behavior, then we're thinking maybe big shiny robot, we're confusing the robotic process automation aspects of AI, we may be thinking driverless vehicles, we're not maybe thinking that actually this is very affordable, these could be free tools, and that these are paradoxically able to personalize what we do. So whether we are a, a marketing professional, whether we are a, an educator, whether we are a, a barrister, we will get left behind if we don't invest in the tools. So I don't need to necessarily name them all, but there are many, many tools on the market. We might have the mainstream big tech platforms, the Microsoft 365 with Copilot, or we might have point-to-point -point tools from a whole raft of, of people that are giving us that ability to no longer put our finger in the air and do guesswork, but to get big data insights on all different areas. But to Rory's point earlier, we need to know what questions to ask. Like with the John Lewis example, the data is out there, but the AI, to your point as well, isn't sentient, isn't strategic. We've got to know what problems do we have that the AI might be able to help us solve. And then we've got to go out there and ask the right questions, find the right data, brainstorm that and look for tools that can help us to do that, to decide what our go-to-market strategy is going to be so that we don't waste 
you know, many, many hours on a type of potential customer that is never going to buy from us. So right. it is being sort of open to new tools that are going to help us do our marketing, our sales, our HR, and frankly, all different business functions so much better with and, big data. And in the transition period before we are all replaced, um, <laughs> The prompt engineer is being talked about as a huge opportunity, meaning uh, you don't get great stuff out of AI, for those of you who have been using AI, unless your prompts are pretty good. And the better your prompts and the more your prompts iteratively build, the better, more valuable stuff you get, which has led to a kind of spectrum of expertise, those who are newbies, neophytes at prompting, and those who are very good at prompting called prompt engineers, and we're seeing early rumors of very high salaries in your businesses for prompt engineers. First of all, is that completely bullshit, uh, or will there be a gap where within our companies, and, and no doubt there's going to be the, the traditional lemming rush of everybody putting AI into everything, even when it's not really AI? But is that a, 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 a place you could recommend our clients to begin, is to begin becoming really good prompt engineers? Yeah, I think we have to be... It's liken it to 25, 30 years of the internet. That didn't democratize creativity and success in marketing for everybody because we need to know what does that success look like. So to some extent, it is bullshit to have to have that as a new job function, but we do need to know how to prompt it. So it doesn't mean you've got to go and hire someone to do it. You could actually ask ChatGPT, what would be the top 10 tips to actually prompt to create an award-winning advert? You know, and, and that data is out right. there. It's residing somewhere. So it could feed you. But it's, it's about the complexity of write this post for me, search credible thought leadership articles, make sure you write it in a tone that's authoritative or creative or whatever it might be. So you're kind of giving it a very complex, detailed brief so that you get back what you need. Go and research material that was posted today in this journal because we know that it's only been trained on data up till September 2021, but you can actually get it to go and look at the latest articles and so on. And, so and for them, just to give them a little free consulting value here, what should members of our audience ask? Anyone who is proposing or pitching that their work, their, their services, their creative is imbued with AI, to demystify that and see whether it's real or not, what are a couple of pressure tests or questions they should ask? Yeah, so I think Let's not jump on the bandwagon and just start buying in that AI for the sake of it. For me, and I've got a scorecard in, in my book, it's really thinking strategically, what is the AI there to do? What, what problems and opportunities we have in our business that potentially AI could help us solve? So it is thinking, you know, to Rory's point earlier as well, the customer. You know, what are all these different personas? Can we really get deep data on all of the different aspects of our customers and clients and their habits and where they hang out and the social channels and, you know, their, not just their demographics, but their mm. likes and so on, and then really get that data and get the AI to help you package up the right kind of really informative information come up with. So Dorchester Hotels, for example, have used machine learning to go out into you know, all of the field. You know, we've got incredibly human brains, but we can't cope with an exascale amount of data across hundreds of languages. But if we go out there across social channels and mine that data, Dorchester Hotels found out that people wanted certain things on their breakfast menu. They weren't getting enough wedding bookings for their luxury hotels because they weren't offering certain things. That data is out there. We've got to go out there and find it and then make sense of it. So I think it's making, finding the problems and the AI isn't going to solve that for you unless you say, right, we want better products and services so that we can increase the menus to get more wedding bookings. So That's going to define conceivably it. Conceivably, the John Lewis at home issue that Rory showed us, were we to prompt an AI properly, it may have warned us off that before we did it. 
What's right? the most important? Is it parking? Is it access? You know, do, what percentage of people actually want to buy, you know, in this particular town? I'm from Tunbridge Wells as well, so I was devastated when it went. So, you know, it's just asking the right questions, isn't it? From the right people, packaging it up. Now, Justin, you have your finger on the pulse with recent polling about what people really think and fear uh, about AI. Tell us a little bit about what focal data is finding. I, I mean, uh, I might need that as well. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. I think, I think we're you know, asking the general population. So it was the majority of people are actually scared of AI rather than excited for it. And I, I think we have to be quite careful about also telling a positive story about not just, you know, being able to craft better advertising and different personas, but the, the massive productivity gains. So like, you know, nurses and teachers not having to do a lot of rote work got a massive productivity crisis in this country. And, you know, in, in one of the what things that Focal, do, uh, Focal Data do is we, we simulate elections and, and predict the outcome for, for, for different parties. Um, we've had misinformation in this country for a very, very long time. And, you know, what's worrying about the rise of generative AI is, is just the scale and ubiquity of, of fake news, people having one-on-one -on -one conversations with, um, with, you know, chatbots and, and stuff like that. But, you know, we work with Hope Not Hate, an anti-fascist charity. There's plenty of forums that people are going on and, and getting the same sort of feedback. So having a sort of balanced view on that. And, and what's sad is when we're looking at a lot of the polling that we're running, the, the, the sort of narrative is, is pretty negative already. Um, and there's also an overestimation of the capabilities as well. So, you know, asking people... Uh, is AI better at you, than you at uh, writing emails, writing essays, we, writing song lyrics, writing poems? Uh, surprisingly, the majority of people said yes across all of those tasks. Um, and I, I could probably say ChatGPT is better than me at writing a poem, but you know, I, I like to think if I put a lot of effort in over a couple of months, I could craft a really good one. So um, I, I just want to... But, but they've also that found, out. for example, a, a recent study... Um, comparing doctors and their bedside manner and discussions with patients with AI scripts and found that the humans who didn't know which was which preferred the AI scripts. So it's possible that it's helpful and can improve. Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, as if, uh, this is a behavioral science conference, so we should talk about a lot of the fallibility of, of human psychology and uh, AI's ability to make decisions not based on some of our deepest evolutionary emotional impulses. And so, you know, when we think about what are the changes undergoing in society through AI, you know, one of the ones I think you were talking about, you know, mining lots of data, we will see the rise of data silos. You're seeing that already with Reddit sort of being walled off. Um, that's going to be a really big thing unless you own a huge amount of data within your company already. The other thing is I think we'll see a, a call for more technocratic government. So as we see uh, you know, huge populism, really big division, but we see AI perhaps able to make real impact in some areas, potentially like healthcare will be a real catalyst for change. People will be saying, well, maybe we should give up more decisions to AI. Maybe you know, it should design some of our you know, tax system. One area where potentially it could model very effectively would be sort of interest rates as well, because you know, at least where it would make a recommendation and you have a human review, and, you know, over the next 20 years, with the rise, the exponential improvement in the efficacy of this, these systems, that's, those are some really, really interesting sort of developments that could uh, happen in government. Keith, in the last 15 seconds, because Justin mentioned ceding control, handing over perhaps to something that is uh, more effective in decision making than we humans are, what about warfare? I think, look, I think we will see increasingly automated warfare, both at the strategic and the tactical level. I think um, we used to describe how nine-tenths of the art of war is knowable and taught, taught in books, and one-tenth is like the flash of the kingfisher's wings, it's a T, famous T.E. Lawrence quote, the idea that the one-tenth is the creative bit. I think the fact is, what we see now is that AI can be creative, um, and I think that's the thing that is really going to change how we make decisions. One note on technocracy, which is that, that technocratic governments don't have a great record either. So I think we also need to be a little bit cautious about how we cede power and, and what we think these systems mean for how we make decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panel, Keith Deere, Katie King, Justin Ibbett. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're going to re realize now
that we're the evil ones when we come on stage because we're having to move off such bloody brilliant people that you could listen to all day. Thank you so much. Thank you I'm so sorry. much. We're yeah, basically Cruella de Vil over here. Bloody hell. Uh, can you tell the difference between an AI voice and a human voice? Steve, stay tuned for Steve Keller to show us the subconscious differences in the way that we all respond to both. And Kimberly Wilson is going to tell us what we shouldn't eat for breakfast if we want a good pay deal, right? Someone who would never accept an unfair pay deal is our next speaker. Um, and she is Marianne Seacott. Marianne is an author and a public commentator, and she specializes in issues around women's equality. We might think that the gender wars are over, but nudge stock, you know, things are not as equal as they really ought to be, here or anywhere else in the world. And this is a festival of science where we look at the reality and not just the rhetoric. So Marianne is an expert in these areas. Her groundbreaking book, The Authority Gap, um, showed how we still don't take women as seriously as men and what we can do about it. Again, you can get your questions in on the Slido. Go to sli.do, hashtag nudgestock2023. Interviewing Marianne, we're delighted to say that we have our Ogilvy CEO, Fiona Gordon. Please welcome Fiona and Marianne. Questions on the Slido. <laughs> and thank you very much and it's wonderful to have you here today Marianne and if anyone hasn't read this book I would recommend it's an absolute must read for all humans not just women but I think particularly not just women <laughs> <laughs> so I think we wanted to start by doing like defining what is the authority gap yeah, so the authority gap is the extent to which we still take men more seriously than women. We're still more reluctant to accord authority to women, and we still resist their authority when they are in power. So women are twice as likely as men to say that they often have to provide evidence of their competence. Uh, they're nearly twice as likely as men to say people are often surprised at their ability. Women of color are twice as likely as white women to say both of these things. Women are nearly twice as likely as men to say they often find it hard to get their views accepted in a meeting unless someone else repeats them. I'm sure some of you have had this experience. And this is not just anecdotal, so there's all sorts of academic evidence to back it up. So women, for instance, are much more likely to be interrupted than men. And interruption is actually a, you know, a very negative thing to happen to you because A, it suggests that the person who's doing the interrupting has something more interesting and more important to say than you have. And B, it actually stops you in your tracks and it silences you. Now, you might think that these sorts of things don't happen to senior women, to authoritative women. I'm afraid they happen to all women. So there was a fascinating academic study which looked at uh, proceedings of the US Supreme Court. And you don't get much more authoritative than being a US Supreme Court justice, right? Uh, but what it found was that although women made up only a third of the justices, they suffered two thirds of all interruptions. In other words, they were four times more likely to be interrupted than their male counterparts, 96% of the time by men. And this starts really young. So three-year-old boys are more likely to interrupt three-year-old girls than they are to interrupt other boys. It is absolutely hardwired into us that we don't respect girls and women as much as we respect boys and men. And I'd just to give you an anecdote of how this happens even at the very highest levels, because I interviewed about 40 really senior and powerful women in the course of researching this book, because my thesis was if this, e if this is even happening to them, then it's pretty much proof that it's happening to the whole of womankind. And the story I start the book with came from Mary McAleese, who was then, who, sorry, had been president of Ireland. And when she was president, she led a state visit to the Vatican to meet the Pope. So incredibly formal occasion, and there she is standing at the head of her delegation in the audience room. In comes the Pope, flanked by his cardinals, to be introduced to the president. He walks straight past her, sticks out his hand to her husband instead, who's standing next to her and says, wouldn't you prefer to be president of Ireland rather than married to the president of Ireland? Her delegation was stunned. I mean, it was so rude and such a breach of diplomatic protocol apart from anything else. But of course, her husband knew better than to take the Pope's hand. 
So Mary Mackerley grabbed this hand which was hovering in midair, brought it back to herself and said, let me introduce myself. I am the president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, elected by the people of Ireland, whether you like it or whether you don't. <laughs> Now, the Pope said afterwards, oh, I'm so sorry I heard you had a sense of humor. Right? This quite often happens. <laughs> Can't you take a joke? And she said, I do have a sense of humor, but that wasn't funny because you wouldn't have done it to a male president. And so what happens as a result of the authority gap is that women are routinely underestimated, disrespected, like Mary McAleese, Um, they are often patronized, mistaken for someone more junior. They're much more likely to be interrupted or talked over, to have their expertise challenged, less likely to be listened to when they put their views across, and more likely to have their authority resisted. One of the things I thought was interesting in the book, and obviously as a female CEO, I was kind of reading the book conscious of what I have done in my own career and my style. Mm. But one of the things you talk about is it isn't for women just about their competence, it's all about needing this warmth and likability to be able to kind of succeed. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, so women are in a real double bind. Because you might say, oh, well, the reason that women tend to be respected less than men and taken less seriously than men is they don't portray their views confidently enough. And men are much more confident than women, and that's why we listen to them more. Well, it's certainly true that boys and men are, on average, more confident than girls and women. And that's because of the way we've been socialized. So if you look at boys talking and playing and socializing together, a lot of it consists of a sort of boastful competitiveness. You know, oh, my dad's got a better car than yours, or I've scored more goals this season than you. you know, with girls, it's exactly the opposite. Any girl who behaved like that would be immediately ostracized. Nobody likes a boastful girl, is what we all get to told as children. And so girls bond by doing the opposite, by being modest and self-deprecating and adult women for that matter. So, you know, so girls will say, oh, I'm useless at maths, or I hate my hair, I can't do anything with it, or my bum's too big, right? And that's the way we are taught to behave. And so it's not enough to say, well, send women on assertiveness training courses and all this will be solved. Because if we do start to behave like men and start to behave as confidently and as assertively as men, people really dislike it and they recoil. And they start to use words about us like, oh, she's quite aggressive, isn't she? Or she's abrasive or strident, bossy, overbearing, scary, even bitchy, ball-breaking. And these are words never used of men showing exactly the same character traits. And so we have this problem that we're either not confident enough and therefore we're disrespected, we are confident enough and therefore we're disliked. <laughs> and you may say, well, grow thicker skin and who cares if you're disliked? Well, actually, the research shows that likability is a much more important factor for women than it is for men when it comes to being hired or being promoted, particularly if it's men doing the hiring or the promoting. And therefore, the only way through this is to layer a huge amount of warmth onto your personality to try to mitigate any hostility that you might otherwise attract, basically for being confident and good at your job. And It's exhausting, you know, we have to sort of smile a lot. I've really noticed in the era of Zoom how much I smile when I'm talking. And it's not deliberate, it's just sort of conditioned in me. So, you know, we have to smile more, we have to crack jokes, we have to be much more emotionally intelligent, we have to read the room very carefully, you know, be careful not to tread on any male egos, uh, in order not to um, be disliked. And this is, as I said, exhausting. It's something that some women aren't particularly good at, and why should they be? And it's a burden that men simply don't have to bear. No, it was funny because when I was reading this book, I was thinking, gosh, there was a lot of moments. I'm thinking, yes, I remember doing that. Or, yes. And obviously, I know one of the things also is if you've got a regional accent and also the tone at which we speak, because we're taught to kind of ex listen to male voices equivalent authority and they tend to have a lower pitch. Mm. And I know that's something some of your some of the people you talk to talk about in their interviews, how they've sort of changed their vocal range or been very conscious of it. Yeah, I mean, it, so it is certainly true that we associate lower voices with authority. The lower your voice, the more authoritative you sound. Now, of course, it's hard to disentangle. Is that because we associate male with authority and men tend to have lower voices? But it's even true within the sexes. So, you know, men with a high voice, we tend to laugh at a bit, you know, the sort of David Beckham's of this world. Um, and, and women with high voices actually sound childish in a way that men can't because their voices break. So we are always told, lower your voice if you want to have more authority. 
And one of the really interesting uh, research studies I came across showed that over the past few decades, in more egalitarian countries, the average pitch of a woman's voice has declined dramatically, whereas in inegalitarian countries like Japan, it stayed much higher. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's all subconscious, but we've, we've, we've realized we need to sound like men for anyone to listen to us. <laughs> But one of the things I think you talk about when you talk about the data from the pandemic or you talk about the growth of businesses who have more women on the board is you talk about actually having women also being part of the authority actually improves performance. So yeah. could you talk a little bit that we all flourish, men, women, everyone, humanity flourishes. I mean, it's a no-brainer, basically, if you're an employer. You can get twice the size of the talent pool if you, if you actually take women as seriously as men. Um, but a lot of men think, oh, I'm not sure about this, what's in it for me? Surely as women rise, I will fall. It's like a sort of seesaw, it's a zero-sum game. And actually, what really cheered me up in doing the research for this book is that it's not, it's a positive-sum game. So we all know the statistics about how more diverse leadership in companies leads to greater shareholder returns. Uh, we know that more women in parliaments around the world actually tend to create better laws, tends to be less corruption, tends to be less war and less civil war. So there are all these sorts of um, top-down statistics. But even from the bottom up as well, your lives individually as men will actually be happier if you live in a more, both in a more egalitarian society, the research shows, and in more egalitarian personal relationships, straight relationships, that is, in which the man and the woman share the chores pretty equally and the childcare pretty equally. Not only are the women happier and healthier, which you would expect, and less exhausted and less resentful, um, and the children are happier and healthier, and they do better at school, and they have fewer behavioral difficulties, and the girls are more ambitious for their lives, and the boys are less likely to get into trouble, and they have better relationships with their dads. So all those you would expect. But actually, the men themselves are happier and healthier. So they are twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives. I mean, that is huge, twice as likely. Half as likely to be depressed, much less likely to get divorced, and they tend to smoke less, drink less, take fewer drugs, get more sleep at night, and here is the absolute clincher, they get more frequent and better sex. <laughs> so guys, this is really in your interest, I promise you. <laughs> but to Rory's point, we should take this to the NHS, because it would <laughs> save the NHS so much money. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a new way to solve the problem. Mm. Um, I think one of the pieces in the last chapter is you have incredibly helpful actions that we can take. So to your point, while obviously a lot of the women that you've interviewed set out the challenges, you have incredibly helpful actions. Do you want, I mean, they go from very much what you can do in the media, and I thought maybe we could start a bit with the portrayal in the media and marketing, given a lot of the audience of this room. Yeah, so in the media, many more male experts than female experts tend to get quoted, which subliminally gives us the notion that men know more than women. That's starting to change, at least in organizations that are trying to do something about it. So the BBC actually has launched a sort of 50-50 campaign to try to get as many female experts as male experts on air. It's not, very, it's not hard to find them. There are plenty of women out there who are experts. It's just that they tend to have been quoted less in the past by male journalists, and so they're lower down the Google search, but you know, they are there. Um, so that makes a difference. Um, there are fewer female columnists than male columnists on average. So again, the columnists and the critics are the people who we look to as sources of authority on a subject. And that, uh, again, some papers are good about it. The Guardian, where I'm a director, is now very good, but some papers are not. So that's also perpetuating the notion. In movies, men have twice as many speaking parts as women do. They have, the male characters have more agency than the female characters. Um, the women are much more likely to be cast as either sex objects or help meets or murder victims, uh, whereas it's the men who are doing all the interesting stuff. That is starting to change, like I would say. Like Spoon has yeah, own production exactly. company. Exactly. So I just in the last only three or four years, but thank God that is starting to change. Same with children's books, same with TV dramas. It's just starting to change at the edge. In advertising, there is now this uh, regulation that says that you shouldn't be able to, um, um, to sort of patronize people. I, th I think harmful gender stereotypes have been banned. Yeah. So you can't do an ad showing a man sort of struggling to change a nappy or a woman sort of not being able to change a tire. But the, the, the more subtle gender stereotypes still run all the way through advertising, I'm afraid. Well, and I think there's a lot we'll more to be done about that. <laughs> 
And then you talk a bit as well, like as parents, it might be good for some of the people in the room to know, or if you're a major carer of people, what from an early age can you think about with your children or children you're involved in the lives of? Yeah, well, one of the most shocking pieces of research I came across showed that parents, when asked to estimate their children's IQ, estimated their sons on average at 115, and you're a numerate audience, so you know that that in itself is hilarious because the average ought to have come out at 100. Um, but their sons at 115, and their daughters at only 107. Now, that is really shocking, because we all know that boys' and girls' IQs are, on average, identical, except at the very, very far extremes of the bell curve. And yet, parents think their sons are cleverer than their daughters. So, boys are growing up subliminally absorbing this incorrect notion that they're cleverer than girls, and girls are growing up absorbing this incorrect notion they're less clever than boys, despite the fact that they develop faster than boys, have a bigger vocabulary than boys, and outperform boys at every academic level from kindergarten to PhD. <laughs> so, to start with, please don't underestimate your daughters and overestimate your sons. Um, secondly, don't praise your daughters for being pretty and your sons for achieving things. And this happens so much that we basically reward girls for being ornamental and boys for being instrumental. And so, they, so girls grow up thinking, the main currency for me is appearance and I need to be pretty, I need to be thin. And boys grow up thinking, I'm going to be a great footballer, or I can, I'm brave, I can climb trees, or I'm doing really well at school. And then, of course, don't stereotype the chores that they do at home or the toys that you think they might want to play with. So, for instance, up to the age of 18 months, boys are just as interested as girls in playing with dolls. Isn't that interesting? But then parents start policing what they play with. Particularly fathers start policing their sons. So you can't play with that, that's a girl's toy. Why is it a girl's toy? Playing with dolls allows you to... To, to, to learn empathy, to put yourself in someone else's position, to act out the sort of interactions that you have in everyday life and make sense of them. It's nothing to do with being a boy or a girl. And then I suppose the last one is as employers, because I think a lot of progress has been made in terms of people being more aware of unconscious bias or blind CVs. Mm. But is there anything you think as employers in this room that we could kind of make the next step on? Well, I think one of the things you can really do is look at the culture in your organization. So you may well be promoting women faster than you used to, and you may be starting to improve life for them. But when it comes to the everyday interactions, which is what I'm at least partly writing about, are their voices being heard as much as men in meetings? Are they being interrupted more than men? Are people ignoring their views until a man makes exactly the same point and it's treated like the second coming? You know, and, and, and if that's the case, be an ally to them. You know, so you know, if you get interrupted, then I would say, oh, hang on, I was really interested in what Fiona was saying there. Or you know, suppose you make a point and no one takes you notice until the man repeats it 10 minutes later. I can say, oh, I'm so glad you agree with what Fiona said earlier. <laughs> You know, so we'd all, we should all be very alert to this. But there are also very good research-based methods that improve prospects for women. So, for instance, did you know that having only one woman on a selection panel actually reduces the chances of a woman being hired? Because what happens is that the men think, oh, we don't have to worry about all this diversity stuff, the woman will take care of that. And the woman thinks, I shouldn't recommend the female candidate because all these men will think I'm being nepotistic. And therefore, you always need more than one woman on a selection panel. And you also need more than one woman on a shortlist, because otherwise you're giving the subliminal idea that if it's five to one, then on average, men are five times better at this job than women are. But there are many more suggestions in, in the last chapter. Yes. I think I would definitely, for everyone, I would read everything, but I would definitely <laughs> focus on some of the tangible actions, because they are fantastic to help you drive forward. And, and in fact, I, I would just say broadly, uh, two, two points on this. One is, we should acknowledge that however liberal or intelligent or nudge stock attending we are, or even female, the chances are that we probably do harbour unconscious bias against women. I know I do. And, but, but what we can do, because it's unconscious, we can't change it. We needn't feel ashamed of it. We can't put a lid on it. But we can notice when it manifests itself and then do something to correct it. So I'm really asking just some more awareness in all of us. And secondly, I think one big lesson is don't confuse confidence with competence, because they're absolutely not the same thing. And understand how much harder it is for a woman to display the right amount of confidence so enough to be respected, but not, not so much that she's disliked, whereas for men, it's a doddle. And you know, if a man tells you how great he is, 
Don't take him at his word. Examine his output. And if a woman is modest about her accomplishments, don't take her at her word. Examine her output too. Yes, there was a great quote from Julia Gillard, I thought, on that, where she like, talked about, you know, being a doctor to one of her pushes back in one of the interviews she did, where I thought, you know, she put someone in her place by noticing her competence, even if they didn't like her style. Yes, say, so. yes. I mean, women, are, women with titles like doctor or professor, much less likely to be introduced by their title than men are. There are so many things like this that are sort of subcon done subconsciously that have a subconscious effect on us. Yes, well, we have a friend who's just become a dame and we've told her to own it and tell everyone she's a dame. So Nothing like a dame. <laughs> so what would, gives you hope, though, moving forward? Because the book actually ends very hopefully. You have another quote from Mary McAleese at the end, which is like, when we all work together, we all flourish. And from all your studies and from the work you're still doing, talking about the, and the audiences you engage with, what gives you kind of hope of where we'll be maybe in five, 10, 15 years' time? Well, OK, so my hope comes from the middle third of men and I'll explain that now. So about a third of men are already brilliant at this and will listen to us just as attentively as they'll listen to other men. They love working alongside women. They're happy to work for women. And they're great. And we notice it instantly. We love it. We really appreciate it. And then there's about a third of men at the other end of the spectrum who are, frankly, the dinosaurs. You know, it's not just unconscious. It's probably conscious bias. They genuinely think they're superior to us. Um, not really evidence-based, but nonetheless, I don't think they're going to read my book, and I don't think they're going to change their minds. But I do think that there is about a third of men in the middle who are not actively malign to women. They just don't notice that they take up disproportionate conversational time in a conversation. They'll talk twice as much as a woman they're talking to, talking to rather than with, you know, um, or that they interrupt women more than men. Or if they walk up to a man and a woman standing together, they'll automatically address the man first before the woman. Or if a man and a woman walk into a meeting, they'll assume she's his junior. But they're not doing this on purpose or, as I say, malignly. And I think they could become much more aware of their actions. And then you've got two-thirds of men being quite enlightened about this who can call out the other third. And I, and I compare it, because of course if women call it out, a lot of men are just going to think, oh, la, 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 there she goes again. If other men call it out, I mean, this is part of the problem that I'm writing about in the book, that men listen to other men more than they listen to women. If other men call it out, they will start to take it more seriously. And I compare it to racism, say, 20 years ago, where if you had a bunch of white people in a room together, one of them might tell a casually racist joke and think it was a safe space to do it and would get away with it. That doesn't happen anymore, thank God. I would like that to be the case for sexism in 5, 10, 20 years' time, that if a man says something sexist, either just in a group of men or indeed in front of women, he can't get away with it either. So I think, thank you so much, Marianne, and hopefully we can all flourish. <laughs>
lucky for me, they wanted to talk about my very favorite subject, which is actually how we access System 1 psychedelic medicine. Um, so what can relative insight reveal about the very, very messy data set of analysis of psychedelic states? We are going to share that with the online audience now. And for everyone in the room, this video will be made available to you afterwards. But for now, it's refreshments, cold refreshments outside. I think hot ones at the back. And we want to be back in this room. At 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. You guys. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara and Dan. Thank you for staying with us for this um, presentation, which hopefully is going to blow your mind, um, because that's what it's all about, how people have had their minds expanded, changed by psychedelic medicine. We have with us today Relative Insight, one of my very, very favorite partners in the world for Nudgedoc and uh, a business I've worked very closely with for a number of years. And I met at MADFEST under a parasol, uh, MADFEST that we've been partnering with uh, this week. So you never know who you're gonna meet under a parasol coming up. Do go and check them out with the green umbrella. Um, but I've got with me James Cuthbertson, CRO for Relative Insight, and he's gonna be talking about the most messy and unstructured data you could possibly imagine. All of this mad qualitative data that comes from transcripts, um, or sorry, survey data from people describing their psychedelic experiences. So over to James to, to take us through the report. Hello everyone, um, I'm James Cuthbertson, the CRO at Relative Insight, and I'm gonna be taking a trip through text analytics um, over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, now, before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about Relative Insight and what it is that we do. So we are a text analytics company. We analyze and visualize our customers' text data. And interestingly, we have quite a unique origin story in that we actually started out life uh, putting bad guys in jail. Uh, the way that we did that was we would compare individual children speaking online in order to identify when someone sounded just a little bit different. Or to put it another way, um, when someone actually wasn't a 14-year-old girl, but was rather a 40-year-old man doing a very sophisticated impression, which is obviously very important work. Uh, but you may be thinking, what on earth is this person talking to me about criminal linguistics for? Well, um, we now apply that same methodology of comparison, um, but we tend to apply it um, in these three areas. So that's digital marketing, and consumer analytics and customer experience. We're also seeing a rising tide in people analytics as well, so the world of HR. Um, so when we help our brand and agency customers that we tend to work with do this type of comparative analysis, uh, it tends to be using four types of data that they tend to be sitting on top of. So the first is surveys. So good old fashioned surveys, everyone knows that open-ended responses in surveys are a bit of a pain in the ass. Um, and either get ignored or don't get put in at all because of the difficulty in analyzing them. So we allow our customers to simply upload those survey um, responses and we're able to make sense of all those messy open ends very quickly. The second uh, type of data is social listening data. So social listening tools are pretty ubiquitous now and most people will be running a brand watch or Crimson Hexagon talk or a net based tool. Um, and so if you want to elevate that text analytics portion um, and get a bit more out of that uh, unstructured social data, then people upload files from those tools into Relative Insight. Reviews, in our opinion, one of the, the greatest untapped resources um, in consumer insights. And so we're talking Amazon, TripAdvisor, Google, et cetera, wonderful sources of information. And then the final thing is customer service or CS transcripts. So that would be think your customer contact kind of environment, whether that be uh, bots or live chat or, or transcribed calls. So there's, what we're trying to say there is there's wonderful and huge amounts of this unstructured data operating and sitting in most agencies and brands out there. So um, we wanted to uh, run this particular study, firstly, because the area of psychedelics is um, very, very interesting and also uh, undergoing a huge amount of change. Um, and so we thought that was a sensible area to have a look at, but also we wanted to do it as a proxy to 
basically he's saying we can if we can un, we, if we can make sense of this type of data we can truly make sense of any type of data because this is people you know in their most kind of free flowing and, and perhaps most unstructured way of writing so that was like the, the, the message that we wanted to send um so on to the psychedelics report itself then um so you may or may not know that uh, that psychedelics is definitely a rising tide with uh, with books being uh, written and also uh, Netflix documentaries being made as a couple of celebrity endorsers up on this slide um, and the um, and the market itself is purported to be worth 10.75 billion in the US alone by 20 by 2027 which is a pretty big deal um, now obviously it's still definitely fringe not mainstream for most Americans which is obviously the, what this slide alludes to um, and is definitely seen as kind of like a fairly misunderstood thing still in, in Europe and the UK. I do not claim to be a, a detailed specialist, although I will be speaking to one shortly. Um, however, the, the market itself is just is just fascinating and, and is exploding um, in size. So um, before we get into our analysis, obviously, I just want to explain what we did. So we looked at people's trips, the way that they explained and reported on their trips, and we compared people that had, had an experience with psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms versus LSD. And for those of you that are beginners watching this, that's effectively the way to think about this in a very simple way is one is kind of a natural co compound, is one, one is a synthetic compound, but largely are in the same kind of class of, of drug and do the same sort of thing. Although, forgive me, I'm sure there'll be experienced people looking at this saying that isn't right, but roughly for, for the layman, that's a decent way to think about it. So what we did was we compared those two experiences um, and we got the data through a survey which was held. And as you can see, there were 4,000 global respondents, um, over 5 million words analyzed. So we're talking about a pretty chunky um, data set. And, and, and the, the basic methodology was the comparison of, of these two, two experiences, one with psilocybin and one with LSD. So let's get on to some of the things that, that we that we found out. But before we do that, I'll just give you a couple of verbatim examples. If you just read through these quotes on screen, you'll notice that, as I said, the language is fairly expressive and eloquent and quite far reaching. Can you imagine, you know, either as a qualitative researcher or as an analyst attempting to try and create themes out of this kind of stuff? I'm sure you can understand that that would have some challenges. And so, we pitted our technology um, at this um, as, a, as, a, as a test, and these are some of the themes that we were able to pull out. First things first, um, nice and simple one, most used phrases. So these were the most used phrases that were appearing across the entire data set, which is always an interesting first place to start. And when we talk about phrases, what we mean is two words or three words grouped together, which the tool does automatically. We then moved on to comparing men versus women. Um, and so largely what we saw is that uh, women were very much more emotional in their language. Um, they used many more emotions, as in they actually used more, uh, more broad uh, a classification of emotions, whereas men used fewer. Um, and the theme that we saw emerging in men is that they would attempt to understate their experience, especially, <clears throat> especially in the first half. So what we were seeing is that men would like diminish its impact, say that they actually weren't feeling anything, say that they were feeling in control, saying that they were disappointed um, compared with women where that type of language was, was not at all present, which is an interesting difference. Um, we also saw that um, females' language was extroverted and descriptive, much more so than men which were very much more insular and looking inwardly at their experience and themselves. Whereas, whereas women would look more outwardly and describe the experiences from a, from a looking out point of view. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, moving on then, um, we then looked at the, as we said, the, the, the main comparison, which was the comparison of the two drugs themselves. And so when you put these two drugs against one another, what you're able to see is that um, psilocybin is very much more about nature and there's a lot of focus around the power of the mushroom itself so if you think like without being too cheesy you're kind of seeing this kind of slightly more hippie-ish style of language without casting aspersions whereas with lsd we definitely saw that it was much more anchored in the day-to-day 
people life experience. So it's not so much kind of like nature and the power of the mushroom, but much more like things that you would tend to see and observations that you would tend to see in day-to-day -day life, which is quite interesting in that um, some of the other experiences were quite similar. Um, again, if we carry on with this comparison, what we also saw is that people that were um, on psilocybin were much more quiet, con contemplative, calm, peaceful. Um, whereas the LSD experience was very much more active, physically moving around high energy, high excitement, um, which was also quite a different, um, different experience. Um, the other thing we saw is that um, people in, in the psilocybin experience talked a great deal about smell, obsessed about smell, how things smelled. And generally it was either that there were like earthy smells or they were extremely positive smells. Um, things that smelled delicious or things that smelled amazing. Whereas um, the kind of the experience that we had over in LSD was this kind of rushing feeling, which you might associate with kind of this idea of euphoria. It's kind of the roller coaster, hair back experience. So those two things are completely different. And that's quite ex interesting to, to compare those two things and see that, yes, they're both kind of like a physical impact that's happening as a result of this experience, but they're very, very diverse. Um, and then moving on to um, f furthering that point. Um, so what we're seeing with psilocybin is that the physical, physical impacts, i.e. like legs, arms, he feeling heavy, feeling drowsy, something that was coming up a lot, whereas LSD was very much not feeling drowsy, having that legs or heavy arms, but much more like in, the, in your brain, in your mind, um, the experience kind of being limited to that and the body not being so heavily impacted. So those are some, I've rattled through some insights there, which we pulled out of a survey. So for the cynics amongst you, you may be thinking, this is kind of cool. They've gone to something that is eye-catching, but what on earth does it mean for me working as you know, a brand lead or an account director in an agency or working in the insights or marketing team within a brand? Well, what I think it means is that there's probably um, two things that I'd like you to take away from this. The first is the point that we made at the beginning of the presentation, which is that if we can make sense of this, we can definitely make sense of your survey about Kit Kats or about holidays, because that's going to be a lot easier to analyze. The other thing that I think is worth saying is that more, more and more of your audience is partaking or experiencing um, psychedelic drugs. And I think that the other thing to say is that we can also use this as a, the relationship for other drugs, for example, that have been legalized broadly across the states. So um, with the change in cannabis laws across most states now, what you're seeing is that consumers are partaking in, the, in these drugs whilst interacting with your brand. So for example, if they're gaming or if they're watching TV or if they're listening to the radio, um, they are actually partaking and interacting with your brands um, whilst experiencing these things. Now, what that means exactly for brands and agencies, I'm not sure, but it certainly is food for thought and certainly is something that needs considering because I think what we do do is we do cater for life moments. You know, I think agencies and brands are obsessed with life moments and the situation that puts people in. They're also obsessed with what it means for people. What does their brand mean for people at parties or when, for, when they're drinking or when they're on nights out? You know, we, we get asked about that so often. And so why would brands and agencies not start to consider the, the mental state of people that have taken or are experiencing these types of drugs or other types of drugs? I think it's certainly food for thought, if nothing else. So um, just to summarize, um, we are able to uncover insights from any type of text data. Um, and um, I'm now going to chat a little bit more about this area of Tara. Thank you very much. James, I'm so glad you've done this piece of analysis because there's a lot of academics I want to share it with. Um, I think there is a lot more in the psychedelic space that can be done in the clinical trials um, with this kind of analysis. One of the things I'm so interested in is that you, you could see the differences between psilocybin and LSD experiences. Um, some of the recent data has shown that when that is blinded for people, when they don't know what they're taking, the experience is much more similar yeah. uh, than they're expecting. Um, but it's only really by you know, putting this language, this qualitative, messy language into your tool 
that we can even see at scale, are there differences? If it's blinded, are there differences? So please, whoever is watching on the academic side, uh, all those professors out there, do start using this technology in order to validate some of the hypotheses that we, we have. Um, but back over to kind of business and brands, uh, you talked a bit about why, um, why brands and businesses should uh, look to, to using this. Um, what, uh, give me a little bit more about the kinds of data sets that you think are available out there that, that people aren't tapping into at the moment, perhaps. Yeah, so I think um, the way I'd answer that is kind of like on a scale. So you've got your slightly more rudimentary, boring, if you wanted to be harsh, use cases that are going to effectively just address rigor and time saving. And that's your kind of, I'm using Medallia or I'm using Qualtrics or I've got a social listening tool and I've got unstructured data in there and I'll make more of it. And that's kind of like steady away. Maybe not the most fascinating, but like is, is a solid use case and probably makes up for like 80% of the way that people use the tool. And then you've got everything, then you've got the long tail of mad, weird and wonderful effectively. So that's everything from IDIs and video diaries and um, like, academic papers and da 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 da, da. There, there truly is like a very long tail. And we've, we've analyzed everything from um, like engineer reports for, for like British gas, you know, when people go out on jobs and write out what's happened to in an incident all the way through to like, as I said, like um, trip experiences where people are talking about their, their drug experiences. So the, the, the idea, I suppose, is that it is truly op like open in that you can upload any text data. I don't think I we've think. touched on yet, which is trend analysis. So when you're, you're able to look at uh, time periods and see, okay, in 2023, uh, the media taking all of the newspaper articles you could get in the UK in this year, were 75.4 times more likely to talk about psychedelics than they were in 2022, which I'm sure is correct, of course. <laughs> um, but certainly that you can, but equally you could say that in forum data about blue mascara or about um, white chocolate or whatever it is where you're looking for that growth, instead of just looking at, like you say, the word cloud, the frequency, oh, everybody's still, I'm, I've done this piece of analysis actually, um, on for, for lamb, I think we were looking oh, at yeah, like lamb. I remember that, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, and and everybody's still talking about lamb roasts. That's the big word in the word cloud. Great big roast dinner. Um, but actually, versus last year, people are more likely to talk about tagine, or yeah. they're more likely to talk about this kind of. Stew. I remember that. That was a great project, Mediterranean yeah. style cooking. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. cool. And and seeing that kind of velocity and that trend is also something I think a lot of our, our clients could really really benefit from. yeah totally because it's like oh more people in the uk are talking about blue mascara and mm -hmm. then your next question should be okay well are they also talking about other, other types of mascara mm -hmm. and then the answer might be yes mm -hmm. <laughs> so then or, or you know like they might also be talking just as much about red mascara mm -hmm. so versus what is also important isn't it um, you mentioned the fact that um that people are, are, are smoking weed they're they're drinking we're, we're used to that they're also smoking we've done some analysis together on nicotine usage and vaping and nicotine pouches and smoking different different psychoactives so there's obviously that's interesting as a lens but one of the things i took a, a away um, from your presentation was actually you know too many of us put qual and quant kind of uh, in opposition, almost. And one of the fascinating things for me is that this data really is messy verbatim data, people describing their experiences. But when you have that at such scale, this is quantifiable. Totally. Rory often talks about the way that we fetishize numbers. And with this tool, you have the ability to say 17.5 times more likely to say this, to really give some hard numbers around stuff that otherwise feels very, very amorphous, very fluffy and, and fat. Um, and I just think there's, there's something interesting in that kind of qual quant balance that you guys are bringing by actually looking for pattern in these huge data sets, not a couple of words, not a couple of... Uh, interviews, but really big, big data sets. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for those people watching that are sat on boards or, or executive leadership teams, like how many times have you seen a, an insight at a board meeting that isn't a number? 
mm. because my answer is none mm. and I work for a text analytics company. Mm. And so I think that that's potentially a big problem in that if we are if we are hoping that people will take qualitative insights seriously, they have to be they have to be numerical in their nature. And so that does degrade this qual quant barrier, which I personally don't really think exists so much. I know it's easy as a classifier, but I really think that like in order to derive proper actionable insights from text, you need to be able to quantify them and therefore the two start to blend. So um, that's probably all we've, we've got time for, but Red Mascara, you heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you so much to James and everyone from Relative Insight. Do check them out if you're lucky enough to be in the room. They've got a green umbrella. Uh, you can't miss them. Go and ask them how they can help you analyze your data. luxurious prize Ooh. I may have given you the um, idea that one of you will get wet in relation to this prize that's not the case someone might get wet later when we reveal what the prize is the prize won't involve anyone getting wet in fact quite the opposite but it really is very luxurious very very expensive and you really will want to win this prize I don't think there's anyone in this room that won't want it so please do get tweeting with hashtag 2023. And I tell you one thing, it is not a book, okay? The prize is not a book. Not that we don't love books. And uh, I think we, if we t click on to the next slide here, somebody, if we click through. We've given away a lot of books in the last 11 years, haven't we, Dan? We have. We've certainly given away oh, a lot of books over the Sorry. years. And uh, one of the partners who's been with us for many years now is Cloud Army. They're a preferred research partner for brands and agencies looking to uncover implicit insights and biases. So who here remembers Nano Salad? Some of you remember Nano Salad, right? Who was here two years ago? Nano Salad, Big BS Workshop, that's it. So when we did the Nano Salad, Big, Big BS Workshop, Cloud Army showcased how Nudge and Neuro can make perfect partners by working together on optimizing our motivational framing. They tested our ideas, propositions, claims, narratives, and we did it all live together. And last year, you might remember, they tested our audience live and helped us explore the science of visuals. Well, this year, Cloud Army, great partner of ours, really grateful to have them here, keeping down the costs of this conference. Would you believe it would have been even more expensive if it weren't for all of these bloody lovely sponsors? For decades, psychologists have researched the science of sound. They've made major discoveries in how sound can change what we drink and what we think. We're delighted to have with us today Steve Keller. He's a sonic strategy director at Studio Resonate, an audio-first creative agency. He's well-renowned as being one of the world's most, um, most well-known sonic strategies directors. He's joined with Tom Noble, who's a co-founder of Cloud Army, and also a pioneer in applied neuroscience. Please put together your hands for Tom and Steve. Yeah. Wow. It's been messy, but in a great way. Uh, I love presenting at conferences mainly because I love to hear everybody else speaking instead of my own voice. And I've been excited to hear um, just the uh, little nuances already where we've been talking about sound, Mona talking about the opportunity to maybe think about how we can sonify data. We're going to talk about bias in voices a little bit that Mary Ann touched on a little bit, AI. Uh, later on, you'll be hearing some things about mental health, about sleep, about oxytocin. That's all connected to sound. And so what we want to do for you today, Tom and I, is to take you on a little journey, uh, give you a little bit of insight into the power of sound, maybe a few little sound hacks that you can use in your own life, reveal some first-of-its-kind research that nobody has ever seen or heard until today. Um, and um, if we do our jobs right, 
you'll go through the rest of this day and hopefully maybe even the weekend listening to the world around you a little bit differently. So with that said, let's get started talking a little bit about audio alchemy. So what is audio alchemy? The easiest way I've found to describe it is to say it's the process of taking a little bit of sound science, blending that with sound art, and if you do it correctly, you end up with a little bit of sound magic. Now, I think of alchemy in the Jungian sense of alchemy, which was really about a transformative process, and part of that process for Jung was chaos, and that was where creativity lived. So this idea of messiness is at the heart of audio alchemy. And then, as a sonic strategist, which when I'm introduced, people hear that term, and they say, great title, but what the hell do you do? Uh, it's just a little bit of a variation on that idea. It's still this blend of sound science and sound art, but we use it in such a way to try and help folks make sound decisions, quite literally and figuratively. So let's dive into that a little bit. And I'm, before we get started, just want to give you a little piece of research um, that is uh, a little heartening and disheartening at the same time. So this was a piece of research that was done by Ipsos uh, using 2,000 different uh, television commercials. They went through these commercials and they took a look at um, all of the distinctive assets that brands were using in these commercials. Now, not unsurprisingly to me, 92% of the assets that they cataloged were visual in nature. You have logos, colors, characters, celebrities, they also cataloged sonic brand cues. Some of you may know those as sonic logos, brand themes, consistent uses of music that could be used as a brand device, 8%. So in all of these advertisements, sound got only 8%. But the interesting thing in Ipsos' study was they took a look at brand salience. So they were actually looking at the effectiveness of these campaigns and tying it to the use of these distinctive sonic assets. And certainly, visuals had an impact. It was always interesting to me to note that characters far outperformed logos as a distinctive uh, asset. But look at the power of sound here. When they analyzed all their data, they found that at the end of the day, advertisements that were using sonic brand cues were eight and, almost eight and a half times more likely to produce the brand salience and the effectiveness that the advertisers were looking for. So this says to me that while sound is hugely powerful, it's still undervalued. So one of the things that I want you to do today as you're listening to everyone speaking is thinking about how sound is kind of a part of a common thread that's woven through all of this and that maybe in the noise, that's a little bit of the signal that, that we can find. So, the fascinating thing to me is, as I've done this research and done this work, is to find all the different ways that science addresses sound. We have psychoacoustics, which is basically the physical properties of sound and how it affects the world around us. I most recently dove into psychoacoustics with some research that I did with Kellogg's, where I played hip hop to cheese as it aged for six months, to see if I could change the molecular structure of the cheese. <laughs> you actually can, because it's affecting the microorganisms as they're developing, and that changes the aroma and the flavor of the cheese. And then Kellogg's turned that into some sonically aged cheese. it sold it online, and in two weeks sold out the boxes. I think you can still get some available on, uh, on eBay today. So psychoacoustics is one of the, the areas of science that we look at in sound. The other is psychophysics. Psychophysics takes a look at our sensory input and how we make sense of the world around us through those senses. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more specifically in a moment. Sonic semiotics, the way that sound produces an awareness of symbols and can actually change narratives. We've been able to change the way that commercials are perceived and the narrative underneath of those commercials simply by changing the soundtrack. And we're able to change where people are looking on the screen, we're able to change how they're interpreting uh, the action that's happening all through these sonic semiotics. 
There's also ethnomusicology, where we kind of look at the cultural aspects of sound, the way people use sound in their lives, and then music cognition, which is essentially kind of looking at the psychological size, sciences and how uh, music and psychology work in our lives. So I want to talk about three things in spe specifically today before I turn it over to Tom here. And to do that, I want to give you a quick introduction to a little bit of music theory. So these are all the music building blocks of sound, pitch, tempo, dynamics, harmony, modality, timbre, and articulation. So when we talk about pitch, we're really talking about something that's high or something that's low. We talk about tempo. We can talk about fast or slowing it down. When we talk about dynamics, we can talk about something that's loud or soft. Harmony, consonant or dissonant. Modality, something that's major or minor. Timbre, something that's bright or dull. That's instrumentation, very often changes those. And the last one is articulation. Something that is staccato, the notes are all separate, or legato, the notes woven together. So try and think about those things. We're gonna tap into that as I go through these sections with you. So let's talk about emotion at the beginning. There are a lot of theories around emotions and how emotions work. The one that I wanna share with you this morning is from a researcher by the name of Russell. Russell took uh, a look at arousal, how high or low arousal is, um, and compared that with valence, positive and negative, or how much we're attracted to something or repelled by something. And in building this model, he was able to kind of look at a series of emotions that were correlated somewhere in this axis between arousal and valence. Using this and these musical building blocks, we can start thinking about how to target emotions with sound. So if we have something that's high in pitch, fast in tempo, we're getting up to something that's very excited and alert. Let's drop that tempo just a little bit, but still keep the pitch fairly high. That's a little more happy, fun. Now let's drop the pitch and definitely drop the tempo. Let's move away from staccato notes into more legato notes. I'm starting to feel maybe a little more relaxed out of that. Now if we build in some minor keys, kind of move to the other side of valence, now maybe this is a bit more melancholy. We might even say sad. If we stay on this side of valence, but we up the dissonance and up the tempo, then we're moving into sounds that might make us feel a little more tense or nervous or uncomfortable. So knowing how we can use these building blocks of sound, we do this very naturally all the time. Think about the playlists that you may have, have built. I call these things sonic tonics. They're a way for us to look at our emotions, our moods, our mental states, and use music and sound in a very positive way. Think about when you're getting up in the morning. My suggestion for you is that you don't use a really loud alarm to shock your system because when your brain first wakes up, you're in a fight or flight mode and that loudness can give you a jolt of adrenaline and that cortisol that's not exactly healthy for you. But if you have a particular piece of music that you like and that you enjoy, that can bring you out of sleep in a much more positive way than an alarm. You can use these playlists to kind of lean into emotions and moods. One of the things, if you're feeling down and melancholy, this might be counterintuitive, but you may want to actually lean into that because the research shows us that what happens is when we're listening to sad music, that can have really a positive effect. It actually creates more of a sense of empathy for us. And if you want to focus, try using music that has a very 
static tempo, maybe 80 to 100 BPM, your brain starts to entrain with that static tempo. The tempo that's a little bit higher gets those cognitive processes working a little bit more and try to avoid things with, with lyrics. These are all sonic tonics that we can use. And an interesting study that Apple did was uh, worked with Sonos, used 109 folks in 30 different homes, had them put on wearables, they had eye beacons, they had cameras tracking movement, and took a look at what happened in homes in a period where there was no music being listened to to another period where there was music. And they found that in homes after the music was there, the physical distance between individuals decreased by up to 12%. People were 15% 15 more, 15 more likely to laugh 18% more likely to say, I love you. And they found that a lot of folks spent 37% more time in bed. <laughs> we know what that means. <laughs> and so finally, before I leave this section on emotion, I just thought I'd mention, I think, automotive manufacturers who've always been attuned to sound and the way that sound produces a relationship with a vehicle are really leaning more into sound in electric vehicles as they begin to think about that point in time when we are going to have self-driving vehicles. And it's no longer just for transportation, but vehicles can be spaces for entertainment, for health and wellness, uh, and also for work. And so Mercedes has done some really interesting things in hiring um, an acoustician to develop some soundscapes for relaxation, for focus, for energy. Um, they're working on ways that they can use the wearables to actually kind of understand your stress levels, if you're awake, if you're getting drowsy, and be able to use AI to generate music soundscapes. You stop for a 10-minute charge, They've got a soundscape for that that relaxes you at the beginning and then at the end of the 10 minutes starts picking the energy level back up. And another interesting sonic intervention is the use of pink noise. They use a burst of pink noise if the car senses that you're about to crash and that pink noise triggers what's called a stapidious reflex. It kind of separates the eardrum from the inner ear bones and prepares you for what is more likely going to be loud noises as a result of that crash, and it mitigates potential hearing damage. So I think it's fascinating to see how automobile manufacturers are really leaning into sound and emotion in a much more interesting way. Now let's talk a little bit about perception. So we talked some about emotion, let's talk about perception. I've done a lot of work with Charles Spence, who heads up the Cross Modal Research Laboratory at Oxford, and we've worked with Charles on understanding this idea of sonic seasonings. We use um, a cross modal principle called Buba Kiki. Now, some of you may be familiar with this. You see these designs. One of these designs is a Buba, and one is a Kiki. Which is which? What do you think is the booba? Shout it out. Yes, exactly. And how did you know that? Did we study that in school? What the researchers have found is that our brains are wired for congruency, so we're just looking for the ways that things fit. We look at those round edges, maybe we're looking at the roundness of the letters, maybe we're thinking that booba sounds a little softer in our mouth, whereas kiki is a little harsher, a little sharper, fits that diagram. Now what if I were to say to you, would you like a, cho a chocolate that tastes booba or a chocolate that tastes kiki? Now your brain is starting to work with congruency between those sounds and those flavors. And indeed, we found that if we take our sonic seasonings, we can tease out flavors. We can actually prime the brain and change your perception of flavor using these sonic seasonings. This particular sonic seasoning, tasting a piece of chocolate, you might tend to taste that chocolate as being a little more bitter. If we change those sonic seasonings a little bit, this is the sonic seasonings for sweetness. We can actually increase your perception of sweetness 
of that chocolate. We've been able to tease out Sonic seasonings for salt and for sour. This one just kind of makes my teeth hurt when I hear it. And we've used this research in a lot of different ways with a lot of different brands. Worked with Propel once to take uh, their energy drink, which has salt um, and sweetness, and putting those two things together with the sonic soundscapes. Consumers were able to move a fader on an app we built called Flavor DJ, and the Propel would taste a little more salty or a little more sweet. We've used this in healthcare, thinking about nutrition, thinking about the fact that in loud environments you tend to consume more. So here's a little sonic diet tip for you, wear earplugs when you eat. The research shows you can consume up to 30% less calories as a result. And now let's talk a little bit about bias before I turn it over to Tom to bring the research up. We've been doing a lot of thinking about how we hear voices in particular and biases that may exist there. Very fascinating article recently in The New Yorker um, looking at what they call the sensory of shrill and that women were vastly uh, employed as sound operators and then with the advent of radio and attempting to move over to become radio announcers, found that often their voices were described as shrill, as harsh, as distorted. That really had nothing to do with the women's voices. It had everything to do with the fact that men were building technology based on certain regulations and only thinking about lower pitched voices. And as a result, women's voices just didn't sound that great. You couldn't hear the consonants and the articulation. And not only that, but the male engineers just assumed that female voices would be softer, so in cranking up the volume, it distorted. So what were women left to do? Tried to adapt to a male voice with a lower pitch, with a certain type of articulation. We found this exists in AI assistants, even now. Think about the voices that we hear coming from our AI assistants. They're typically white and female, which is problematic on, on two fronts. And not only the voices that we hear, but also how people speak to AI. And we found that across all of the platforms, the error rate for voices of color is much higher than the error rate for white voices. So it's almost as if the technology is saying, I would understand you better if you could sound a little more white. And as a result of this, we've launched an initiative called Stand for Sonic Diversity. You can go to StandForSonicDiversity.com to find out more of this and how we're choosing voiceovers in our commercials and what we can do to build more sonic diversity into that. So now I want to turn it over to Tom to talk a little bit about an experiment we did looking at AI voices, because now AI is all the rage. Can you tell uh, if an AI voice is human? Can you tell if an AI voice is coming from a synthesized source? And what do we need to think about as we think about the data sets and the training and the voices that we hear? So Tom, turn Thank it. you very much, Steve. Yeah. So. Uh, Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so I think Steve um, demonstrated admirably how a sort of stronger understanding of the science can actually provide creative inspiration for more, well, for cooking up more creative, emotionally charged sonic solutions. The question is, uh, can we actually understand the degree to which those sonic solutions are hitting the right notes and striking the right chords with the intended audience? Fortunately, um, there's been an evolution, too, in the uh, ability for science-based methodologies to measure the things that really matter when it comes to sonic effectiveness. And a lot of these focus very much around the power of, the, of our non-conscious and an understanding that our subconscious is incredibly powerful and influential in shaping our perception of sound, to the point where we have a mantra, which is, if it works at the non-conscious level, we should be measuring sound at that same level. 
So things like content and source um, and context all can help cue biases, all have a, a role in shaping perception. So yes, cueing unconscious biases, uh, evoking emotions, shaping perceptions, triggering behavior. And all of these things are worth measuring, and measuring at that deeper level. But at the same time, there's a kind of recognition that a reliance solely on traditional research, self-report methods, for example, like uh, focus groups and quant surveys, can only take us so far, and in some cases can lead us astray. So there are different ways of measuring sound using uh, non-conscious. One route is through labs, which we started doing in the early noughties, um, adapting techniques from the clinical medical world like EEG and fMRI and GSR. These things are fascinating, incredibly valuable and insightful. But being lab-based, they do have some challenges in terms of budget, and they have some challenges in terms of timelines and things like that. And they tend to be used for bigger ticket items, for more strategic projects, and for more kind of R&D type work, not for the kind of day-to-day -day work we're going to be spending time talking about today. It was really the advent of cloud-based technology and the introduction of platforms, which would then were loaded with implicit-type metrics, which brought the possibilities of measuring sound into the fore, in a, in a different way into the fore. And of course, platform-based work allows us, because of the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, agility and, and scalability and affordability, it's much more in tune, if you like, with the fast-moving demands uh, of the commercial world. Um, take our Sonic Reactor platform as an example. It's loaded with an array of implicit, implicit testing tools that allow us to uncover hidden biases and associations, feelings, values, benefits, and um, actions and intents. How are these things used in the creative world and the research world today? Well, increasingly now with um, uh, uh, creative agencies and client side, we're seeing not just evaluation of Sonic um, solutions, but the actual creative optimization too, and right the way through the process. So um, in a sort of iterative test and learn kind of way. So we might be testing uh, at exploration stage different Sonic palettes and different Sonic territories. At the other end, we might be testing in the studio the final mix and blending of something that's going on air tomorrow. Um, who uses this stuff, and what kind of disciplines are they from? Well, of course, those involved in the fast-growing field of dis distinctive assets and sonic branding, this is a natural home for this kind of work. Sound design, um, it, you know, for example, ambience creation or experiential work. Music of all descriptions. And, of course, voice, which Steve has just alluded to. So what we want to do now is to share with you um, a study, absolutely hot off the press. We've only done this work uh, a couple of weeks ago in the US. Um, we wanted to look at a, a number of things, and so we recorded a whole bunch of radio scripts, half of them AI and half of them human. We looked at different genders and cultures, context, categories, and brands. Um, and we had sort of three primary areas that we wanted to explore with you today. Number one was, at a non-conscious level, do we respond differently to AI versus human voices? And if we do, what does that actually look like? So we're going to have a look at that. And then the third question was really about something that, that Steve alluded to, is can we actually tell the difference between these days between AI and human voices? So we put that to the test as well. So let's have a look at the overall shape of AI voices against human voices. We've used here a metric which we're calling implicit attraction, which is a kind of a, uh, um, approach withdrawal kind of measure for the psychologists amongst us. Um, what did we find? Did we detect a difference? Yes, we did. Not just um, a, a difference, but a statistically significant difference. Um, with the AI voices sort of 24% lower, or human voices 24% higher, um, in terms of their attraction. We have split attraction down into two metrics, positive and trust. Those two measures are very important in terms of triggering uh, approach withdrawal mechanisms and also helping to shape things um, like first impressions, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you can see again from the slide there, very healthy, boosted, uh, statistically significant um, scores uh, for human against AI, AI on both those dimensions. This is really quite interesting because the implicit attraction kind of mechanism works incredibly quickly. So within milliseconds of exposure to the voice for the first time, the brain will kind of create a kind of uh, a sense of, of attraction or rejection, in a sense, or withdrawal. Um, and that initial kind of 
uh, impression tends to act as a filter for what then follows. In this case, it's a radio ad. So you could say that the, um, the you know, the, from, a, from a human versus AI point of view, the humans have a kind of unfair advantage in the sense that they are more attractive to begin with, and they seem to be picking up good vibrations and resonating good vibrations in a way that is likely to, to induce, uh, likely to aid the communication as opposed to hinder the communication. But what happens if we completely change the context? What happens if we tell people that what they're listening to is actually an AI voice, even though it might be a human voice? And in this particular condition here, on the left you see people, we split the sample in half, who were listening to human voices but weren't told anything. And on the right, the people who were told that this is an AI voice. What you can see is quite an alarming collapse in terms of trust, 27% reduction, and a, and a small compression, if you like, uh, in terms of positivity. Um, obviously quite, quite uh, a worrisome thing in a way. Um, we all know how important trust is to brands, particularly these days, and how difficult it is to earn it and how easy it is to lose it. So it's a kind of real watch out for those who, the very notion of people believing a voice may be, might be AI or being told it is, can actually have a, a quite a, a kind of negative impact. So turning back to, oh, we're looking also, did the same thing happen with AI voices? Well, you can see from the chart, not really, not really any effect there. Tell people it's AI, they're listening to AI, you can see the trust levels are around the same, a slight drop off in positivity, true, but nothing like the same impact that we had with human voices. So, going back to the question about whether we as humans can consciously tell the difference, spot the difference between an AI voice and a human voice, we found that a, a slim majority, around about 60% of people, were confident enough to claim that they could tell the difference. The question is, can they? We found it was no better than the toss of a coin. When put to the test, people thought they could tell the difference, they actually couldn't. And one could make an assumption that this may get worse in the future, may get tougher in the future. And we have, well, we're going to be looking at, looking at different categories where things might be rather different in certain kind of contexts and certain kind of situations, like healthcare and finance, for example, rather than maybe more mundane things. Um, but you might think that you can do better than that. And we'd like to challenge you to do that. So either through the, uh, the QR code, through the URL, uh, uh, the, the, the URL or come and visit us over in the um, picnic area at our stand, and you can run the test there. We'll be collating all your responses and then feeding them back to nudge stockies over the coming weeks. So this was just, as we said, just the, the scratching, of, scratching of the surface and was really hot off the press, a bit messy in that regard, I'm afraid. But in terms of what's uh, lying ahead, we've got further work to do and to publish on gender biases, cultural biases, contextual biases, and we'll be reporting with Steve uh, um, a paper um, in due course. Steve, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> so, again, just to wrap up, think about what you're hearing today. Think about the potential that sound has to be used in your own work, in interventions, whether it's in your personal life, in your communities, in your businesses. Uh, think about how you can research, test, and measure. And I wanted to leave you with this, because I'm a huge Miles Davis fan. And when somebody asked Miles about how he plays and how he was able to play so well, he said, don't play what's there play what's not there. And a lot of times when we're pursuing data, we can get so focused on the data, so focused on the signal, if you will, that we lose some of the benefits of finding some things in the other noise around it. So when it comes to the data, it's not just about playing what's there, it's about playing what's not there. So thanks for your time, and I hope you hear the world a little differently today. Thank you so much, guys. That was, that was wonderful. Um, and if you are tuning in now to the importance of sound and audio, the eagle-eared, what's that? That's the wrong metaphor, might have noticed that each of our speakers today is walking up on stage with a different piece of music. I'm sure you noticed 
uh, Rory's March of the Bumblebee. Or, um, and that's, that's happening because of one of our wonderful sponsors, Startle. So Startle work with the very cleverest hospitality and retail clients. Maybe some of you are in the room today. And they work with them to design branded atmospheres, to design atmospheres al alongside um, brand guidelines and business objectives. And they can scale them across the world, kind of make them consistent. And they use music, data, and actually behavioral science in doing that. So you will have noticed maybe on some of the slides that come up, there's a little bit of a rationale for the, the musical choices that they've made today. Um, these guys have sort of specialist expertise in this area, and we are extremely glad to welcome them as uh, Nudge Stock sponsors. Uh, tell us what you think of the music. Tell, what would be your Nudge Stock track of the year? Hashtag 2023, Nudge Stock 2023. There is the prize. It's not a book. Any extra sounds you're hearing are Rory trying to turn his phone off over there <laughs> on silent in the corner. Next, you have a fascinating turnaround story from a Spanish beer brand, Cruz Campo, and importantly, an idea unlocked with behavioral science. To tell that story, we are delighted to have Marta Garcia Alonso, a global marketing leader in Heineken. We, with her, we have her partner, Roberto Farah, the chief creative officer of Spain, who's helped to bring the alchemy to life. And interviewing them both, we have Mike Hughes, the behavioral scientist in the room at the time, who's going to take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, please do. Hello, Nudge Stockers. Is everyone warm enough? We might need a cool cruise campo, I think. <laughs> um, okay, Marta, Roberto, welcome. Um, we're going to talk about the simple power of a behavioral science reframe. But before we get to the simplicity, let's talk about the messiness. Marta, I wonder whether you could give us some context. Where was the brand in 2019? Where was cruise campo? What was keeping you up at night? Um, well, all of you, I think you have to close your eyes and think that you're in the beautiful Andalusia. I think already the weather is kind of similar. <laughs> and that you're desperate to have a wonderful, fresh, and very cold beer like Cruz Campo. So, but the reality is that, um, well, beer is quite a nice category. It's a category that, apart from being very functional and giving refreshment, it's a category that is really emotional, and it's, it has like an extra layer that is really related to popular culture and really represents the identity of consumers. And uh, this was the case of Cruz Campo. Cruz Campo has been kind of an amazing icon for many, many years, and it's been uh, loved to levels that you cannot imagine. From, uh, we could show you thousands of, thousands of photos of people that they are like, with the logo, the tattoos, the, even they use it in their tombs. Uh, I could tell you amazing stories. But at the same time, you know that love and hate <laughs> seems to be quite uh, close. And this is a story of uh, probably one of the ones that we have encountered in our yeah. careers that I have suffered the most, at least. Yes. I don't know you, Roberto. Yeah, one of the worst. <laughs> Because when I landed in uh, Heineken, Spain, and I found this amazing uh, brand, at the same time, in social media, I started to look at, oh my god, we have 40% uh, in social media of very negative sentiment. So it was a love brand, but it had a lot of haters. And we, didn't, we were not able even to understand where this hate was coming from, to be very honest with you. We were trying to understand what did we do wrong, why is this happening? And, um, and we discovered a few things. First is that we were so big that, of course, when you're big and powerful, you create a bit of uh, haters by itself. But also it's because we were very different. Okay. Uh, we are probably the most bitter beer uh, with a very, very unique taste that it was kind of uh, is the beer that refreshes the most because the bitterness helps you to refresh. But instead of being understood by some customers as a positive, people were saying uh, that it was too bitter. But it became like a kind of excuse to hate us and an excuse sometimes to, to say that we were not good enough. And uh, this became a big, big problem for us. 
and we suffered quite a lot in the process because uh, uh, when we were discussing with the agency at the beginning, you know, you could see the team being very shy and say, let's ignore it, let's ignore social media, it will go. Of course, it doesn't go. It, it never does, <laughs> no, by the way. It gets bigger and bigger. The second thing that we try to be very naive and answer literally, say, no, let's say that we are super cool and uh, it doesn't work. And at one point, we were a bit stuck. No? Yeah, there was a moment like uh, even we were in the space of embracing that and, and making fun of that, uh, but it didn't quite work at, at the end because we weren't like really solving the problem or achieving yeah. uh, the, the behavior. Yeah. And Roberto, you, you received the brief. Yes. People are laughing at us. We're, people are making memes of us. Yes. Where do you start? Where do you start to unpick that challenge? Um, well, it was not like um, in, a, in a meeting in Seville. Uh, at that time, I wasn't there. Uh, it was my first month probably in the company. Uh, but Marta gave us like this huge brief. <laughs> like it was like full of pages. Like, that is a lot of feedback on social yeah, media. Yeah. And it was like, but it's like, it's, it's interesting to understand like why a, the right brief uh, with the right amount of information can help the, the creatives to, to start working, or the agency to start working, because it's not just creatives here. Mm. Um, but these are some of the quotes. So Marta can like say, that, and she said like perfectly, this is one of the biggest challenges that we will encounter as super professionals. She say, no resting, as the Cruz Campo becomes an iconic brand again. Mm. Um, and she, need, she say at the end, we need a cultural phenomenon a campaign capable of transcending marketing that creates a cultural trend. So, sounds easy? No, <laughs> no. It was quite of like, I mean, knowing when, where we were at the time, that it was like a, one of the haters, um, you know, alcoholic brands, and the taste was a, a thing, and how we could achieve that. So, the team was kind of like, okay, this is like, a great opportunity is a big challenge. We need to, to find a platform. But at that moment, we, we were like, OK, what we should do first uh, if we don't know how to change the behavior, if we don't have the weapons, we don't have the knowledge to that. And that's why uh, we say, like, ultimately, ultimately, we need to change that behavior. So we call behavioral science. <laughs> we send a B-side signal out that we all respond to when we see it, yeah. It's yeah. just because we invited you to Seville. Yes, yeah, <laughs> and also that, yeah, it's tough work, but it was great. Yeah. No, it was fun because um, at the beginning, I remember not everybody knew what it was, um, including me, um, and it was Alfonso who was like yeah. introducing us, the former president of Ogilvy, he introduced us to, to the discipline and we were like, okay, and then we met you and Sam, and yes. we, do, we do a bunch of like work, and we started doing the worship, and then the magic uh, it, it already happened. So first thing, like these guys came to Spain and started talking about surfers and salmons, and we were like, what? Like we're, we're sending beers. I was like, what's a surfer? What's a salmon? I'm a surfer, I'm a salmon? I don't know, like I'm both. Um, so, and then we start learning about these like, uh, terminology of behavioral science, you know, the practical effect, the, the fresh start effect. And we were like, kind of like surprised, amused, but at the same time, we were like, oh my God, I've been, I've been controlled all my life and I didn't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so yeah. So it's kind of like the robot understanding that it's a robot. And it's set in the right conditions that we can start to explore some of these different strategies as well. Yeah. I think it was amazing. And then, of course, we discovered the, the idea of the reframe. Mm. Uh, I mean, after like a bunch of work, I mean, uh, we knew that we needed to do a workshop. And it was like, seriously, like a two or three days of workshop with the whole team, strategy, creatives, client. Um, everybody was involved in that. And there was a bunch of information uh, to come up with something that could start putting the pillars and the basis for what it would be the final platform. So that was just pre-COVID, so I looked loads yeah. better then. I just want to say that. Right, yeah, two yeah. months before yeah, yeah, COVID. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, see people like getting together, touching each <laughs> <Yeah>. other, <laughs> and having drank, Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, there was a, bunch, a lot of beer. 
uh, it was very intense. Uh, think about like a, a bunch of people that has never been involved in a kind of like a worship like this. So it was a surprise, but a learning all the time. It was, for me, it was a fantastic experience, and I, I know from Marta that it was too. So basically then uh, we knew that we have this sort of like brand framework. We knew what it was the brand in essence. We, we needed to find the tone. We needed to find the strategy, territories, and finally the brand idea. So this is kind of a boring, but like sometimes you have to fulfill the things and, 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 and that. So the brand essence was like true joy comes from being yourself. That was yeah. part of the brand. Uh, brand in the bottle. That was like, no, yes. yeah, yeah. the yes, brand in the book. <laughs> and suddenly one day we were talking about the Andalusian people and, and the culture and like, you know, the brand itself. And we came up with this, uh, everybody's extravagant. And extravagant is a very, very interesting word. It's a very, very uh, interesting uh, territory to, to play around. Uh, so we talk about surprisingly extravagant. And then, of course, we were like, okay, we need to signify this. We need to find out what it means in the culture, what it means in this, in this new generation. Because part of the challenge was the taste and the opinion and the haters. But the other part was like we were losing market in, the, in their own region mm -hmm. based on like the brand was exposing the typical consumer as the classic Andalusian, yeah. but the generation was changing and there was like a new kind of generation trying to represent the same tradition, the same Andalusian culture, but in a different way. And that's when we started like digging around, it's like what it means to be, to be surprisingly extravagant in this new generation. Um, and then finally we came up with these two sort of like roads. One was like, we are proudly different and we are also Southern heritage. Mm. Two things that Marta has said, you know, it's like, we are different, uh, and we are from the South. And then finally, I mean, we can go through this as much, like, there's a lot of information, but like, I'm going to try to go very fast. And I think this was, no, I mean, not to downsell our work and the time we take, but this was after one day, I think, wasn't it? After started, like a couple of days. Yeah, 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 just started to really refine yes. what some territories yeah. might be. And also, like, I don't know how many of you have been involved in this kind of process, but this is sometimes is very boring and very, like, you know, uh, tedious, and it's not, e it's not easy to find things. And we were, uh, with the help of Behavior Lab, we were, I mean, we were, like, very, very much into uh, advancing very fast mm -hmm. and also, like, unblocking doors to things Okay. It's all right? Yeah. Are we back? So finally, we end up with these three things, the accent, the taste, and the joy. And finally, we pick up the accent, which is, if you don't know people from South Spain, they have, they have a specific accent. Uh, it's a very, very strong accent, and sometimes they've been bullied by that. So again, we have like two things that are connected perfectly to the product, to the brand. They're from the South, and they've been bullied. And so what we can do with that? Mm. Because we're saying we are probably different. So we're not a lager. And this was like kind of Marta explaining. It's like people were comparing us to simple laggers, but it's a different brew process. It's a different taste. So when you think, when you, you, when you can tell people, hey, I'm not a lager, suddenly your brain starts thinking, oh my God, I've been comparing this beer to other beers based on what I thought mm. versus what I know. Um, so we are an accented beer. So, and okay, so now we have the strategy, we have the platform, we have something to talk about that it make us different. And then that little thing that you have there, um, for most of you that are like English speakers or like other language speakers that don't use this thing, this little thing goes over some characters in Spanish and French and other languages, and it's called accent. So we wanted to find this to signify a little bit the campaign, like having a symbol, something that we can use all over. But also we wanted to go into what the brand was talking about, traditions in a new way of yeah. seeing. So we wanted to respect that, 
but in a new way. We wanted to talk about more like the natural things that happen. We wanted to, we, we, need, we, don't, we didn't need to discover new things. We were like looking around Andalusia, looking for the colors, looking for the textures, and everything was there just to create the, the, the recipe. It was a very easy. And, and even when you talk about changing category, we talk sometimes about you can do that within a literal sense. You can, you can be in a bit different place in the supermarket. Suddenly you're not a soda now, you're an energy drink. But you can do that psychologically as well. You can say when it, the, if, if, you are, if you are judging us by one attribute, we are no longer that attribute. Suddenly it's a different conversation. Absolutely. So, and finally, we were like looking into this process of like typography, the kind of words that we were going to use, like a new generation words and things that people were saying in the street that are no longer passed to the other generations. Um, and so we came up with this whole visual system based of symbols, based of like shapes. They could be containers, they could be like expressive. We can point to different new artists from the new generation. But it was like all full of energy and joy, but like mixing tradition with the new, the new life, the new kind of artists, the new collectives, uh, the new musicians, the new people. I mean, we were like connecting all the dots and it was like, that's why when you have something so fertile, it's so easy to grow up things there, you know? Um, and it was like a very, very f beautiful, but also like, pushing forward because there was a moment that some of part of the team were like, sorry, Marta, they were saying, <laughs> they're not going to buy this. And I was yeah. like pushing them to more, more aggressive, more punk, more street, more like, you know, yeah. hip hop style, more things. And they were like, oh my God, this guy is crazy. <laughs> and then the client was like, I love it. And Marta was, I love it. This is what we need. It's like a reframe of the whole brand, not just the platform, not just the thing. It's also like how you speak. We need it to be an accented brand. And finally, we needed a crazy idea, the cultural phenomenon. Um, and part of what happened is like we, I, I didn't write, but the team wrote a beautiful manifesto, a brand manifesto, but we needed a voice. And the person that we thought would be perfect for this was a transgenerational person, very extravagant very polarized, but loved by all the Spaniards, and she was from the South. The only problem is she was dead. Um, 25 <laughs> years ago. 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, so we thought, like, how we can make her talk. <laughs> and so I'm going to let the campaign speak by itself. Tú. ¿Sabes por qué a mí se me entendió en todo el mundo? Por el acento. Y no solo me refiero a la forma de hablar, que también me refiero a ese pellizco, a esa forma con la que te llenas el pecho de alegría, con la que rebañas un huevo frito, con la que te pintas el rabillo del ojo. Acento es que se te vean las costuras y los dobladillos, que se te escucha hasta el hipo. Da igual si eres de la conchinchina o de la línea de la concepción. Cajero del supermercado, catedrática o ministro. Manosea tus raíces, que de ahí siempre salen cosas buenas. A todo esto lo llaman ahora empowerment, ¿no? Sí, Lola, pero tú siempre lo llamaste poderío. Con mucho acento. El acento es tu tesoro, no lo pierdas nunca. Round of applause. <laughs> I mean, no longer are we laughed at, no longer do we have a bit of taste, we are now accented. I mean, the simple power of a reframe, you don't change the thing, you just change consumers' perception of the thing, which you can do with the stories that you tell. I mean, we're close to time. Marta, I'd just love to understand from a client's perspective, how does behavioral science help selling some of this bold work internally, uh, release it more confidently? Well, I'm not going to lie that it was easy the first <laughs> time. <laughs> well, I have to say that the marketers, the first time that they came with the idea, I could see my team. My team is from the south of Spain. They were crying. And me being from the north, that it was a completely different, I was like, 
I couldn't even breathe. So it was very, very refreshing, and it was surprising. Yeah. And uh, it was not easy to sell it. My boss was French, so it was impossible. Hi, are you telling me that you're bringing a person that was dead 25 years ago to attract the new generations? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think I really believe that uh, um, the power of uh, doing this is enormous. And the power of refrain is, uh, is incredible. Elevates creative output. And it really helps you to solve problems the way it should fall, uh, solve problems. I love what you said this morning about this, about winning an argument. And this is what we tried for two years, winning an argument and trying to say, yes, we are good, until we understood that was not about that. That mm -hmm. was about telling the narrative in a completely different way, in which we were like just taking the hearts of the people and really making them remember what our brand was about. Um, it was one of the best campaigns. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, th I think we're at time, but it'd be great, you're kind of 10 seconds yeah. on, on yeah. impact, Roberta. Let me show you, like, uh, people on TikTok, they were, like, using the, ¿Tú sabes por qué the, se todo? the voice of the accent. They were replicated that. And of course, like, we end up being, again, a tattoo. So, <laughs> so it's funny because I always thought about like something that I'd say to my teams. It's like every time you show me something, think about it because I'm going to tattoo it on you. <laughs> it's a way to say, don't show me things that you don't like. Uh, but I always thought about like, can I do something so meaningful that people will tattoo it? And, and also like the power of like the behavior change. It was so huge that we got messages from Italy, Mexico, UK, uh, from Germany, from South America, from US, people telling us that they were, uh, they were seeing the, the campaign and they thought they were touched by the message because they thought they were like being bullied by the accent and their career was also captured because of that. And suddenly they decided to embrace the accent and not hide it anymore. So for me, that is even bigger than any marketing uh, achievement. Embrace your defaults. Embrace your faults. Uh, the power of a reframe. One we'll drink to that. One thing, because many of you probably, you live in the UK. I think we were so successful that our uh, team from uh, the UK has decided to launch Cruz Campo in the UK. So you probably will find it somewhere. You will see it soon. <laughs> Roberto, Marta, thank you so much. Thank you. Bloody hell, Nudge Stalkers. <laughs> are you inspired to do your very best work of your lives? And are you proud of your accents? I mean, God, there's a lot going on here, isn't there? And there's so much more to come, including talk of voodoo and the very spooky world of oxytocin. And after the break, after the lunch, we also have Paul Zak, who's one of the world's most cited scientists, who's going to be measuring some of your cuddle hormones live in the room. But first, we have lunch. Who's a fan of Dishoom? <laughs> who's a fan of Sticks and Sushi? It needs to be about half and half for this to work. Yeah, 50-50. Um, if you're on the stream, please keep watching. We will see you back at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. 2 p.m. Thank you so much, Nudge Stockers.
you want some high quality behavioral science from me and the team at Nudgestock, then check out 42courses.com. And for this weekend only, if you use the code NUNCHDONK23 at checkout, you'll be in for a fairly pleasant surprise. Aston Martin doesn't run ads anymore. So how is it that people keep referencing an ad from 50 years ago when purchasing a car today? It's because ads work over the long term. Ninety-five percent of category buyers are out market at any given time. Buyers are either in market or out market. Most buyers are future buyers, and future buyers are the source of future cash flows. Shake up your buyer journey, not stirred, and find out what this means for your brand marketing strategy. We now live in a world where the only constant is change. There's always something new that forces us to adjust to a new normal. So we work harder, push ourselves further, and stretch every second of our days to keep up. We've done well, but are we well? In the past few years, we've become more aware about our minds, but we rarely care for it, even when it has a real impact on our lives. For our physical health, we can rely on our insurance to protect us, but for our minds, it's not as easy. Because traditional insurance only covers severe diagnosed mental illness, which stigmatizes people and feels unrelatable. Some insurers have started focusing on prevention tips like exercise, diet, and sleep. But these tips do little to help those already experiencing mild challenges, which is most people today. At FWD, we knew we had to change the status quo when it comes to helping people with their minds. For the first time, we applied behavioral science to develop a groundbreaking proposition. Together with the behavioral science experts at Ogilvy Consulting, we decoded hidden biases surrounding mental health by going beyond a traditional research approach. Our approach revealed most of us deny that we are all vulnerable to anxiety and depression. We then designed propositions using behavioral cues through co-creation workshops with participating markets, which were put to test with advanced intuitive techniques. This resulted in the creation of FWD Mind Strength, a plan that reframes mental health into mind strength, making it a positive opportunity instead of a stigmatized illness. We positioned FWD Mind Strength as a tool to help unlock the secret power of their minds. This concept received a gold star rating in standardized concept testing, indicating high likelihood of success. It also tested very positively in behavioral fast choice testing, which measured intuitive reaction time. FWD Mind Strength clearly stood out for trustworthiness, appeal, and most importantly, relevance. 
This was because we packed the plan with numerous first-in market benefits, which help overcome the different barriers people face when caring for their minds. Like the Mind Strength Assessment Service, created in partnership with COA Health, this tool encourages people who don't know where to start to begin by assessing the strength of their mind privately and instantly. For people with mild symptoms who aren't ready to see a psychiatrist, FWD Mind Strength provides personalized text-based or video counseling that allows people to freely and confidentially express their feelings. And for those who have serious challenges and are hesitant to get help, FWD Mind Strength offers coverage for a wide range of treatments, from psychiatrists to support for overcoming any stigmas holding them back. Beyond all the treatment offered, we believe that education is just as important. So the FWD Mind Strength Plan also includes access to the Mind Masterclass, a collection of content developed in partnership with top experts and influencers that will open people's eyes to their mind. FWD Mind Strength has been created with a behavioral lens to overcome fear or stigma. With our innovative approach and commitment to our purpose and values, we look forward to transforming the way insurance can help people live their best lives. This is a story about using behavioral science to make our value communications more effective. We wanted to shine a new light on our value offers without changing the product or price itself, so we turned to the behavioral sciences to seek some answers. Tested communications across three of our most successful value offers without changing the product or price. To bring to life the work we have done, we're going to focus on the $1 chips offer. Scouring the literature to find the most relevant frames for our $1 chip offer, we shortlisted 18 principles, for example loss aversion, social norming, and reciprocity, divergently ideating to develop a range of different product frames. How many? A whopping 90 ways to say $1 chips. Shortlisting these frames based on the purity to the principle and its ability to shape through the line communications, we selected five frames, our independent variables. Reciprocity. Social norming value payoff, loss aversion, and elevating what was previously buried away in the disclaimer, we highlighted an existing maximum of four per transaction in our final anchoring condition. Our chips for a dollar, maximum of four per peeps. Then armed with the control image and control proposition, we piloted them via paid sponsored posts on Facebook, assessing their potency by measuring unique clicks over reach. Our findings were surprising. When compared to our control condition, our anchoring frame significantly outperformed by 37% with some conditions like social norming performing below the control. Anchoring had changed the conversation from a rational price point to something truly desirable. But this was just the beginning. Holding other communications constant, we developed an anchoring radio script for a test market in South Australia. KFC regular chips, now only $1. But sorry guys, the Colonel says only four per person. But if you buy four and your friend buys four, you'll have eight boxes. That's a chip party waiting to happen. Hurry, ends this Monday at participating stores. Our results? Across our national markets, our test market performed strongest, recording a massive 56% increase in average total $1 chip sales compared to the same campaign period the previous year. And importantly, given our anchoring heuristic, South Australia recorded an 87% increase in transactions that contain four packets of chips compared to 29% in other markets. With the number of transactions including more than one pack of chips in South Australia achieving more than a 70% increase year on year compared to only a 34% increase in all other markets. We have learned that different offers respond to different frames. For example, reciprocity performs strongly for 24 nuggets and cognitive fluency strongest for the $5 box. We are continuing our journey of test and learn. Sorry to keep you waiting. I think we're running late. Right, okay, on our way. I've been 
ranting on for ages about how range anxiety in countries like the UK or the Netherlands is a bit of a red herring. In the, and, and it's a costly red herring because it causes, causes people to have bigger batteries than they need, which makes the cars heavier and more expensive than they need to be, and so on. But the range thing in America, I see why that's an issue, because you've got, well, first of all, you've got 110 volts at home. Yep. You have extremes of cold sometimes. Yep. And um, heat. And, and extremes of heat, which might mess with the range. But all, you have no train alternative for a lot of journeys. You know, so it's quite common for people to live 500 miles from their parents. And vast interstates. And, and yeah. huge interstates where if there's one charger out of out of action, you're stuck in a kind of, you know, truck stop outside Boise, Idaho. <laughs> and, you know, a serial killer's just escaped from the local penitentiary and it's dark. That's slightly different from kind of stopping in Borton on the water, having a pot of tea. <laughs> heard about Google Maps introducing the eco-routing feature. They have it in the US. Um, no. It's coming to the UK this year. By default, it'll give a more ecological and fuel-efficient route. And then you have to pick, no, I want the quicker route. I think it's going to cause a nice conversation or trigger a nice thought about which, well, how much people are willing to add a bit of journey time to save a bit of, save a bit of fuel. Because normally you wouldn't even think about that, would you? You wouldn't think which journey is going to be. I don't think so, do, yeah. You might think about which car should I go in, but you wouldn't think about which route should I take. One of the things that sort of irks me from the behavioural point of view is everybody quotes charge time from naught to 80% or yeah. naught to 100% which in reality is something you'd never do. You have this incredible performance, which I will probably demonstrate at some point, but you drive like a Quaker. <laughs> it's really strange. It's like you're almost sort of spreading peace and love to all the other road users, partly because when you have to slow down or stop, you don't feel you've been robbed of your kinetic energy. Mm. So you don't feel that sense of resentment, which is, God, it took me bloody, you know, it took me two minutes to get up to this speed and I've lost it all. I've currently got this on active mode, so as you see, when I stop here, actually didn't do it there, but it will do, it'll say 100% of energy recovered. So it actually gives you live stats on... On your regenerative On braking. your regenerative braking, yeah. That's to your point about gamification, isn't it? It becomes a little challenge. It does. And you see actually how many additional miles yeah. of EV range you can top up along your journey. Well, I think Rory will talk about this at any level of marketing, that it's where you direct somebody's attention that we're interested in the thing that we're pointed towards. And if you're always pointed towards go faster or mm. shorter journey times, but there's other things you can point people's attention to. That... And, and the emotion of it, I think, the feet, like going back to your point, Rory, about you know driving an EV and and, and having having that feeling like you are doing something good and that you're kind of giving back and you're doing your part as a pride point almost, right? Yes, I mean, I'll be absolutely candid. I don't think I bought the car primarily for environmental reasons, but it's one of those things where actually your attitude follows your behavior. Right. I've become more and more conscious of, I think, I think if you offered me a free Bentley now, I would feel slightly uncomfortable driving mm. around in it. That's uh, you really know, interesting. Which is slightly odd. It would just feel sort of slightly, it wouldn't feel very right. zen. Yeah. Having had this experience of, what, 6,800 miles driving with zero emissions, I'd feel kind of a bit yuck. A bit guilty. Yeah. Maybe. What, but, was, what was your main driver then? Uh, my main, beforehand, uh, I had a 5 litre Jaguar <laughs> a V8. Uh, so I have actually. Oh, so you're just making up for it. I, I'm basically. You're absolutely right. I, I'm still. You're in I'll have to drive about seventy thousand miles before I've undone the you're damage. Paying for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was interesting. You were talking about the quietness of, of the car, and you know when we were in the pandemic and we were all locked down and everything was so peaceful, wasn't it? And you know, you'd, you'd go out, there'd be no cars on the road and I wonder if that's really changed how people feel about the noise of traffic. Definitely yeah. definitely changed it for me. Well I've in the past I've not bought uh, flats and houses because of pollution and noise fears. Mm. Apparently the behavioural science tip is you should never buy a house near a junction. Right. Because although you can your brain can get used to constant traffic, things like, you know, constant braking the occasional accident, cars accelerating and stopping, you you never completely sleep that if you live sense. near a junction. Yeah. But there, there were several places in London I didn't buy because they were too close to the Westway. And it occurred to me that in 20 years' time, nothing to worry about. Well, tell me about this, because this has a, a, what's called sound screen, and the windscreen is apparently noise reducing. 
Yeah, I think we, I mean, uh, I think a lot of manufacturers have a similar technology where we can layer in uh, you know, specific types of glass technology to, to reduce noise. And then you also have the very clever, you know, sort of speaker systems which can emit anti uh, noise, a bit like noise cancelling headphone technology, wow. uh, so that you can. Uh, uh, it sort of drowns out a lot of those those noises that, that are familiar to us on motorway, tyre noise, other other vehicles, etc. I think one thing you will find with electric cars, with given the general fact that tyre noise is the and, and, and suspension noise is the main irritation, you will get more campaigning for better road surfaces. Mm. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, Pete, you'll you'll know this already that the original campaigns for better road surfaces were driven as much by cyclists as by motorists. Well, yeah, it, uh, it was the cyclists that wanted tar to tarmac and asphalt the roads first, which you can imagine this is 100 years ago, and then the motor vehicle came along. And, uh, of course, yeah, another thing to show that the roads have always been shared with, it's not the car that's as dominant, but the bike, the lorry, the courier. That reminds me of the Domino's campaign that was so great a few years ago where they actually they were going around filling potholes with um, with this Domino's truck uh, and leaving the Domino logo on there because they were they were saying that all these mm -hmm. potholes in poor road conditions were leading to pizzas uh, uh, sort of turning upside down upon delivery <laughs> in people's houses. So they took it upon themselves to help repair repair roads. I always have this set on one pedal driving where effectively, if you take your foot off the accelerator, the car brake, it doesn't brake, it regenerates uh, using the motors. Yeah, and that's a, that's a strange thing to get used it's to. Very strange, it? It's very <laughs> strange to get used to. It's like a dodgem, isn't it, yeah. on the road? Yeah. yeah, but actually, having got used to it, I accidentally turned it off a few weeks ago and found it very weird driving in the old way, where you naturally coast when you take your foot off the accelerator. And, that, and I live in Milton Keynes, so we have lots of roundabouts. So oh, first of, of all, when you're getting used to that acceleration and then when you, you take your foot off, it does take a little bit of getting used to. I think we confidence as well, you know, when you're pulling out a roundabout, particularly if it's really busy, but you know that your, your car will just pull off really swiftly. Good time for a bio break and a cup of coffee uh, or any other multitasking you want to do. Well, we have a quick charge. We're running a bit late, as expected. Not to worry, wagons roll. Really interesting thing going on with brands as well with electric vehicles, isn't there? I don't know if you've noticed where the, the brand snobbery has almost disappeared. Yeah. And people are just looking at the cars oh, for right. what they offer, and that you know they, they might look at a Ford, they might look at a Skoda, they might look the at Hyundai, an Audi. The, yeah. You know, and, and, and they're all kind of um, jumbled up. That's consideration right. set, which is really interesting. Well, I suppose I went to about 80% of uh, people at the moment come out of those traditional uh, kind of so-called luxury brands uh, into uh, into our, our So well, this is exactly it, because on the Mackey Forum, um, there's a UK section of the Mackey Forum online, and uh, there's a surprising number of ex-Jag drivers like me. And All it, trying to make up for uh, Exactly, we're years trying to compensate. Abuse. We've definitely seen it in Skoda, people yeah. coming out of all sorts of cars that mm. you wouldn't originally have anticipated to be Skoda mm. drivers. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, but here, it makes, it makes, little, yeah. skewer-morphic, yeah. It makes little skewer-morphic V8 noise, you yeah. see. And you get that same feeling. I can see Rory's grin. Already. Sorry, yeah, exactly. His childish, <laughs> childish, childish grin. One of your vertebrae near your neck. <laughs> That should be what it's about as well, though. It's not just about a practical A to B. It should be fun. Are you sure you knew where we're going? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident. The sat nav seems comfortable. How are we doing for time? Yeah, touch and go. So before you made the decision, Rory, did you think everything through all of the how you're going to charge it? The, uh, answer any range concerns. Well, I, I must admit, I thought that not having a home charger would be more problematic than it's turned out to be. In the event, it's really not been an issue at all. The second thing I think is important is that I was able to try this car for four days while still keeping my existing internal combustion engine car. And I think one of the secrets to selling electric cars is to allow people to try them out uh, while they're still keeping their parallel running, you call it, 19. Mm -hmm. Because I think asking people to sacrifice their conventional car on the same day they take delivery of an electric car 
there's quite a lot of sort of loss aversion and fear going on at that moment. Whereas what I suspect would happen is if people had both alongside each other, they'd feel reassured by the continued presence of their petrol car, experiment enough with the electric car to solve all the problems for themselves, and then they'd pretty quickly find out how they were driving the electric car five times more often than the petrol car. Until there's like a cultural tipping point yeah. where people are just assuming that because there's so many people driving an electric car that actually it's mine and I can trust the rest of society that helped me make that decision. Okay, so it looks like we're here. The world's premier festival of behavioural science. Oh, brilliant. Amazing. Oh, you can't wait. How exciting can this be? That's good job, Wonderful. Rory. Thank there you. We are. Thank you very much. Out we hop. Hello. Welcome to Virtual Nudge Stop. In the Ecuadorian Andes, more than 300,000 children are battling chronic malnutrition. As they live in isolation, it is extremely difficult to establish periodical medical visits, and sometimes there is even a cultural gap and mistrust with modern medicine. Most of these health problems go unnoticed by their parents, leading to incurable diseases or even death. Aquí en vez de haber crecimiento hay decrecimiento. Entonces las mamitas piensan que porque están gorditos los niños están sanos y no es así. The correct way to evaluate a child's physical development is through their height, not their weight. Mother blanket. Inspired by one of the deepest cultural connections these moms have with their babies, the Sikinchi, we turned their iconic blankets into a pediatric evaluation system. Alongside female weavers, we designed different patterns that explain in their native dialect the appropriate size for children during the first two years of development according to the World Health Organization. were distributed to mothers in the community centers where they were trained on how to monitor physical health so they could be able to continuously track their baby's growth no matter how far they are and travel to a medical center if something is out of the safe parameters. Para las Naciones Unidas, luchar contra la malnutrición es una prioridad. Y utilizar una costumbre propia para hacerlo es una gran idea. Today, Andean mothers correctly track their babies growth as natural it has been a centuries-old tradition. No roads. No cell signals. No way to regularly remind Amazonian women about the pap test against cervical cancer in a region that has three times more incidence of the disease. Esse CID 53 é o que ela tem, é um câncer no colo de útero. Quando ela já foi procurar um médico, a doença já estava agravando. Se uma vez ao ano as mulheres realizarem o exame do preventivo, nós podemos reduzir drasticamente as taxas de mortalidade pela doença. We took inspiration from nature to create a solution to remind them every year to take the exam. Hermes Pardini and Pará State Department of Health presents Flower of Life. A flor da vida é um novo híbrido de catreia que criamos aqui e que floresce uma vez ao ano. Toda vez que ela florescer, a mulher vai saber que chegou a hora de fazer um exame ginecológico. Os lotes serão preparados para dar flor em diferentes momentos do ano, para não sobrecarregar os centros de saúde. We started to send the flower of life through social workers, health department agents, and local events to the Amazonian women. Agora com essa flor, né, é melhor de lembrar, é um calendário para falar a verdade para gente, né? 
São 3 mil agentes de saúde distribuindo 5 mil flores, alcançando mais de um milhão de mulheres. Caiu em mais de 20% o número de mulheres que fez o exame preventivo aqui no Pará. Mas uma campanha quer mudar isso. E com a ajuda de uma flor especial, muitas vidas vão ser salvas. Ela foi criada para funcionar como um calendário. Essa campanha é diferente porque ela não vai durar só um mês ou um dia. Ela vai durar uma vida toda. Você cuidando da planta, você cuida de você. A flor da vida é a própria pessoa, né? Que desabrocha para a vida, para para viver com saúde. In the forest that helps the world breathe, a flower that helps women to live. Sweetheart, you all right? For years, women have been made to feel uncomfortable, and violence against women and girls is now an epidemic. A London police officer has been sentenced to life in prison for the kidnap, rape and murder of Sarah Everard. This was a premeditated and predatory attack. The guy just tried to grab me out of nowhere. The guy stalked you out of the train and like, hold on to you. I felt dirty. Sorry. <laughs> oh, God, sorry. Take your longest key, okay? We needed to stop asking women to change their behavior and get men to change theirs. I'm trying to be nice, all right? But behavioral science told us not to talk to the perpetrator. Men don't identify with him. Talk to his friends instead, because the bystander effect was our real enemy. Oi, Jacob, you need to say something. This isn't a joke anymore. We created a powerful call to action that spread far and wide. Sadiq Khan has launched a campaign to challenge sex the campaign attitudes puts the and onus on men. So we've begun a campaign and it's asking men to have a word of themselves, have a word of their mates. I nearly fell off my seat. An actual campaign aimed at challenging men. I to Australian men. I hope the government in the US make men this. Boys to help end violence against women and girls. Khan is launching a new campaign to tackle misogyny. The message came from the mayor of London, but it hit a nerve everywhere. Have a word became a powerful tool to change the social norm. From the minute we viewed the mayor's PSA, we knew we wanted to use it. This isn't a joke anymore. The film has been included in the curriculum of every London school. The United Nations has included it in their university education packs sent to millions of men. International football clubs pledge their support. And the campaign's success has unlocked a further 18 million pounds in funding. Helping generations of women to come by changing the behavior of the men of today. What are you doing? That's enough. Have a word with yourself, then your mates. In Kenya, one in four children suffers from chronic malnutrition. A significant reason being that young mothers living in media dark regions are unaware of the importance of breastfeeding and complementary feeding practices, crucial in the first 24 months of their child's development. To make a difference, we needed to think differently about how we might counter this issue. Introducing Lesso Lessons. These women have a tradition of carrying their babies on their backs in slings made of distinct, vividly patterned cloth wraps known as lessos. We turned these lessos into lessons in postnatal nutritional care. They have created three unique lessos, one for each of the three stages of postnatal care. Designs themselves draw influence from traditional prints and patterns to drive relevance and comprehension. Laces have been distributed amongst thousands of mothers across villages and counties in a nationwide drive, supplemented with a short 20-minute training module where they were instructed on how to follow each leso. Leso Lessons has received widespread support from government bodies, private institutions and the press alike. African cloth that has been used over the years. Bali Nibora Pateli Shibora. Leso Lessons. Leso Lessons. Leso Lessons is data into design. Where pamphlets and handouts fail, the LESO succeed. It really has turned culture into an incentive, serving as a daily reminder for young mothers to raise healthier children. The initiative is now being scaled up to reach and educate mothers in media dark areas across East Africa. LESO Lessons, turning tradition into lessons in motherhood.
IKEA's giant superstores are usually built on the outskirts of cities. As a result, families spend a lot of time driving to the stores. Could IKEA give them a stronger incentive to make the trip? Introducing IKEA's Buy With Your Time, a promotion that was conceived as a way to reward people for traveling to IKEA. Now, they could use the time they spent on the road to shop in our stores. At the moment, I can see that you have two hours, 35 minutes. Everything in the store had a tag that showed the price and money as well as time. Can I pay for these small items with my time? Our cashiers just had to check our customers' trips to the stores on their Google Maps timeline, which geolocates and stores all their journey data. Would you like to pay by cash, card, or by your tag? We determined the monetary value of their time based on the average family income in the country, which then gave us the average income per minute. Very unique, very different. IKEA becomes the first retailer to let customers pay. The idea sparked a worldwide conversation in the retail industry, and among our customers too, which broke all IKEA search records in 2020. Between IKEA and Amazon will be closed because they're going to pay you for the distance and time that you send it. This was the first time, after all, that anyone had changed time literally into money. In fact, IKEA has added time currency prices for every item. Or, for that matter, into a wing chair, a coffee table, or a potted plant. I was involved in an accident because someone didn't see me in the blind spot. This is the result of it. I was flung from a motorbike and I hit the paving across the street. I got the more detail of the actual um, installation started coming to life. So we are driven to helping the people of South Africa regardless of their mode of transport. We don't only want to protect Volkswagen drivers, we want to ensure the safety of all road users in South Africa, making sure that people know what to look for and what to look out for on the roads. When everyone's using the road every single day to commute, we all need to look out for each other. We all know the best way to enjoy a Corona is with lime. But China, the country where we drink the most beer in the world, is also the country that produces the least limes of good quality in the world. At the same time, more than 20% of our farmers live in poverty. So, instead of fixing the supply issue by simply importing limes, we decided to start a new business. Introducing Corona Extra Lime. Three years ago, we partnered with local governments, industry authorities, and lime farmers to provide them with the most advanced knowledge 
to switch to high quality lime farming and expand their yields. After a thousand days in the making, Corona Extra Lime, a completely new lime brand with the highest quality standard in the market, finally hit the shelves all over China, improving the experience of drinking Corona, but also the lives of thousands of farmers since all profits were redirected to them so they could keep growing their farms. Today, our lime serves not only as an unprecedented media, it's a sustainable business that is boosting our beer business even further. This initiative was recognized by the National Council Awards, the National Congress, and throughout the world, making the brand power of Corona thrive like never before. It's the biggest commitment Corona has ever had in a single market. Want a business that bears fruits? Try growing limes. Big brands have big money to hire famous people, but not the small guys. And they are the ones who are still hurting. Presenting Shah Rukh Khan, my ad. Welcome, Shah Rukh Khan. He almost certainly has more devoted fans than any other movie star in the world. Biggest movie star in the world. Forbes have called him one of the biggest movie stars in the world. We helped small businesses by making Shah Rukh Khan, the world's biggest movie star, their brand ambassador. This Diwali, you too, from your past wale fashion of emporium, you can shop with clothes. With Siddhi Vinayak Electronics, you can buy a latest smartphone and post a selfie with a smartphone. What are you doing? We used machine learning to recreate Shah Rukh Khan's face and voice to take the local store names in the ads. आप भी ना अपने पास वाली choice of fashion से ही कपड़ों की shopping करना, royal fashion से ही, M K clothes से ही, पास वाली Lakshmi collection से ही कपड़ों की shopping. Different versions of the same ad with local store names were targeted as per the pin code of the viewer, showing them only the nearby stores. But it is impossible to cover all the stores, so we gave the power to the people to create their own version of Shah Rukh Khan, my ad. Any small business owner could promote their stores through their own social media networks like WhatsApp forwards and other social media pages. It is Shah Rukh Khan selling your store, man. If so, if you're a small-time retailer or a merchant, what an amazing thing to have. Cadbury ad is an ad campaign that has gone viral. A new ad which stars Bollywood superstar Shah Rukh Khan is winning hearts all over social media. And what we are learning is that over one lakh local stores have already created their own ad with Shah Rukh as a brand ambassador. दुकानों के नाम पर इस celebrations के दिवाली ad में शामिल हैं। सपने में भी नहीं सोचा था कि Shah Rukh Khan मेरे दुकान का ad करेगा। Shah Rukh Khan, my ad. While Facebook publicly denies that Instagram is deeply harmful for teens, privately, Facebook and experts have been ringing the alarm for years. If this demented trail of life-sucking content was safe, my daughter Molly would probably still be alive. Diagnosed with depression and anxiety, PTSD, total binge eating disorder, just constant pain, and I would do anything for it to stop. Hey y'all, my name is Mary. I was officially diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, anxiety, and depression at the age of 13. You are so beautiful. 
the clip that we just saw, it follows a young girl named Mary being a fun, jovial, happy-go-lucky child to then being a child concerned about their weight. I can't imagine having a child and thinking they're the most precious thing in the world and having them feel this way about themselves. This video needs to be talked about. I was that girl. something strange happens in the district of Euro in Honduras. It happens during rainy season. And it's happened every year for the past hundred years. Miraculously, fish fall from the sky. Lluvia de peces en Yoro. Y es que estamos en la famosa temporada de la lluvia de peces. Scientists think water spouts formed by funnel clouds suck up the fish and send them off. It's called lluvia de peces. The rain of fish. The humble people of Euro call it something else. They call it a miracle. Parece que los pececitos vienen nadando en el, en el aire. At Regal Springs, we call it heaven fish. Heaven fish is a modern new enterprise based on this natural phenomenon. The hardworking people of Euro make very little money, about a dollar per day in US currency. By partnering with Regal Springs, one of the largest fish wholesalers in Central America, they safely help gather, register, and authenticate the fish that fall from the sky. The fresh fish is immediately processed and shipped all over Honduras. And for the first time ever, more than 90 restaurants bought Heaven Fish, creating unique dishes to put on their menus. More than 80 public markets throughout Honduras now sell heaven fish directly to consumers. Through this new initiative, it's possible for the people of Euro to increase their daily wage by 400%. Heaven Fish is a predictable, sustainable, and profitable business partnership. Regal Springs, bringing fresh fish from heaven to your table. Glotophobia or accent xenophobia is a common form of social discrimination. You've been on this show for 10 years and your accent has gotten worse. How is that possible? A discrimination associated with many prejudices. In Spain, this kind of discrimination usually happens in the South. Con el, el, lo del acento andaluz, ¿qué vas a hacer? ¿Lo vas a suavizar? Something Cruz Campo, the Southern beer, knows all too well. So, Instead of hiding our accent, we decided to celebrate it. Tú... Tú sabes por qué a mí se me entendió en todo el mundo. Por el acento. This señora is Lola Flores, the female pharaoh. Our Edith Piaf, our Aretha Franklin. A female icon who always used her southern accent as a weapon of empowerment. Nobody could have more credibility to talk about accents. But there was just one problem. She died 26 years ago. Aquí la faraona ha revolucionado nuestro país gracias a un anuncio. Nosotros nos hemos preguntado cómo lo han hecho. Lola Flores ha sido reconstruida con más de 5.000 imágenes superpuestas en una modelo. Gracias a la inteligencia artificial y a una tecnología llamada deepfake. But not just a basic deepfake. We wanted to express her accent through her grace. Lola was back two decades later to celebrate and empower a new southern generation. We used a fake to reclaim authenticity. Manosea tus raíces, que de ahí siempre salen cosas buenas. 
In just a few hours, her speech turned into a cultural phenomenon with a huge impact in our country. No lo pierdas nunca. South Africans are starving. About 12.8 million people in South Africa have gone to bed hungry this week alone. Brands that have our scale have an immense responsibility to do work that positively impacts the communities in which we operate. After the process of lautering, we left with all the spent grain. So what we were able to develop is a recipe capturing the spent grain from the brewing process and turning it into a flour. We now know that the ingredients are of such a high quality that they can be repurposed for a food product like bread. Bread of the nation. Bread of the nation. Food has a direct impact on people's productivity. This is why initiatives like this are very important to actually bring more nutritious breads into the communities. By partnering with SA Harvest, we're able to make this a, a truly national initiative. We are working together with breweries to stave off that feeling of hunger. So by leveraging their footprint and their existing feeding schemes, we can reach every corner of the country. In 2022, we delivered just over 20 million meals. I ate it and I was dancing when I was eating it. I said, yo, this bread is so nice. I feel like this conversation is really going to get your attention. Very soon, the bread that you and I eat will be made from the byproducts of the ingredients used to make beer. Castellaga, together with SA Harvest, launched their first of its kind bread of the nation. 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 The answer as to why this type of initiative is important, I think, is fairly obvious. Hace aproximadamente 500 años, los artistas pintaron mujeres con signos gráficos de un probable cáncer de mama. Seguramente ni ellos ni las mujeres lo sabían. Tal vez hoy en día muchas mujeres tampoco noten que tienen cáncer de mama porque no saben reconocer los síntomas. Por eso decidimos hacer una muestra donde no solo vas a poder ver, sino también vas a poder palpar. Fue fuerte, no acostumbro a ir a un museo a, a tocar. Me gusta que está bien hecho como cada cuadro varía también de intensidad, tamaño, grosor. Estamos acostumbrados a no tocar el arte y entonces rompe con todas esas cosas que de alguna manera uno tenía de no tocar las obras y qué sé yo. Cuando lo toqué me pasó que me impresioné. Yo hace 15 años tuve cáncer de mama y sentí una bolita. Y en este caso del cuadro fue tal cual lo que me pasó a mí y me parece que es muy educativo para las mujeres que no lo tuvieron. ir eh, tanteando las mamas, ir descubriendo. ¿Pueden venir y tocar? Me parece fascinante que se nos invite a algo que debería ser normal, que es tocarnos, ¿no?
you want some high quality behavioral science from me and the team at Nudgestock, then check out 42courses.com. And for this weekend only, if you use the code NUNCHDONK23 at checkout, you'll be in for a fairly pleasant surprise. Aston Martin doesn't run ads anymore. So how is it that people keep referencing an ad from 50 years ago when purchasing a car today? It's because ads work over the long term. Ninety-five percent of category buyers are out market at any given time. Buyers are either in market or out market. Most buyers are future buyers, and future buyers are the source of future cash flows. Shake up your buyer journey, not stirred, and find out what this means for your brand marketing strategy. If you want some high quality behavioral science from me and the team at Nudgestock, then check out 42courses.com. And for this weekend only, if you use the code Nunchstock23 at checkout, you'll be in for a fairly pleasant surprise. Aston Martin doesn't run ads anymore. So how is it that people keep referencing an ad from 50 years ago when purchasing a car today? It's because ads work over the long term. 95% of category buyers are out market at any given time. Buyers are either in market or out market. Most buyers are future buyers and future buyers are the source of future cash flows. Shake up your buyer journey, not stirred, and find out what this means for your brand marketing strategy.
If you want some high quality behavioral science from me and the team at Nudgestock, then check out 42courses.com. And for this weekend only, if you use the code NUNSHTONK23 at checkout, you'll be in for a fairly pleasant surprise. Aston Martin doesn't run ads anymore. So how is it that people keep referencing an ad from 50 years ago when purchasing a car today? It's because ads work over the long term. 95% of category buyers are out market at any given time. Buyers are either in market or out market. Most buyers are future buyers and future buyers are the source of future cash flows. Shake up your buyer journey, not stirred, and find out what this means for your brand marketing strategy. Who had an ice cream? Who had an ice cream? Plenty of ice creams. Ooh, a nice cool ice cream. Welcome back to the second half of Nudstock 2023. Please remember to keep your tweets coming in at hashtag Nudstock 2023. There is a special prize at the end, and it isn't a bug. As Tara said, it's an incredibly exciting prize that you'll want to win. It is not a book. But talking of books, if I, oh, we got the agenda. Talking of books, um, it's, we can't help but show off a little bit sometimes. And it is very nice when your totally, utterly brilliant colleagues, in this case, Sam Tatum, who can't be with us here today, when their, your brilliant colleagues get tweeted by brilliant people like Richard Branson about their brilliant books. Um, you will have noticed there is a little bookstall at the back comes very highly recommended. So uh, do feel free to avail yourself of all of those things. And Sam, we miss you very much. Still to come, we're going to explore your messy humanity. We've got Kimberly Wilson, who's going to tell you how to feed your brain. And Guy Leshner is going to tell you how to get that brain to sleep at night. But no sleeping right now, Nudge Stockers. No sleeping at all. Not even after that, uh, that food and, and you've come into the lovely dark womb-like space. No, no sleeping. Uh, what are we going to do, Dan? How are we going to wake them up? We are going to maybe stimulate some of your oxytocin transmitters. I have heard that collective movement can help our bonding pathways. And there's some collective movement that's too hot for us all to do today. But we do have an <laughs> idea from Mexico called the Mexican Wave, which involves the front row. You guys. Been really enthusiastic and starting us off. So and I'll come down with you in a second, norm. and we're going to go backwards, create the social norm. It's going to hit the back. The back row are going to go mental. <laughs> and then we're going to come all the way back to the front, and then we'll introduce the next speaker. Sound good? Sound good. OK. Front okay. row. Ready. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Is he going to come back? Are you guys going to come back? Are you going to ready at the back? Are you organized Woo! up ready? Go! Collective movement. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. The wave, the wave, the wave. Okay, I think we have to do that.
that one more time. We have to do that one more time just to get you organized, get those oxytocin, collective movement all going. And Ready? my side, you kind of let me down a bit. Tara's side, you were good. So yeah. this time, we're going to show them. Ready? OK, front row, three, two, one, go. Woo! And back there. again at the back. Ready? Go. This is purely for our enjoyment, I'm sorry. Uh, um, one more time. <laughs> but with all that swirling oxytocin going on, we have just the man to make the most of it. Professor Paul Zack is Claremont graduate, uh, professor at Claremont Graduate University, and he is ranked in the top 0.3% of all scientists cited globally. Not neuroscientists, all scientists cited globally, 0.3%. We are very, very lucky, lucky to have him in the room. He's also a four-time tech entrepreneur, the author of three books, the latest being Immersion, The Science of the Extraordinary and Source of Happiness. Now, Professor Zach is going to explain today the neural messiness of our biased brains. And he's going to uh, share with us a framework that policymakers and advertisers uh, will be able to use to influence people's behavior. As far as I'm concerned, Cambridge Analytica got nothing on what this man is about to show you. <laughs> um, so I hope you're paying attention. The tech that you are about to see is truly wondrous, possibly terrifying. And Elon, if you're watching, pay attention. It's time to become immersed with Professor Paul Zak. Questions on the Slido. Thank you. Enthusiasm. Well, for good or poor, ill, your brain's a messy place. That's good news because it means that we are constantly being influenced by factors that we don't anticipate. It's bad news because we establish habits, and those habits are hard to break. So when I talk about how we can understand what our brain's doing, how we can change the habits we have and potentially influence other people. This work is from my new book, Immersion, which I saw back on the shelf. So if you uh, have to find out more, that's the place to go. And you can find me online for more questions. We're influenced by other people. You know that. You're aware. But because the brain is such an energy hog, it behaves in a very lazy way. Yes, Chris, I'm talking to you. No. Right. So, we establish these pathways because they're very efficient ways to process information. So if I want to influence Chris or somebody else, then I've got to break through those established pathways. So our brain is really an ex exquisite cost-benefit calculator. I don't want to spend too much energy on this information, this new experience, if I don't think it's going to be sufficiently valuable to me. So. Uh, our job as people who want to influence behavior is to convince the brain, convince the human that this is such a powerful event, this information is so important that I should lean into it. I should actually spend the met metabolic energy to process it, that information, and if I do that, I have a greater chance of being influenced by it. So these default pathways in the brain uh, manifest as habits, right? And some of those are very efficient. If you know what kind of laundry detergent you like, and you go in the store, you don't have to think about it, you just buy it, as long as the price is within some reasonable range, right? No big deal, just buy it. Where this fails is when we get into bias behaviors or maladaptive behaviors, right? I'm doing something that's not effective for me, or people tell me, hey, don't do these things. So um, you probably have all had this experience, if you're my age or a little bit younger, of the yelling boss. It used to be a thing, like in the 80s, your boss would scream at you. I hate the yelling boss. I think it's inappropriate. If you're having an emotional crisis, don't take it out on me, dude. Deal with it yourself. Whenever I worked in those places, I would just wash my watch. Oh, man, it's 5 o'clock. i got to get me another job. I don't like being yelled at. Not appropriate, right? And so that is uh, fear is a good short-term motivator, but a very poor long-term motivator. So we think about those behavioral habits. That's where executive coaching comes in, right? That's a bad behavior, right? It influences other people. Well, oh, that screen's so exciting. <laughs> okay. 
And yet, we will never have perfect predictability of human behavior because of this inherent uh, randomness in the firing of the neurons in the brain. And that firing has to do with housekeeping, kind of keeping pathways open in the brain. And so as you'll see, we're able to predict behavior using neuroscience in the high 90% range consistently, but we'll never get to 100. And that 98, 97% only applies on average, it doesn't apply to you as an individual, right? Those predictions are on average. And yet, we have to think about how we might, as human beings, for the good of other people, influence them. And that's what we do with social creatures. We influence others all the time. Um, we can call it influence, we can call it persuasion. I'm okay with all those words. But as social creatures, we are fascinated by what the other humans are doing. That's why we're here at Nudge Talk. And yet, we're also stuck in our own little route. So how do I get you out of this task and over here? Right, I've got to, again, uh, get you in a point where I can actually have you expend the metabolic energy to process the information that I am sharing with you. And if you are tired or hungry or just had a fight with your partner, all those things take a lot of energy in the, in the uh, prefrontal cortex, this executive area of the brain, and diminish the amount of metabolic energy you can apply to this information, this new situation you're in. So as a result, the brilliant organizers of Nudgestock are going to demonstrate this effect on you right now. You all had lunch. Your, your bellies are full and your brain is spending a bunch of energy processing all information, so you're tired. So the uh, word for that, the technical word is postprandial somnolescence. That means after you eat, you get tired. So you're burning some bandwidth on that. Now, the last session before lunch, people were hungry. He's burning bandwidth. Oh, gosh, my stomach's grumbling. I'm hungry. So we want to get people in a state in which we can influence them effectively. So how do we do that? The first thing is to actually measure and don't ask. Because of uh, the majority of brain activity is, in fact, unconscious, if I ask you why you did something, which we do all the time, people will make something up because we ask them. It's like asking me how much I like, I'm looking for a prop, how much I like this book on one to seven. Compared to what? Compared to my kids? Forget my kids, they talk back to me. Care about my dog? My dog's perfect. My, my dog's a 10. Right? So uh, you know, if I have to give you a number, I will, but it's really those unconscious brain processes that capture with real fidelity the way our brain values a situation or a piece of information that we're in. So, we can now measure brain activity at millisecond frequency scale. The question is, ooh, what should I measure? <laughs> I, should, I should measure something on the screen, but I have no ability to do that. We'll just keep talking, you guys. It's all good. Paul, so, excuse me. Sorry, uh, yeah. we are working behind the scenes to get the screen back on. Uh, further back into the room, we can see your slides on the monitors above, above the roof. Right? Okay, we'll keep going, you guys. So the first thing is we've got to capture your attention. I can do that lots of ways. The yelling boss knew how to do it. I can clap my hands, I can make a loud noise. So I've got to do something that takes you out of idle mode, saving energy, cruising my lazy, lazy brain, and into engagement mode. Right? So this attentional response is associated with the brain's binding of a neurochemical called dopamine to the prefrontal cortex, this area of conscious control. So if you or one of your kids has ADD, those meds for ADD, like Ritalin and Adderall, increase dopamine binding to the prefrontal cortex. That's how it increases attention. Okay, so attention is just the sufficient condition to influence your behavior, right? I need to get your attention, but I've actually got to get something more than that. So I think um, often we pray to the false god of attention. I got clicks. This is awesome. This is working perfectly. But did it influence behavior? That's the question I've been asking for the last 20 years. What are the underlying signals from the brain that capture behavior? So the first thing, I've got to get your attention, that conscious attention. And that attention is very much a kind of a zero-one signal. I can attend at Chris. I can attend at my friend John. Uh, I can't do both, right? So unconscious attention, we're doing all kinds of things. But this is conscious attention. How do I get you to pay attention to this thing? And I love that term in English, pay attention. That's exactly what it is. It's a metabolic cost. The second thing is I have to have you give a shit about what's going on. Right? So how do I do that? Right? So we've heard a little about oxytocin this morning. So another neurochemical made in the brain, only in mammals, that captures the emotional value that we get 
from experiences. So if I get you to attend to something and I can get you to care about it, this interesting dance between dopamine and oxytocin capture the value that my brain's getting from the experience. And when that value is higher, I'm more likely to be influenced by it. So I've called this neurologic state immersion. This is that combination of attention and emotional resonance, dopamine and oxytocin. And we can take signals uh, for immersion and uh, convolve them, combine them in ways to maximize predictive accuracy. So my lab in the last um, 10 years or so, we've taken these signals out of the cranial nerves and then combined them so that we have the best predictor of what humans are doing. So this combined measure immersion uses natural data but it does unnatural things to it. Right? So it turns out that when you combine these signals, because the brain's very nonlinear, you capture not only what individuals are likely to do, but you actually can capture what markets will do. So we can capture what many, many individuals would do because these signals come deep from the brainstem and they're very well conserved across individuals. So I've got 35, 40 people I have this response. I'm likely to get hundreds of thousands or millions to have this similar kind of response. So you think of immersion kind of like tension in a story, right? We, we build stories with a narrative arc with tension. And when we put tension into your brain, we put immersion into your brain, people want to dissipate the tension by doing something. Right? So if I can tell you an immersive tale, and that tale is sufficiently valuable to your brain, and there's a call to action in there, I've captured you. At least for a short period of time, maybe a couple of minutes, I've captured you. So think of this as your uh, wonderful, sweet uh, elderly mother or grandmother with her rolling pin. Now you do this thing. That's what immersion is in your brain, right? It's just nagging you in a very nice way, kind of in a sweet, loving way, but also nagging you. Do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. So now, if you give me a very immersive, let's say, commercial, I see that on TV, and now when I go in the store and I see the same font in an end cap, I see the same uh, picture of the big baby with uh, big eyes uh, for diapers. Right? All that comes back, and I get to relive that immersive experience because my brain said, oh, this is so valuable to you. Right? So that's what we're trying to do is influence people by thinking smartly and or measuring how to create sufficient value in the brain so that we can guide people towards an action that they can take. Can't coerce you, we'll come back to, this is non-coercion. And as social creatures, we're always trying to influence each other. So if we're gonna do that, let's do it effectively. Okay, so I could be wrong. It's possible. I've been wrong once or twice, no, more than that. So when we started doing this commercially, all this works in the lab beautifully, by the way. But then companies started coming with suitcases full of money to my lab and saying, hey, we've heard about you and we'd like to make a better customer experience or better advertising or better training, corporate training. Oh my gosh, you guys have been to these things. They're awful. So we want to do that better. How do we do it? Well, we have these machines, we have 19 PhDs. And I started thinking, ah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just full of crap. Maybe I was lucky. There's a lot of luck in science, like in everything in the world, right? Maybe I was wrong. So I said, hey, it's uh, close to February, the pinnacle of advertising, the Super Bowl. Why don't we measure neurologic immersion for all those 80 Super Bowl commercials and just see if we can predict which ones get the most uh, ratings, the highest ratings. So we did that. USA Today, which is a national US newspaper, for 30 years has ranked Super Bowl commercials. This is from 2018. Oh, you can't see it. Uh, if you could see the slides, or if people in the back who can see them, uh, one of the least liked commercials on that ranking scale uh, was a commercial for Diet Coke Groove. So this was a flavored Diet Coke. Came out early 2018. It was the most immersive commercial, but the least liked. All right, so we have to ask, how do we reconcile those two factors? So I'm going to play that commercial for you, only for the people in the back with immersion data. <laughs> OK, if we could play that for everyone who's not watching. I don't know how to start this. Does it start on that? Twisted mango. Because... Imagine. Oh. That's why. Can't help it. Hey. Still going. Maybe slowing it down. Maybe it's getting sexier. I don't know. Mango does.
So those of you who, th I, that's all I can do, thank you. <laughs> For those of you who saw the commercial, is this weird, giraffey, super tall woman who's dancing in a weird way, and she's got these weird socks on, and she's just odd. Not a likable commercial, but a very immersive commercial neurologically. So what should we believe? The self-report USA Today, thousands of people, or the 60 people I hooked up at a bar in Claremont where I work. And in fact, you look at correlations of the self-report measures or immersion with our measure of buzz, YouTube views, YouTube comments, positive correlation for immersion, and a negative correlation for the liking variable. So whatever we're measuring, somehow is capturing something that at least moves in the right direction. Does that make sense? Oh, we're back. OK, so we're going the right direction, which is great. And again, immersion is a continuous variable coming out of the brain. I can capture it in real time. And the more immersive, the more tension I'm putting into you. And if I ask you to do something with that high tension, you want to get rid of that tension. I want to get back to baseline idle mode in my lazy brain. So how do I use all this information to be the best at influencing other people? These five components, a nice acronym, CERTA, like certain. So the first thing is I got to make space for you. Right? Sometimes we think I want to rush. I want to get to this right away. Hey, we got only got an hour to do this. I got to move really fast. Slow it down. So establish what we call psychological safety. Relax a little bit. Let me get you in that mode so that you can actually take in this information. All right, so think of going to a movie theater. Noise, you're watching your phone, and then the lights come down. Right? What happens? We're preparing you for this amazing experience, right? To watch a movie in a big screen with lots of other people. So first is establish that psychological safety. The second is create an immersive experience. And the most effective way we have found to immerse individuals, full stop, is using a narrative arc. When I have uh, characters at human scale who face a crisis, who have authentic emotions, we all understand that. We learn from that. And if I can uh, depict that to you in a way that's meaningful, then I create an immersive experience. Right? That nice narrative arc, I'm building tension. We're not running out of stories. We're still producing lots of TV and movies and novels because we are fascinated by what the other humans are doing. So use that human scale story. And then use that story, if you're trying to influence behavior, so that the story illustrates the thing you want people to do. Right? This is very much in the behavioral science, people like us kind of account. Oh, here are people. They're having a crisis. They did this thing. Oh, gosh. OK, so that's one way to get out of this potential crisis I might be in, maybe I should do that thing as well. Uh, next, make sure that story has relevance. There's not just one great story. There's not just one uh, behavioral science intervention. There's not one advertising campaign. There are multiple ones. So the term of art in neuroscience for this is top-down control. The top of the brain, the cortex, directs the areas that process emotion to put more energy into processing information if it's relevant to me. So that relevance comes from something I can use now. The brain is very much in the now mode. So you show me a nice commercial for Huggies diapers, babies with big eyes. If I don't have infants at home, it's just amusing. My brain flushes that out pretty quickly. But if I have infants at home and the commercial says, hey, uh, Huggies are 10% off, variable, variable information for me, I'm going to be uh, processing that with higher immersion because it's relevant. And lastly, a lot of campaigns, or second lastly, um, fail to engage super fans, right? There are a lot of campaigns that are just okay, but there's a subset of individuals that we can find neurologically, but you can also find them behaviorally, that love this more than anything. All the major movie studios where I live in LA have fandom departments. They have people that will work for free to help you spread the word. So engage these super fans. Whatever you're asking them to do is a big part of their lives, and they will work on your behalf, so leverage them. And then finally, if you want that call to action to work as effectively as possible, put that call to action at an immersion peak. So oftentimes, we tell a story, here's the arc, and at the very end, I say, now do my thing, buy my stuff. But if you look at movie trailers, and you can do that tonight, later, those movie trailers have half of a narrative arc. They tell a story, crisis, real emotions, and then buy a ticket to find out what happens next. So from an uh, influencing behavior perspective, how that call to action wherever that immersion peak occurs could occur at the end, that's fine, but nice, nice, nice story, 
now do my thing when I've reduced the tension in that person's brain is going to be less effective than having that call to action when that immersion peak occurs. Okay, quick example. Music, uh, was published two weeks ago from my group. Uh, new music people haven't heard before. We had people listen to it. Do you like it? Would you share it with other people? People self-reported. Uh, ability to predict hits, 0%. When we uh, calculate immersion, grab immersion for these individuals, put them in a linear model, 76% accuracy predicting hits. When we apply machine learning to this model, we heard about AI earlier, we can get up to 97%. Because the machine learning picks up these nonlinearities that the brain engages in all the time. So this, all this is working in the background. We're not aware of it, but our brains know what we value, even if we don't, consciously. And lastly, there's no uh, brainwashing, right? Everyone has choice. This shouldn't be used for people who are too young, who are too old, who are cognitively impaired. Um, if we're going to seek to influence people, which we always do as, as social creatures, then we should do it in a way that's ethical so that people have choice and they're not being coerced to do anything they don't want to do. So that is my time. Thank you so much for listening, for being awake after lunch. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, we've got a, just a few minutes for yes, some Q&A. Um, and first of all, I, I, just, I just want you to share with the audience a little bit on how you're doing this measuring, because I'm hoping we're going to return to this at the end of the show. Can you explain a little bit about the, the technology that you're using? Right, so uh, the U.S. taxpayers funded my lab to the tune of about $5 million with big machines and lots of PhDs, about 10,000 blood draws to measure neurochemicals in the last 20 years. And now, because we found this neurologic state immersion, we can pull these data from a wearable, like a fitness sensor that I and some other people in the audience are wearing by taking these data and shooting up to the cloud and using algorithms to measure this in real time. So it's really now a platform that anybody can use to figure out what the brain loves in real time. Which is why I'm slightly terrified about when Google and Meta and maybe some of the people in this audience have access to all of that data coming through your smartwatch about where and when in the world you are most immersed and which presentation of the day you were most immersed in. Um, we're hopefully going to return to some of that because some of you are wearing this tech at the end of the, at the, end of the day. But we've got some questions here. So um, can you answer how does oxytocin work for people's different interests and passions. How do people care more about particular subjects? Is it just more, re like higher release of oxytocin? Yeah, greater release of oxytocin that we're picking up downstream. So this is kind of pulsatile release. So um, you're lovely and we, we, we're friendly. But when my little children come and hug me, more oxytocin, right? So it's indexing the degree to which I'm emotionally um, uh, experiencing this event. And is that, is that genetically predestined, or is it, is it something we can nurture into our children? Oh, great question. Or into ourselves. So the brain is very plastic. It's evolving all the time. So emerging work from my lab and others shows that the more we connect to others, the more oxytocin release, we get to be better humans. By the way, this works because oxytocin increases empathy. So we heard about empathy this morning. So it's really connecting us to other people and to ideas. And people talk about it as the cuddle hormone, but my understanding is it also is the thing that will help you fight the enemy as well. Is that right? The more oxytocin, it the bonds more people together. Yeah, bonds exactly. people together, but it also means that you're, if you're the out group, I'm more likely to fight you if I've got a lot of oxytocin over here. Yes and no. So we published research a couple years ago showing that if I release oxytocin talking to you, and then I have some other people who are not super aggressive, they're just different than us, mm. say different color skin, different uh, gender. We talked about women's issues earlier. Um, once I release oxytocin, I've got about a 20-minute window where I just treat everybody really nicely. Okay. So I think it's really going to be connecting. Yeah. It is going to really help the world get to be a better place. Is there anything that makes everyone release oxytocin? Images of babies, that kind of... Are there, uh, any, touch, are there anything that's touch? Touch, hug, sex, those are the best. Okay. Um, uh, and static images, we talked about uh, video, um, but does this, is this predictive for static imagery, how effective it might be in the marketplace? Great question. It is, and yet for video or audio, uh, like uh, uh, Stephen Tom's uh, description of uh, sonic branding, we have more bandwidth hitting the brain, so it's a little more effective. Positive and negative. Is all immersion good? Can you distinguish between positive and negative immer immersion? 
More immersion means more uh, likely that you're going to take an effect. If you are paying attention, but your oxytocin is low, I call that state frustration. So I'm here, I just don't dig what's going on. I'm frustrated, I'm not going to do anything. And if you, could you give someone oxytocin? Can you sort of dose them with oxytocin in some way as a way of doing that that could elicit this immersive effect? That if I spread it out in the room in some way? Right, so uh, hugs, not drugs. So we have, uh, in experimental studies and in some clinical trials, infused synthetic oxytocin into the brain via the nose. But again, we don't want to be drugging people. That would be coercive. Puppies, if I just put a load of puppies Oh, a ton. In. We've done a ton okay. of work with dogs. Dogs are the most immersive thing you can do besides babies. So yeah, dogs to work, definitely. You heard it here first, guys. Puppies in your meeting with your FD. I think that's probably all we've got time for, but we could talk all day. Thank we you can. so much Thank for you, Professor guys. Paul Zach. Music. One of the foundational principles of behavioral science is construal theory, this idea of psychological distance. Most of us prefer 50 pounds today than 50 pounds next week. Our next speakers are going to explore that in much more detail. The psychology of sustainability is a key piece. And with Anogavi Consulting, we have a sustainability practice, and we've carried out some proprietary research that has never been seen before. My, it's my pleasure to introduce the head of the practice, Clara Kozlov, the director of the practice, Jamie Hamill, and by video link, fingers crossed, Ellen from Unilever. Thank you. Sustainability obviously has a bit of a chilled vibe going with the music, which is great. Um, so delighted to be here today um, to share our new research, which basically shows that people and their selfish needs need to be put at the heart of brands, communication and action on sustainability. Ultimately, this research aims to show that brands, that brands can need to go beyond themselves on this important issue. And we'll be joined by Ellen Moore. Norbash, the Global Master Brand Director of Hellman's, who will be sharing how they have addressed this important issue with the power of behavioral science. And finally, this talk wouldn't have been possible without the proprietary um, research from PSB Insights, so a sincere thanks to them. Now, the urgency of this topic does not need an introduction, but the role that each one of us will play in it does. As the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recognizes, a 40 to 70% reduction in, in emissions will come from the changes in our habits and our behaviors. That means from eating less meat to taking fewer flights. This is the biggest behavior change brief on the planet. And as an industry, we have an important role to play in answering this important question. But convincing people to buy sustainably is challenging. We're all aware, of the, all aware of the say, do gap, or the intention, action gap. Studies show that sustainable products are perceived to be, have inherent trade-offs that aren't worth making, from price, to taste, to quality, to efficacy. And brands sometimes reinforce these trade-offs by misdirecting their sustainability communications. We believe there is a psychological solve to this problem. Brand sustainability communications must appeal to consumers' self-interest to help them overcome these trade-offs and win them over. For we know that brands can change the perceptions of what people want, because research studies show us that, that value is a psychological construct. What is perceived as valuable is subjective and can be changed. Often judgments are highly influenced by the context in which we operate in and the information that surrounds us. And on that thought, I'd like to hand over to Jamie to take us through the research to show us how we can redefine the value of sustainability and tap into people's self-interest. Yeah, thank you, Clara. Uh, I'm going to be doing the stats bit, so I hope the screen stays on, otherwise <laughs> you're going to see me doing some wild improvisation up front here. But as Clara said, we had a hypothesis, but we needed to see if it was true, and that meant testing it. 
So we worked with PSB Insights, which are on the two studies you see on screen here. First of all, we spoke to 1,500 people across the USA, UK, and India to get a broad assessment of attitudes towards climate change and the actions being taken by governments, businesses, and, and people themselves. And then secondly, we ran a conjoint analysis where we had three theoretical brands, and we asked people to choose between different initiatives so we could assess what drives the demand of sustainably produced products. Now, as what will come as no surprise, given how swelteringly hot it is today, and actually we had the world's hottest day ever recorded earlier this week, we find that climate change is universally felt, and it's universally acknowledged as human-caused. What we think is a real concern for brands is that people are highly skeptical about the ability of businesses to address this impact. Now, most respondents we spoke to in countries believe businesses put profits before sustainability. And actually, here in the UK, that number was shockingly high, of 77% of respondents. What's exciting for us, though, is that instead, the majority of people we spoke to see themselves as the agents of change when it comes to sustainability. They claim to value the environment, they understand that changing their behaviors has a significant impact, and they want to take action by buying more sustainable products. However, these same people don't feel capable of delivering that change. Only 12% of the people we spoke to claim they find it easy to live a sustainable life. Now, Clara mentioned it earlier. You might recognize the difference on screen here between the left knowledge and the right action as what's been referred to as the intention-action gap. That's the difference between what people say they want and what they do in reality. Now, our research found this gap exists for two main reasons. The first, on the left, is that people say they struggle to work out which brands and products are truly sustainable. And that's despite 77% of our respondents claiming they search for information to understand the real details behind a sustainability claim. Now, secondly, on the right, people feel like they, don't, uh, they can't afford these products. Price was the biggest barrier we saw reported uh, to, to purchasing something. Now, during a cost of living crunch with price paramount, we see sustainable products having a real fight under their hands to prove their value. There was one other observation, though, that we found in our data that challenges those two points. A significant proportion of people indicate that they're willing to pay a small to medium amount more for products which are sustainable. And we see that hold true across categories, from toiletries, groceries, travel, to electricity. So it wouldn't be nudge stock without things being a little bit, uh, a little bit messy. And what we see here is some really obvious tensions. People understand that they can have an impact, but they claim they don't know what to do. Price is a barrier, but people claim that they're willing to pay more. What we suspect is that people are not seeing brands reflecting what they're looking for, and this is what's stopping them from really turning that intention into action. So to summarize that first part of the research, people see themselves as the agents of change when it comes to sustainability. They know that their values, behaviors, and actions will have a really tangible impact on the world. Now, they say it's hard to live a sustainable life. They claim a lack of information and price barriers. But the rest of our research suggests that this real issue goes deeper, that it's the perceived trade-offs for sustainability products that are not being framed in ways that appeal to people's really selfish needs that's what really stopping them from taking action. Now, if that's the case, what can brands do about it? We believe they need to make sustainability seem easy and attractive, and those trade-offs Clara mentioned earlier, worthwhile. And that's really important, because the other part of our research suggests that simply having a reputation for being sustainable is not enough. As 74% of people claimed, a brand's reputation doesn't help it overcome all those other reasons why you might buy into their products in the first place. So, if brands need to make sustainability seem easy and attractive, how do they do it? That takes us to the second bit of our research, and my favorite bit in particular, where we look to assess how different features and initiatives might drive demand <coughs> of products. So to do this, we ran an analysis with three hypothetical brands and their products, sliced bread, washing up liquid, and delivery services. Our survey respondents were asked to choose between three possible initiatives or features for each brand. And each of those features were then tested against each other with price and quality offset to see where people might be willing to compromise. 
To make the test as fair as possible, we made sure that all of these initiatives were things that the, the ordinary person might understand, and we made it really clear that they'd each have a similar environmental impact. The big difference, and the thing you can see here on screen, is whether or not people would feel like these initiatives would have a selfish benefit to them. So we're looking to assess an initiative that feels near to me versus one that might feel far. That's a bit theoretical, we acknowledge, so we thought we'd share one of the examples that we tested, and this is from our dishwashing brand. So you can see on the left here, we had an initiative that feels like it has a clear personal benefit alongside a planetary one. We're going to replace the toxic chemicals within that product with plant-based ones, so we're reducing the impact on the planet, but also any associated or implied health benefits that might come from something that's plant-based. We then compare that to our far benefit, where we're changing the packaging from single-use to recyclable. Now again, potentially of similar environmental impact, but that personal benefit really isn't that clear. So I'll hand you back to Clara to tell you what you found. Thanks, Jamie. So what did we find? Products that have selfish sustainability initiative or features were significantly more effective in driving demand. They were overwhelmingly preferred, and that was consistent across price point. And if we dive into this in a bit more detail, what we see is that people are willing to pay more for products with sustainability features and initiatives that benefit them in the near term, while cheaper products with only long-term sustainability benefits are far less attractive. So, in conclusion, people want to be agents of change, and they want to make the world more sustainable and live more sustainable lives. But they face perceived barriers. Brands have a clear role in helping consumers overcome those barriers. And they can start by designing and communicating sustainability initiatives and features which meet both the immediate psychological need of the consumer as well as benefiting the planet. For in the eyes of people, not all sustainability initiatives are created equal. Those who have felt to have the nearest benefit are more appealing to people. And this gives scope to increase price in, in relation to the green premium or the sustainability investment that needs to be made. So we have to remember two essential human truths when we're communicating around sustainability. Value is subjective and it can be shaped. And that sustainability features and initiatives must benefit the selfish self i.e. they must ensure that they meet the immediate psychological needs of the consumer who, who is buying the product. Now, I'd like to take you over to Elham in the Netherlands. Elham is going to give us a unique insight into the behavioral science journey that Helmans has undertaken. Hi, Elham. Hi. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a mayonnaise brand on a mission. Now, let me start by telling you a little bit about the brand. Next slide, please. Helmans is the world's number one mayonnaise brand, sold more than one and a half million times every day in more than 65 countries. Since 1913, Helmans is known for its unmistakable taste and creaminess that only the world's number one mayonnaise could offer. It literally makes any food taste delicious, even the simplest ingredients like leftovers. So let's quickly switch gears and talk about purpose, starting with the why. While taste and quality are still the primary reasons why people buy a mayonnaise brand like Hellman's, it is no longer enough to sufficiently differentiate the brand. And today, a large majority of consumers anyway have become belief-driven buyers. They don't only want to buy a quality product, but they want to buy into a brand. And this is exactly where purpose comes in as a differentiator, because you're taking on issues people truly care about. Next slide, please. This brings me to our purpose. Headlines exist to help people enjoy great tasting food with a simple pleasure it is without worry and waste. This purpose is at the intersection of the role our brand plays in consumers' life and the societal issue of food waste. And this very sweet speech has made Hellman's purpose a powerful growth strategy for the brand while doing the right thing for the world. Now, what is tackling food waste? Such a great purpose for Hellman. To start, food waste is a big issue. One third of all food produced globally is lost or wasted. 
third biggest emitter of greenhouse gas after US and China. While 800 million people suffer from hunger every day globally. Now, second, food waste is something our consumers deeply care about and are motivated to tackle. And lastly, there is a genuine, authentic, and credible role for Hellman's to play in this space. But what is that link exactly? 60% of all food waste happens in consumers' homes, with the fridge being the epicenter. And this is where Hellman's lives. In fact, in one out of two fridges globally, Hellman's makes any food taste delicious, even the simplest ingredients like leftovers. And in fact, the, some of the most iconic Hellman's recipes are made with leftovers, like the Boxing Day turkey sandwich or Thanksgiving leftover casserole. Our purpose journey started out with leftovers back in 2018 and grew into the ambition of tackling food waste since 2019. Now, let's dig a little deeper. Nobody ever sets out to throw good food in the bin, would you? So food waste is often an unintended outcome of modern life. And mostly people aren't even aware of the role they play in the problem, leave alone solving it. So we at Hellman's have spent nearly two years researching the issue of food waste by unfolding consumers' relationship with food. And we found some fundamental behavioral insights that helped close the gap between our intention of reducing food waste and desired action of inspiring and enabling consumers to tackle this issue and become agents of change. The key insights we found, starting with the human truth, this is the moment you open your fridge and think, I've got nothing to eat. While there are all those ingredients in there, you simply don't see them. Why? Because you lack energy, you lack time, you lack inspiration or simply the skill to turn those ingredients into tasty meals. And we call this universal truth, rich blindness. Then comes the neuroscience around food and food waste, which have been critical for us to understand how as a food brand that stands for taste, we could tackle and stand against food waste. We learned this really helped us and informed our creative and executional choices. Then lastly, the power of taste. We know that when food tastes great, less of it gets wasted. So tackling food waste is actually the outcome of adding and ensuring that food tastes great. And this is exactly where Hellman's products come in. So while the societal issue we want to tackle is food waste, the thing we need to double down on is taste. And bringing all these key insights together, we created our creative platform called Make Taste Not Waste, which turned out to be the best core campaign ever, successfully rolled out across 13 markets and still counting. Let's watch the app. Uh, Clara, click on I've got nothing to eat. Nothing. 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 <sighs> Hold on, I can do something. Turning nothing into something. Turning nothing into something. I turn nothing into something. It's amazing what you can do with nothing and a little helmets. Make taste, not waste. Next slide, please. Yet, still we wanted to do more than awareness creation and inspiration through our advertising. We wanted to have a deeper and lasting impact on consumers' behavior, educate and enable them to become more resourceful with their food, waste less, and ultimately act as agents of change. And this is where we turn to behavior science. Across 2019 and 2020, we worked with leading a 
academics and experts in food waste and behavioral economics. And we performed the longest and largest quantitative intervention study ever conducted in the field of food waste, working with more than 2,000 families. We developed a behavior change program that is scientifically proven to help families reduce their food waste by 33%. While doing that, we identified three key ingredients for behavior change. Starting with the behavioral ask to consumers to grab and use up the food that's already in their fridges. During one use up day per week, with the help of Hellman's flexible recipes. And in order to make our behavior change program easy, enjoyable, and sticky, we added the magic of creativity and marketing. Our program is called Fridge Night, so far made available to everyone in the US, Canada, and the UK for free in the form of an app or an e-booklet. And now I let Andy Hayes, a Canadian master chef who we partner with, explain how Fridge Night works. Play the video, please. What's up, folks? I'm Andy, and welcome to Fridge Night, one night a week for five weeks where I help you get extra from your fridge. The fun starts with planning a fridge night and choosing a day that works best for you. Then we'll make delicious extra meals with food that you already have. We'll learn a whole new way of cooking, AKA Flexipies, using the unique three plus one approach. I will be with you every step of the journey, serving up new weekly challenges to add even more fun from your fridge. very delighted to say that our Make Taste Not Waste is a real success story. And not only a story, as Hellman's purpose has become an accelerant of brand's performance as well as driving brand power. Hellman's grew 10% in 2020, 11% in 2021, 21% in 2022, which makes Hellman's Unilever's fastest growing big brand. And that's not all. Yes, we have been able to drive impact scale reaching more than 200 billion people year on year since 2021 to make taste not waste. Wrap up, I'd like to leave you with three key takeouts. Next slide, please. When you engage with purpose and sustainability, people need to believe it. And this has to do with ensuring that there is an authentic and credible link between the brand and the cause. Second, people need to relate to it. You need to go under the surface, under the skin, dig deep and deep to unlock that real turning consumer behavioral insights. And lastly, people need to act upon it. So make sure your communication creatively engages and is effective. And with that, I would like to thank you and hand over, hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Elham. And if anyone would like to get in contact around the research, please feel free to reach out myself or to Michael Hodgkinson. Thank you. You know what, it is, you know, Unilever, Hellman's, one of the world's biggest businesses, brands, actually trying to change people's behavior around one of the world's biggest challenges of food waste. So, can we just give it up for actually Unilever giving a shit about food waste and do doing something? Thank you very much. More of that, please. Big, big, big problems. And everyone here, no matter where you are, policy, also the private sector, has potentially a role to play in that. Right, everybody. So um, Chris mentioned earlier Myers-Briggs. No shame here. Remember the oath. Who in this room, show of hands, has done a Myers-Briggs test at some point? Oh, that's a lot of you. OK, add in anyone who's done a something where you've been ye yellow, red, blue, green, some kind of personality profile. Like, OK, so you're all on board. So here's what I want you to do. Take out a piece of paper if you've got one. You guys at the front all have a piece of paper piece of paper, and what I want you to do is write down what you know about yourself. 
Give me, write down your personality profile, however you want to do that. Maybe you haven't been tested, maybe you have been told by someone that you are a rational person or emotional person or a left brain person or a right brain person or you really, really consider yourself to be very, very Virgo. Whatever it is, <laughs> write it down for me, okay? Scribble it down quickly. Yeah, all doing that, good. Little moment to reflect on your personality. And now what I want you to do is I want you to take that piece of paper and I want you to screw it up into a little ball, as tight as you can, right? <laughs> Shit, this is the one that I'm meant to read. <laughs> um, but I want, you to, I want you to screw it up and then I want you to throw it at Dan Bennett. I'm Enjoy coming. Enjoy this. Throw, 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 <laughs> throw, throw. <laughs> throw the paper, throw the paper. Um, why is this? Because you might think that you understand your personality profile. And you might also think that vaccine hesitancy is not relevant for you, okay? It's not got anything to do with your job and your audience. But at Nudge Doc, we like to confound your expectations and we like you to leave your uh, preconceptions at the door or at least junk them for a little while. So we want to abandon the junk and some of the pop science and we want to embrace the mess and indeed the heterogeneity of our species. And to do that, we're going to introduce back to the stage our esteemed colleague over from Washington live here, Chris Graves, with his work, some of the work that has, has fed into the Harvard Business Review. Um, Chris is going to unearth how we can understand and how we can use legitimate cognitive profiling of our audiences, in this case, to overcome vaccine hesitancy and increase uptake. But I want you to think about what it means for your own understanding of yourself and indeed all of your audiences. Over to Chris. Okay, welcome back from your postprandial somnambulance that Paul Zach told you about. Time to wake up just a little bit. I'm gonna ask you a quick question about you. First of all, which of these two things sounds more like you? I'm gonna give you two options, and option one will be you'll, hand, you'll move your hands this direction, and option two will be this direction. So first question. I think it's more important to take my time, all the time that's needed, to get my decision exactly right. Or, I like to make big, bold, quick decisions, even if they're wrong, even if I fail. Are you more like one or more like two? Now look around the room at a little bit of heterogeneity. Now imagine you're all on the same team and you can't figure out why this person is not aligned with you. Second question, I think that a lot of what our outcomes are are dependent on luck, fate, it's written, it was meant to be, zodiac signs possibly, or maybe even God versus None of that matters. It's only what I do that totally determines the outcomes in my life. Number one, that way. Number two, that way. Look again at the heterogeneity. Now, you have just undergone the most simplistic bastardization of two tremendous tests, and I apologize for that. But I'm going to show you the real power of the hidden who. And here's what we mean by this. First of all, a huge thank you to the funders, the patient supporters for this, which were MSD and Merck. This was the largest behavioral science study of vaccine hesitancy, and they were the most tremendous supporters with a particular thank you to Jasmine Correa and Amy Bauman. I know you're watching back in America. Thank you, a big hug to you. So, yes, please, thank you, clients. This, by the way, is not vaporware. Together with my research partner at Kantar Profiles, John Poulston, I know you're watching, John, this has been seven years in the making, and it's been tested by the research community who could have called bullshit on it at any time. And instead, 
we've gotten now seven global awards for this. The only reason that's important is know that what I'm going to show you, I'm more frightened than you are about vaporware, so I want to make sure whatever I show you is real. Everything that I'm going to show you originally came from long, peer-reviewed, scientific, reproduced studies that we improved in terms of methodology. So these were the tests that we gave 3,000 parents in the United States, and we're about to embark with my colleague, Paolo Mercado, who is head of behavioral science for Ogilvy in Asia Pacific, and a larger study in Asia of some 12,000. So looking at this, this is a lot of tests. And for somebody to go through these tests, it takes 45 minutes, to which you're going to reply, oh my god, nobody does that. I'm sure they all cheated. Well, we built in little algorithms to pop out people who are not reading. We measure dwell time. We can tell if they get liquor laziness, you know, one to seven, four, 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 gone. So this is very clean data throwing out people who are not really reading very closely. And a 95% favorability and 98% completion rate. So don't let people tell you that your research has to be really short in a TikTok world. People actually are very engaged if, if the research is engaging and if you give them self-agency. What do I mean by that? In our 45 minutes, about every two to three minutes, you get a little nugget back. Here's what we think of you. Are we right or wrong? Gives you a sense of agency. That way you don't feel you've just been data raped. So it's a really, really important thing. But if you look at these, what we were trying to find out over the last seven years is, are they all separate and discrete, or do they overlap? Do they reconfirm each other in interesting ways? And when you put them all together, here's what it creates. It's pretty stunning. You all know what a genome is, of course. This is a sense-making genome. You are born about 50% hardwired for the rest of your life about all your preferences, choices, decisions, and behaviors. The other 50% comes, of course, through nurture, not nature. But 50% is a lot when you get popped out to be half-baked. And so knowing this and knowing that how you are wired on the inside means everything, everything about how you are different from the person sitting next to you. When traditional marketing research told you nothing about any of these. So are you ready to see what comes out of this? Ah, forget it. Here we go. So first of all, we tested for 25 separate forms of vaccine concerns. It's really way too blunt to just say, vaccine hesitant. What the hell does that mean? It can mean anything from conspiracy theory to somebody who's super highly educated who works in healthcare and says, hang on, in the past, it used to take 11 years to make a vaccine. How did it only take 11 months this time? Feels like they really may have cut corners. Now, that's not true, but it's perfectly logical sounding. And just because something makes sense to you doesn't mean it's true. So 17 tests on cognitive and affective behavioral science tests, and then the ultimate. 16 narratives tested alongside to find out ultimately what works best for you as an individual. Now, the, traditionally, you might do, well, get in a room, brainstorm, come up with five great messages, wordsmith it, brainstorm, test them, come out with three winners out of five, recommend them to the client. The client chooses one and you spend a kajillion dollars in media and outdoor with one. This, in an age of addressable and digital, is really addressed to you. It's not the least common denominator. So when you look at this, this is what it begins to look like. Now, by no means am I going to ask you to read what's on here, but look at the patterns. On the left, these are all the self-expressed reasons why somebody might be hesitant about getting a vaccine. Now, keep in mind for this test, this was not, even though it was done during the period of COVID, this was for parents 
for routine vaccinations, measles, you know, MMR, things like this, not COVID vaccines. And explicitly, we clarified this along the way to find out if there was an impact during this pandemic on normal childhood, routine childhood vaccinations. And so if you look on the left, these are all the many ways people would be hesitant or concerned about things. And across the top are many of those behavioral science tests. So the first instance was, because of how you're wired, does that correlate with your concerns? And yet, indeed, we found certain correlations here. So those two tests I gave you at the beginning, the first one, you know, I'd rather take my time and get it right versus very quick, bold decisions, even if I fail, that's called regulatory focus. Whether you're more promotion or prevention, and it even is seen in things like toothpaste. Did you know that if you're more promotion, you know, make big, bold decisions, go fast, goes more with optic white type tooth whitening toothpaste. But prevention focused people prefer cavity prevention, healthy gums. It may be basically the same ingredients, but how you're wired means everything in the choice. Not just vaccines, not just consumer products, but even how you react to climate change communications regarding risk. So this has really an impact on everything and wicked problems to small problems. So this is the first sort of canvas. And where you see the arrows, you begin to see very strong correlations with all kinds of hesitancy with a few of these. Now, let me give you a couple of them. Now, high self-reported religiosity. We gave them about a half a dozen ways to tell us whether they believed they were religious or not. And those who expressed and, and said, I am highly religious, we're also very highly hesitant on vaccines. Now you look over here, this is called ocean agreeableness. Now you heard earlier, Keith Deere, you know, former uh, defense, um, now AI, was talking about Hexaco and Big Five. Well, this is one of the Big Five, and agreeableness is uh, if you're very sort of skeptical and, and kind of irascible and people think you might be a little grumpy, this is low on agreeableness. If you're the kind of person like, say, Tara Austin, and you meet her and it's like, God, I gotta have a drink with her tonight. I mean, she's just so warm. That's very high on agreeableness. But low on agreeableness people were very much more correlated with hesitancy, as were the promotion focused. Remember those of you who said, yeah, I like to move fast and make big, bold decisions? Yeah, well, strangely, that correlated with more hesitancy. And you might have guessed that prevention would have correlated more with hesitancy because you're worried about ingredients and things like that, but it did not. So it's important to test. So if you look at this again, all the tests we've given, and again, more and more correlations, you begin to see it, but we're not done. So if you look at the next level here, were the things that were surfaced. Some may surprise you, some not at all surprising. I told you about high religiosity, low on openness, but also low on conscientiousness. What's low on conscientiousness? Think Homer Simpson versus Lisa Simpson. Homer, low on conscientiousness, Lisa, very high. Homers out there were very much tied to hesitancy. Then you look over here, and a very strong one with something called need for affect, the avoidance part of need for affect. We test whether you have a strong or low need for affect about approaching emotions or avoiding emotions, and also a strong or low need for cognition. Do you want more information, more data, more research, or that doesn't work for you, you'd rather have a story? And by the way, there's no value judgment or intelligence associated with those. And then time perspective. We test for, do you make decisions because you're pre-wired to be nostalgic and kind of live in the past and make current decisions based on your past? Or very much in the present or very future-minded. And it turned out here, those who were wired for the present were more correlated with hesitancy. And finally, one you would guess, low vaccine knowledge correlated with more hesitancy. This is a key, because how many of you believe with a 75% confidence level, strong, that you know how vaccines work? Raise your hand. 
this is wonderful because this is the first honest, not over-optimistic, overconfident group I've ever asked that question. We asked our respondents and they said, oh, I know, it boils your blood and that's why I'm not going to take it. Or I know it gives you the disease and if you live, you have immunity, but good luck on living. People don't really know how vaccines work and that's not their fault. To use great metaphors and analogies about how vaccines work can possibly get you there. And there comes the creative side of behavioral science, the storytelling side of behavioral science that often public health and pharma doesn't embrace to the same degree you may. That's not their specialty. So let's continue. And those narratives I told you about, well, they weren't just some narratives. It wasn't like we got a bunch of copywriters together and go, hey, what would be a good message? We made little Trojan horses. We made packages. And each message, each narrative, was a Trojan horse for behavioral science principles. For example, social proof might be one. Another one might be whether you're highly individualistic versus communitarian. And so we figured out 16 of these narratives because we had to limit it somewhere and did such a profoundly robust test. Every respondent scored each narrative individually. And as we said earlier, Paul Zach said, yeah, but against what? Oh, the second round, you took four of your winners against each other competitively. So not only did you score 16 narratives, you had four rounds of winners against the other winners that you chose and then you had to pick an ultimate winner, and then not just a winner for you, a second order test. What do you think other parents would think is the best narrative? It tests for pluralistic ignorance, which is an important test. So when you layer those on, I'll give you an example. By the way, these were totally based on, you know, hypothetical or mythical or fictional characters. Here's an example. Barbara says she's always made it through tough times due to her strong faith. She kept hearing that people of faith did not need to vaccinate their children. But then her pastor, Robert Jeffries, of the 14,000 member First Baptist Church in Dallas said, quote, vaccines are a gift from God. And that made her more comfortable with the whole idea. Then she also saw that 95% of evangelical leaders said that they were okay with vaccination. And again, another one like that. So here's what happened. When we looked at the total population of 3,000 parents, we were like, oh my God, it looks like we got a couple of winners. Number two and number four. Number two was anticipated regret and social norming. Number four was overcoming the availability bias and using concreteness. But that was looking at all of you. And we know there's no average and you should not look at aggregate. It's more like Kiki, not like Booba, okay? So when you look at it this way, this is what came up. And you now have a kind of blueprint to what makes us who we are with the hidden who. An opportunity in this messiness. When we look at identity and faith, different narratives for different views on identity and faith. When we look at your big five personality, when we look at how you are made to make decisions, different ones work, but they are reproducible and they form a kind of blueprint for change management. So I hope this gives you an idea that one, much of traditional research, marketing, medical research, too blunt. Two, this comes from proven science and is a mess at first glance, but ultimately is ultra precise compared to the old way. Is it a lot more work? Yes. Is it more effective because I'm addressing you as an individual? It appears to be. It's early days, and we'll keep you up to date with what happens in Asia Pacific because we also test, of course, for cultural and contextual biases and differences. But let me leave you with this. If you're not testing for the sense-making genome of that hidden who, you're just shooting in the dark. So thank you very much. Stop. We did warn you, we wanted you to embrace the mess today. And even data that to the eye doesn't seem Mona Chalabi was sharing at the, at the beginning of the day, something that's not easy, not in, in, easy for us to kind of uh, uh, capture with our human brains. Nonetheless, 
We have the tools now. We have the AI tools that can see patterns. And frankly, we have the tools in which we can target individuals with personalized messages. And if we're going to do that in clever ways, we need to base it on some interesting behavioral data in all of its complexity. I don't want to panic you, Tara. Uh-oh. But I think we're all going to lose our jobs. <laughs> because 42 courses have invented a behavior change bot based on AI when you can ask it any behavior change question and it will give you a behavioral science answer. There we go. So we might not see you next year if that takes off. But we do want to say a massive thank you to 42 Courses. It's been a long-term partner of Nudgestock. They have some incredible e-learning courses, highly engaging, and they work with the top brands, Ogilvy, Candlion, Wark, Parsons, to put them on. And there's a discount code for everybody in the room and everyone on the stream today, Nudgestock23, with a capital N. We crashed their website in 2022, and we'd very much like to do it again. It's a kind of KPI for us now. So if you wouldn't mind helping us all out, um, do use it. Do use that code. That It's a free, highly brilliant e-training course. I, 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 you see sort of e-training stuff. This is amazing. And the videos of Rory, Richard Shotton, moi, you know, I get messages on LinkedIn all the time from people saying, I really loved it. It's a fantastic platform. Do check it out. Let's crash their website, please. Um, and they've got some Cam Lion courses. Who would like to win a Cam Lion? I bet there's a few of you in the room. Would you like to win a Cam Lion maybe next year? Well, listen in, friends, because we're going to hear from some multi award winning clients now. And not just the client, but the team that have been sitting behind her, who've been doing a lot of the digging in some very messy, very, very interesting data. Pooja Palmer is responsible for the Mayor of London's campaigns, such as hashtag London is open, let's do London, and hashtag have a word, which we at Ogilvy and in the behavioral science practice are extremely proud to have worked on. Um, up on stage with Pooja today is going to be Bianca Noves, um, Ogilvy planning director working on the campaign, and one of our team, in, uh, a consultant in the behavioral science practice, David Fanner, who it was actually leading some of the research for not last year's campaign, which we, I think, showcased last year, but this year's campaign, not seen yet, but you are going to get an insight. We're debuting some of the insights that have fed into the work for this year's campaign, a campaign to fight misogyny and harassment of women. Um, we're going to get the inside story, not just on the insights, but how they developed those insights. And interviewing Pooja, Bianca, and David, Back to the stage is the wonderful Mike Hughes, consulting director and creative lead for the behavioral science practice, and who led this year's project. So Mike is going to show us how on earth do you measure the messy, intimate, weird, difficult problem of misogyny? Oh, no. Thank you. Welcome again. Um, Pooja, David, Bianca, welcome. Um, you. Misogyny, probably one of the messiest, hardest challenges that we can solve. Pooja, it'd be great just to give us some context, a background to the challenge, why we chose to address it when we did. Yeah, of course. Um, so kind of where we began, uh, is that in the UK, a woman is killed uh, by a man every three days. And that is shocking. Uh, and, you know, for us, that was the starting point, was how do we prevent this epidemic of violence against women and girls? And is there a role that a campaign could play in that? And this kind of all started with a, kind of what our first and our key insight was, which is that low-level misogyny is usually a precursor to more violent crime. So it's very rare that a violent crime against women will happen without there having been some clues or some instances of misogyny or something that showed misogynistic attitudes or beliefs. Um, and that's backed up by crime stats. You know, we see things like exhibitionist behavior, so you know, exposing yourself without consent. Five to 10% of those uh, tend to progress to uh, contact sexual harassment. So we know that kind of that misogyny is a really early indicator. And when thinking about this, we knew you know, a campaign 
at the kind of sharper end isn't going to work. You can't, when somebody's already reached that perpetrator level, a campaign isn't going to stop that crime from happening. But how can we kind of reach it at the earlier point and think about that kind of preventative start side of things? Uh, and also, we really wanted to engage men in the solution. So the majority of men who are not perpetrators, how can they be involved and engaged and kind of giving them positive opportunity to be able to tackle that culture and kind of basically stop it before it happens? How do we shift it so that misogyny doesn't feel acceptable in those social situations? So um, that was kind of where we started. And there were two phases planned within the campaign. And you know, the first one was really about the awareness and the motivation of why. So you know, how do we make the problem known, understood, felt, and also the solution of being able to have a word? How do we make that understood? And then men understand, why, why do I need to have a word? How can, how can I impact this? How can I call out my friends? And then, you know, that was, that, was, that was great and a huge success. But, you know, it doesn't stop there. As we all know, with behavior change, this is going to take a really long time. So the second piece was really about capability. We knew there were a huge number of men who were like, well, I've, you know, I've seen this happen. It's happened with my friends. I've just not really known what to say in the moment. Or does it feel like it might not be a safe situation for me to intervene or so on? So we knew that there were a lot of men who wanted to take action but didn't know what to do. So that's why we wanted to focus on this new phase of the campaign where it's really tackling that capability side of behavior change. How do we equip men, give them the tools? What if we could come up with the answer of what is the thing you say in that moment? What is the thing that you're going to do that's going to help to, to tackle, uh, tackle that behavior. So we, in the first campaign, we told men to have a word. We then needed to understand what that word should be. Should it be a word? Should it be an action? Um, David, you led the research. Can you tell us a little bit how we start to understand misogyny? What some of the methodologies we need to use? Sure. So, um, I mean, word of the day, messy. We came into this knowing it was just an absolutely enormous task ahead of us. It's probably the hardest thing I've ever worked on because we found that immediately no one really has a clear distinction of where is the line between uh, harm and humor because banter is a huge part of this. So what was really essential for us actually was to understand male dynamics and kind of go to male-dominated spaces. This was not going to be something that we could only rely on research reports and papers, which still formed a part of it. But Actually, a huge component of our um, sort of diagnosis phase was um, ethnography, which, if you're unfamiliar, is a type of um, research where you go to a natural environment and you observe it, you observe behavior. And in, in this particular case, um, we were also participating with uh, the people. So we spoke to hedge fund managers in their local pub, the city bars. We went to gyms, um, you know, the very rough end, all the way to your 400 pound a month gyms. We spoke to barbers, we spoke to swimming teachers, really, you know, a whole diversity of London men to understand well, what is preventing you from speaking up when your mate is stepping out. And so that was one part of it, you know, ethnography. But we actually used some of our partners here um, quite extensively. So with the Interpanel research, that's a different kind of um, video diary type research where, you know, we could actually talk to men on their sofas. One of them was actually on the loo um, as they talked very honestly about quite tough subjects, and because we're always trying to get around that social desirability bias. So we find Interpanel is fantastic for that. But once we had these really confessional diaries of men talking about you know, the, the challenges they feel, dynamics, um, we then actually put it through Relative Insight, which is another partner who we, we just love working with, because that gave us a whole new level of insight that we just wouldn't have had. So for example, we put every single, you know, I think 300 videos of men speaking, and we could put it through, and we could find tiny different differences in ethnicities, for example, or age groups, how they talked about it. We found, for example, um, in, in certain cultures, misogyny and being bad, it was more of an awkward issue. I think that was the, the white cohort. Whereas in other uh, ethnicities, it was seen as quite a rude thing. And so subtle distinctions. But then in particular, we found a 25.2 times increase in words associated with respect with our, our black cohort. So we started to really understand well, what are the barriers uh, and sort of what are the rules and the, the sort of trigger points to which men decide there is a line and we should step in. What, what are some of the, the challenges with, we talk about psychological safe spaces, like what are the challenge for, for men to talk freely? Can you talk us through some of that? I mean, social dynamics was a huge part of this and that's again why we had to do it in person because 
we had to understand when, when one guy, one mate, was saying something like, oh, yeah, I really believe this. And then his mate would be like, hang on, mate, what was that last, last week, last Wednesday? And we could observe all these dynamics. Um, I think another challenge with this, which is one we came into, was actually uh, shame and understanding respect and all of those dynamics. Because no mate wants to call out his mate is kind of the truth of this, because you went to school with them. So I think that's another real big challenge. And, and what would some of the we discussed what some of the hypotheses were, even at the early stages when we were talking to the project, we thought there were some hypotheses we wanted to test. What were some of the things that surprised us, Pooja? Yeah, so I think one of the hypotheses for me had been, um, you know, are we going to need something in the moment? Are men going to want to call this out in the moment? Or might they want to do it kind of separately? Might you take it offline and have a conversation? I guess sometimes your hypotheses are based on what you'd do. I might, you know, talk to a friend afterwards and be like, hey, I didn't like that thing you said. Um, and it was really, uh, yeah, that was one of the hypotheses. Is, are we going to need an intervention for the moment, immediately when it happens, that's something you say or do then? Or is it going to be something that's afterwards? So I think one thing that really surprised me that came out of that research was really the almost kind of definitively and uniformly, everyone was like, no, we want something in, in the moment. And actually, looking back on that, you think, yeah, that makes sense, because actually pulling it up a lot later can feel quite, makes it feel like a bigger deal than just dealing with it in the moment. So that was a really interesting finding and surprise. Um, and then one of the other ones for me, I think, was around, uh, I think one of the lines that came out that I remember when David presented it back that always stuck with me was, it's easier to be offensive in a friendship group than it is to be offended because you don't want to come across like you've been offended by something and it, it kind of you don't want to be seen as the person who's policing that group almost so i think that was really fascinating was one showed the, the kind of the scale of the issue of what what we were dealing with and then thinking well how are you going to find an intervention that basically says you know i need to tell you this thing is you did isn't cool but I, but i'm not offended by it <laughs> but it's not okay and that's where some of the stuff that um, we'll talk a bit about was about how you introduce in the strategy, how do you introduce levity and lightness in doing it. And that was a really, really interesting part of that. So we have our findings. And David, maybe just a kind of couple of words on what were the kind of key findings that we had. I think, I mean, there was, we, we really pulled out seven big ones. And then beneath that, there were several strategic opportunities. But I think the main one, honestly, um, was just about respect. Because if you think about it, we are influencing a bystander to influence a perpetrator. So we can't shame either of these people, because you then get what we call psychological reactance, which is that feeling of being told off, which is just a wholly unproductive thing. People don't behave when you do things like that. And I remember, actually, when we were doing the ethnography um, in the pub, because that was essential to talk to bar staff, um, we, I think I went to the loo, and people who I was researching with, um, I came back, and he's like, David, I've cracked it. I've cracked it. It's all about love. I was like, come on, top it, top it. Like, <laughs> Which is an insight you usually find in the pub as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was like, oh, this is probably three or four pints in on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> um, but then we explained it, and we found, actually, yes, it is about love. It's about respect. You know, you went to school with these people. I think that was a really foundational part of the report in the end. So, uh, Bianca, we, we have our findings. How do you take them? into a creative strategy? What are some of the decisions that you have to make? Can you talk us through that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of the insights, uh, Pooja, David, they touched on it um, already. But um, uh, it, was, it was very natural. So the strategy for phase two was a natural evolution from our strategy for phase one, have a word. Uh, and the same way that we did last year, our strategy, the creative strategy had the insights from behavioral science and the research and the combi model uh, at its heart. So it was at the heart of our creative strategy. But one key insight that we got from the research this year uh, was that actually, uh, while men really wanted to intervene and they knew that they had to, uh, they didn't know why, they, they didn't know how. Um, so we, we, f we saw that 85% of men that saw our Have a Word campaign um, last year, uh, they, they, say, they say that they would now call out misogyny when they saw it. But actually, they didn't know how, because it's really hard to know what to say and what to do when you see your friend uh, behaving badly towards a, a woman. So um, yeah, th the main conclusion and, uh, from that insight is that this new phase had to be 
about enabling, uh, because the main barrier to intervention was, uh, was actually capability. So what we had to do is to provide those, uh, uh, these bystanders with mm. tools that would actually move bystanders uh, to actually calling out um, misogyny when they, when they saw it. Um, but another key insight that we also got from the research was the fact that same way as we were doing in the first phase, we had to continue to use the power of peer-to-peer -peer pressure yeah. um, to drive behavior change. Because we listen to our friends, we trust our friends, yeah. and shaming and naming and calling off yeah, of your friends and t telling them off doesn't, doesn't really work. So if we wanted our strategy to work effectively, that intervention had to come from a place of respect for that friendship. So we really needed to provide men with a, a simple but really powerful tool uh, um, to start calling out their friends um, with uh, respect and levity. So that was actually our main strategy. Uh, you get, you have a lovely get, get to buy uh, here uh, as any good strategy. But yeah, but the, the essence of that strategy was calling it out with respect and coming with an intervention that uh, really allowed men and bystanders to, to call out their friends with levity and respect. And that led us to our, to our intervention. Way. Yeah. So, of course, then collaboratively with our, all the team at Ogilvy and with our clients, uh, we've developed that, um, the intervention, which is quite a simple but powerful intervention uh, that consists of a really small word, but that packs a lot of uh, power and a lot of impact. And that word is mate. Um, so, the, the powerful thing about that word is that it's really accessible. So, um, anyone can say it, uh, but also it's really, it's universal. Mm. Anyone understands it. Um, but what's more powerful about it is that it comes from that place of respect and that bond. It really emphasizes that bond uh, between uh, friends, uh, the bond of that friendship. So, um, yeah, mate, it, it's, it's a very simple again, but a very powerful uh, I intervention. And what's really um, powerful about that is not just the choice of word, but we had a lot of thinking and behavioral science behind how we activate that intervention. And I, I think David can. I think can we see on the screen, bit. David. Yeah. Quickly. I mean, we're, we're not great for time, but a, a couple more minutes would be awesome, yeah. just to quickly talk about the insight and then. Look yeah, sure. So, mate, it's a word we already use. Um, men are using it already to govern themselves, but we found there's a huge difference between going mate, which is quite staccato and it's quite harsh actually in the context where you're not trying to rock the boat. But we found actually when you lengthen those vowels and you make it mate with a bit more care to it, that you really feel it. And I think when we actually we spoke to linguists, um, we read some papers on it, and we found that actually it's called vowel lengthening. Turns out whales do it. Turns out birds do it too. It's a way to sort of add um, meaning to something, just lengthen that vowel a bit, kind of like ooh versus ooh, or no versus no, and you drop something. It adds meaning. But actually another thing was um, the, word, the, the T sound in there was very powerful because, again, when you hear that staccato T, that means your mate's being serious. It kind of, it was fun, it was banter, but a line has now been crossed. So in the linguistics of it, just the intervention, which is really the product now, we then need to launch it. And we do this, so the, the campaign, say mate to a mate, we actually do this not through traditional means. We wanted to work with authentic voices who could get this word out for us. So essentially, Ramesh Ranganathan here, you see, he just took the word, he used it himself in a skit. We are now at time, but I would just love one word from Pooja to say just the challenges of how you might launch an intervention which you might know, not know what it is at the start of the project, but you have to sell it internally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we talked a lot about the, the challenges around this one, because at the start it was like, is this going to be a word? Is it going to be a song? Is it going to be an action? Is, it could, could be absolutely anything. So it was really about, um, one, kind of the, the trust between the agency and client relationship. I think that that was absolutely critical. You know, we were... Um, 
very communicative about these are our absolute no-goes, the mandatories, you know, what, what we, we need. We were very involved in the creative process, you know, invited with the switch-ups and so on. And I think that was really, really important because whenever you're doing behavior change work, it is, it is a risk. It requires a lot of trust, senior buy-in, a lot of kind of that, you know you're not going to get results immediately with a lot of this work. We know that the impact of this is going to be felt in generations to come. So our KPIs quite often are proxy ones. It's, you know, how many schools have we got this into or how many partners have we got on board? Um, as well as the indicative polling measures. So yeah, I think that's been really critical, and it's been very lucky. You know, the, the mayor. Of, this is a massive issue for the mayor of London. So it's been a, a, a really useful to have that really senior buy-in and saying, you know, we know we won't see results absolutely immediately. But um, even when we don't know what the intervention is, you know, having to go and be like, yeah, this is gonna be something, it's going to be great, don't know what it is yet, but uh, it will stop, you know, it's going to be able to be used to stop misogyny. And I think that's the power in the use of the word mate is, yeah. it starts, starts that conversation. Okay, it's now in culture, we're launching with a campaign. Marianne Seacart said earlier, if we, the easiest way to reduce inequality is if we see misogyny and sexism and racism, we call it out in the moment. Hopefully, this is a small step in doing that. Thank you. Oh, no. heard that here first, not strong. Nobody's, nobody's seen that. The work, some of it is out in the world, but there's more to come. Very exciting for us. Lovely intervention. Um, and you might have noticed, David mentioned one of our beautiful sponsors, partners, Instapanel. So Instapanel do create video ethnographies. They also do quant studies. They do them in impossibly quick timelines. And they sort of auto-transcribe, gather, translate, sociologically code all of these videos, feed them back to you in sort of record time. Absolutely incredible. I've used them for everything from, from the work that you've, we've just been talking about to getting to look inside people's fridges for food waste projects. Um, and they're really just fabulous partner and someone that we rely on even better when you can take the auto transcribed hundreds of people talking and feed it into another of our brilliant partners relative insight um, as we did in that campaign and see the different ways that people are actually talking the different language that they use just wonderful partners to us and we're really grateful to have them on board today and before the break we're delighted to announce one more speaker we have Mimi Turner who's head of the B2B Institute at LinkedIn across EMEA and Latin America the Institute is a marketing strategy think tank that makes the case for brands as a growth driver for your B2B businesses. LinkedIn is a long-term partner of Nordstock, so we're incredibly grateful. And you can find out more at the b2binstitute.com. Now to find out why your product needs a promise, please put your hands together for Mimi Turner. pretty good walk on music, right, guys? Um, I, I never thought I'd have anything in common with the previous speakers, because I'm here to talk um, from LinkedIn about B2B brand building, and they're talking about misogyny. But in my uh, last but one job, I was the first marketing director of Lab Bible, um, and we did the UOK Mate campaign. And I can speak to the use of the word mate as a really engaging thing. But I also think that my experience from that job told me one thing, which is that the best way to, to change behavior in men is to recognize the great goodness and generosity and decency of their vast majority. And to use that as an insight delivers much, much more change, in my opinion. And we spent some time thinking about that. So I just wanted to drop that in. Before I start to tell you about some research um, that we did, the, um, the B2B Institute at LinkedIn has, I think, one job. I mean, we, we do a number of different things. So we work with researchers, we work with academics, and we create um, IP and strategic work to help guide the way that our clients invest their marketing spend. But what we really, really do, I think, is we help CMOs get more brand money from their CFOs. That's really what they come to us for. And there is a problem with the word brand, especially in the very highly logical, rational, professional environment world of B2B advertising. 
Um, but B2B is a growth category. These are big businesses spending much more money on advertising, much more money on marketing, and getting savvy about brand building. But the problem is brand is, e is difficult to explain even to another marketer. If I ask 10 marketers what they mean by brand, or 10 creative directors, every single, I'll get 11 answers. I guarantee it. So what I wanted to do about a year ago is to, to set to run an experiment. And we worked with Roger Martin. So I don't know if you know, Roger Martin's the reason that I became a marketing strategy person. Um, he wrote Playing to Win, Design Thinking. I think he's Harvard Business Review's most published author. Uh, he worked with Procter & Gamble for decades, still does. Um, we worked with him on this piece of work. And now Starbucks and Lego, if you go to their websites, you will see that they are defining their mission in terms of the promise that they make to their customers. And that was even before the research came out, when we took the preliminary results to Roger, because he advises their CEOs. I think that there's a lot to do with brand that I cannot crystallize. The one thing I wanted to test was, if I articulate the value that my product creates for the customer, do I get better, different, similar, or completely different results when it comes to commercial performance? Because that's the discussion that we have to have. And this is what we tried to do. A promise to the customer, and if I had longer than six and a half minutes, I'd explain more, is really a wrapper for the four Ps, but in a way that everybody understands. Your granny can understand it. Your six-year-old can understand it. And critically, your CFO can understand it. If your CFO understands brand, it's frequently to just take brand on your spreadsheet and say, oh, you know, Mimi, I don't need to spend that money this year. This is like, it's a heated steering wheel. It's great when times are good, but you know what? Inflation's 10%, interest rates are soaring, our whole model of financing has really gone out the window. I'm gonna find that bit of brand spend, and this year we're not gonna have it. Try to say that about your promise to the customer. It's a different conversation altogether. So what we tried to do is to find a data set, because that's always what's really difficult, to help us to understand how to test this. Um, we worked with Walk, which is the, uh, they have campaign metadata um, from uh, dozens of different campaigns around the world and across a long period of time. Um, and what we did is we got their researchers to do an analysis of what campaigns that make a promise to the customer. They clearly, in the campaign objectives, articulate the value that that creates for the customer and make that the through line of a campaign. So it could be a campaign on multiple different channels. It could be different creative. Um, here are some examples of a campaign that makes a clear promise to the customer. So this is BT, Beyond Limits unbreakable Wi-Fi for business, that's a promise. We're articulating some value that we create for you, and we're going to stand by it. Big campaign, lots of different executions, one core promise. This is sixth. If you've rented a car, you will know that quite often the shiny thing that you want and the banger that you end up with are not the same. Sixth had the go-to-market innovation to decide that if you order a specific car, you're going to get that car. And their promise is, don't rent a car, rent the car. Snickers, every time I see this, I want a Snickers. So that's how good this campaign is. But Snickers Satisfies is one of the biggest and I think most successful B2C campaigns around. Uh, and one of the reasons I contend it's really successful is that it makes a promise to the customer about what it's going to deliver. Now, we looked at 2,021 campaigns. Um, and when we, so the researchers went through all of them. We had two teams of researchers because it's a subjective thing. I said, I really want it to be clear and explicit in the objectives. Of the 2021, 808 made a defined promise to the customer, which sort of means that 1,200 did not. 60% of campaigns are doing something other than articulating customer value. And in a way, that 600 is just as interesting as the 800 you did. And to give you a sort of thought about it, what those campaigns were 
mostly is rather inward looking. They were brands telling you about their beliefs or their values in the hope that they would mirror and in some way, some magically attach themselves to the client purchase. But I think we saw at least two bits of analysis earlier today that said not necessarily true. I would also say that we are not saying that not making a promise to the customer is a bad thing or a good thing. We're not saying that making a promise is a good thing. All I wanted to test is what are the financial outcomes. That's the only thing I wanted to test. So there's some brilliant campaigns that do different things. I just wanted to test the commercial outcomes. I'm going to run you through really quickly brand health, a bucket of different measures. But the thing about campaign metadata is you get what was increased. You get a good story from what we tried to do to what happened. And that's harder to do. Measurement of brand is so difficult because people don't have that time span. 56% of all the promise to the customer campaigns increased brand health compared to 38% of a larger number, 38% of 60% did not increase brand health. Oh, no, they, they did, but 56% of the promise of the customer campaigns increased brand health. Now, in my non-lad Bible job, the previous job, I was um, the director of strategy and messaging and research at the Liberal Democrats. And Liberal Democrats, as everybody who's ever had a leaflet will know, are the best people at bar charts in the universe. If there's a bar chart that you can skew, it's probably from the Liberal Democrats. So if I was a Lib Dem, right, this bar chart would probably start here. It would start at something like 25%, and it would give you a visual thing. But because we think this might be published by the HBR, and Roger's a stickler for this kind of thing, these don't look massively different. But that is a 48% greater likelihood of increasing brand health when you make a promise to the customer. This is a 75-page white paper, which we will send everybody. I'm just going to take you through a very high level. Market share. Market share, I think I can take to my CFO and say, mm, this is the thing that matters to you. 27% of campaigns that made a clear promise to the customer increased market share compared to 17% of non-promise to the customer campaigns. That is a 60% delta. You are 60% more likely to increase market share when you make that promise to the customer. Now, that was a binary yes or no. So what I then wanted to find out is, like, so you're telling me that you increase market share. What is the magnitude of that increase? Because if the magnitude of the promise to the customer campaigns is 2%, it doesn't matter that, that more of them did it. If the, if the magnitude of promise to the customer non-campaigns, uh, non-promise to the customer campaigns is 40%, but there's only three of them, there's a difference. So then we took all the sample that had that data, smaller sample, so you're not correlating this with the previous findings, but in this sample, on a mean annual basis, you had a 4% increase in market share from those promise to the customer campaigns versus the ones that didn't. Now, the last thing, which is, I think, the one that maybe you want to take away with you, is then we looked at long-term brand and sales growth, right? Um, Walk have this kind of categorization of results for all of the, so they have the metadata for, did the campaign improve metrics? Did it deliver a short-term spike in sales? Did it deliver a sustained sales success? And right there at the top, long-term sales growth on a rank of one to six. So one to six is where, where one is, you know, everybody showed up and everybody got a medal. Um, and six is you really, really made a difference. All you need to look at here is the shape of the red, which is the promise to the customer as you go up the ladder, versus the shape of the gray, which is the non-promise to the customer as you go up the ladder. Here. At the bottom, if you just want to show me some improved campaign metrics, it's kind of much of a muchness. You know, 51, 49, actually, those campaigns that didn't do a promise to the customer, many of which were social buzz or PR value, actually did, you know, it's in the margin of error. I wish this hadn't been the Brexit vote, because I wish we'd understood margin of error in a really profound way um, about six years ago. But nonetheless, when you get to the top, 
67% of the campaigns that were brand icons delivering long-term growth were promised to the customer campaigns. 33% were not. Now, what is important about those ones at the top is that they are the big budget campaigns. They're already big budget. They already run on lots of channels. They're already um, running for a long time. We, we did um, uh, kind of, we controlled for different fa factors, but you'll have to look at the white paper. But they're Formula One cars already. Like, if you're a Formula One car already, how, you know, if everything is not just about the amount of money, if it's not just about the, uh, the, the duration, if it's not just about the distribution, then one other aspect of it is about the promise to the customer. And the reason that I think a promise to the customer matters, and a reason I think it kind of has an implication for everybody here, is because in my whole long life of trying to get ideas from one place to other people through communication channels, I started to realize in my elderly, pre-Alzheimer's years that it's not the communication stupid. Instead of thinking about what we're saying, we need to think about how it's being received. I now contend that advertising or messaging or political messaging of any kind, if it is not optimized for the wetware of the human brain, it's just not going to work. And that is the behavioral lens that we are here because we believe in and think about. So a promise has a lot more behavioral weight than a set of words or an, a random set of phrases. And if you want to test that, just imagine if 50 people in your company had to stand up and recite your company's mission and vision, if they could even tell them apart, right? Somebody has got to go back to a PowerPoint and find out what that meaningless set of words is. We don't really respond to meaningless set of words. A promise is the thing that our psyches and our civilizations have been built on. We make promises all the time. You know, when you get married, you make a promise. I promise to do these things. We respond to promises. Promises are implicitly already going to be better understood than some vague phrase. So our conclusion at every level of commercial output, make a promise to the customer and your creative. And I, and I would contend, in fact, I, I think I'd almost promise that you will get a better result than if you don't. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mimi, and thank you, B2B Institute, long-term partner of Nudge Talk. Now, we've been managing the mess, we've been measuring the mess, but after the break, it's time for something a little bit different. It's going to be all about you. you. We're going to have a 20-minute break. Um, after the break, we'll also have a, a mystery session that involves something very cold. Mystery session, not on the agenda. Also going to tell you what the prize is for your hashtag messy moments, hashtag Nudge Talk 2023. So, for those who are online, Take a look around your house. Is it, dare I say, a little bit of a mess? Um, Catherine Blackler is the UK's first certified professional organizer and runs Sort My Space, helping the overwhelmed tackle the projects that they've been putting off. She is no stranger to messy environments. So who better to whip your behavior into shape by shaping your messy world? Stay tuned online for Catherine Blackler whilst the room can get some air, some cold water, maybe even some ice creams. There are some drinks outside, and we'll see you back at 4.15. Back here in 20 minutes, exactly. Now listen here, Missy. I need to have a strong word with you. This was the rather unexpected greeting from my friend Charlie when he and his crew docked in St Lucia after sailing the Atlantic. A month earlier, I'd helped him prepare his boat in the Canaries, and it turned out some of our storage solutions for the food provisions had pretty notable consequences. When Charlie's crew were tracking their noon coordinates each day, it wasn't matching against where they anticipated to be by then, and they could not work out why they weren't making quite the progress they were expecting to. And then, as one of the crew was about to start making dinner one evening, the helmsman on duty noticed a sudden jump on the compass. He shouted down the hatch to see what was going on down there. And it turned out the innocent manoeuvre of pulling out a number of food tins for tonight's dinner seemed to impact the compass reading. 
Upon further investigation, they realised that part of the compass equipment was located in a large locker under the floorboards. The very same locker that Charlie and I had identified as being the perfect spot for safely storing all the tinned food supplies for a crew of four people for at least three weeks at sea. And somebody, mentioning no names, had unknowingly surrounded this Fluxgate compass with a load of metal tins. And all of that iron was interfering with the compass's magnetic reading abilities. So the crew were, inadvertently, following a different course than the one they thought they were on. Now, it might have only been by just one degree or two, but it was over a week before they realised what was happening. And even just a one degree adjustment is the difference between successfully landing at your destination in St Lucia compared to landing in Dominica or the Vincent and the Grenadines, all of which are entirely different countries. Now, don't get me wrong, washing up on any Caribbean island probably doesn't sound too terrible, but life's path doesn't guarantee us those palm trees and pina coladas. And for the sailors out there who know there are trade winds and headwinds and other things to factor in, kindly humour me for the point I'm trying to convey here. We need to keep a watchful eye over where we assume we're heading versus where we're actually heading. And you are all very likely, metaphorically speaking, often unknowingly carrying around metal tins on your own personal journeys of life. And these tins lurking unassumingly under the floorboards are making it harder for you to stay on your true course too. So I'm here today to invite you to take a look under the floorboards of your life. I'd love you to consider what physical items, activities, thoughts or habits you might want to relocate to a safer distance, or perhaps toss them overboard completely if they're holding you back from your dream destination. So why would I encourage you to take a look at this? I'm Catherine Blackler, and as the UK's first certified professional organiser and the past president of the Association of Professional Declutterers and Organisers, yep, there's more than one of me, I've been helping overwhelmed Londoners for over seven years now. I have the privilege of being invited in behind closed doors to work with my clients, their household or colleagues, and help them identify their current sticking points and what they might be able to do about them. My clients think I'm mad when I'm greeted with a particularly congested or chaotic household. The words they typically use are that they are embarrassed or ashamed of their mess, while my reaction is to light up. Like the core theme of this year's nudge stock, where there's mess, there's opportunity to change behaviour. And as Rory covered this morning, the messier something is, the most progress can be made from within that mess. The more opportunities there are to find a different way or possibly multiple methods of doing things differently from here. So more often than not, the messier an environment is, the more exciting it is to me because I know I can add the most value to the occupants that are using this space. That said, I think one of the illusions, or maybe more accurately, disillusions we have about transformational work is that we need all the changes to be visible, enormous, deeply profound. The aesthetic changes on the TV makeover shows was probably a large part of what drew me into this field in the first place. And there's definitely a lot of satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment when you reconfigure a physical environment. But decluttering is much more than just being about the stuff. If people take the time to review their physical space, they often then will start considering the intangible aspects of life, such as how you spend your time and energy. What commitments or activities are there that you're still doing, but no longer fulfil them? What actions could be modified to suit how your life has evolved? And are there any technological improvements that would ease or possibly even eradicate the particular task in hand? The way we design and use the immediate space around us impacts the way we feel and behave in our everyday lives. When I visit homes, clients will tell me it's not normal to be operating in such a mess. I like to reassure them that if they're aiming for the images you see on social media or glossy lifestyle magazines, that is by no means normal either. That's not the reality of the human experience, which is more often than not, well, just downright messy. And while we fundamentally know that we're all being presented with a curated, heavily staged version of life by others, the deluge of picture perfect imagery that we each now receive across numerous sources, it undoubtedly carves expectations in our neural pathways. We can then feel pressure to uphold such standards and we experience a sense of failure or anxiety if, or rather more accurately when, we just can't keep up. Even with the best laid plans or great systems in place, we all unfortunately get curveballs in life. Even those that call themselves professional organisers, it's terribly inconvenient. Life events 
can upset the system, make us lose our focus, our enthusiasm, or our usual capabilities for a period of time while we work through that. Equally, many brains aren't naturally wired to thrive with structure or timekeeping or decision-making and prioritization. So neurodivergent folk feel even more out of kilter because the world is predominantly structured for a so-called typical brain. So what I'd love to see, and something to get us all off this massive hook of expectation, is for the mainstream adoption of this very real concept. So may I introduce you to scurry fung. It means to rush around cleaning when company is on their way over. It's such a wonderful sounding word, I think we should all embrace it as the new normal. And yes, I totally scurry funged before jumping online for nudge stock today. So let's see if all of us nudges here today can get the expression itself and the compassion and realism that comes with it to take off globally. Hashtag scurry funge. I appreciate many of you are responsible for large public facing projects and you're trying to get humanity at large to change their behaviours or to reshape societal norms. It's always easier looking outwards and seeing what needs doing beyond ourselves. So over the next few minutes, I'd like you to look inwards a little bit more instead. I fully appreciate that can be uncomfortable. It's not always fun looking in the mirror, especially if we realise where we may not be supporting our current selves or our future selves in the best way possible. And that might lead us to having to make some changes. Again, not the easiest path, but that's exactly why I'm encouraging you to step out of your comfort zone with me for a few minutes today. One of the key roles I play as a professional organiser is coming into a space with impartiality. I'm the first to admit that it's easier for me to see a way through your piles of stuff because I don't have the same history, relationships and emotions that you have with your belongings. That helps me see things more objectively. So I challenge when I spot duplications of items. I'll probe how often you're doing certain activities and we'll check that the things you use or want to use the most often are in what I call the prime property areas of your home. That's basically the areas you don't have to overly stretch up to or bend down to reach them. We also will rally up like we like items to create zones so that similar categories of belongings are located in or as close as possible to where you need to use them and when you need to use them. It might sound obvious when it's said out loud, but it isn't always what we all do in reality. As we're a global audience today, I obviously can't visit each and every one of you, even though I do love to travel. So I'd like to play a game together instead. When nudge stock is over, you can do this exercise for real and take a bit more time doing it. But for now, imagine I've sent you a very special pair of spectacles that help you see things for the very first time. These glasses evoke a curiosity. They don't allow for judgment or negative chatter, just a heightened ability to observe. If we want to continue the previous analogy, they're basically metal detecting glasses. They're designed to help you spot the heavy tins that are impeding your flow. And keeping with the nautical theme too, we know that water naturally finds a path of least resistance and humans aren't dissimilar in that way. So if there's an easier way, we'll usually take it. And if there's an obstacle, even if it's just a small bump in the road, if we're looking for an excuse, we can grind to a halt pretty swiftly. So put on these special spectacles and now imagine you're about to walk through your front door. What we want to do is identify and remove or at least lessen any of the obstacles that prevent us doing the right or desired action. Equally, we want to create dams or levees for the behaviours we want to exhibit less of. So as you walk through the rooms one by one, start with observations on the physical environment and things that might look out of place or be making your life more difficult. Jot down any observations as you go. After noting the physical clutter or aspects that bug you, you can then dig deeper and consider whether this home supports your lifestyle, activities and goals. Your metal detecting glasses will likely have given rise to a list of things that you could remove, add or rearrange in your space. Again, it's tempting to focus on the dramatic and big visual changes, but we often put off getting started on a bigger project until we have enough time, money, energy, skills, experience, any other excuse that we might find until we're confident we can do something properly. Don't forget the seemingly small adjustments too, especially when it comes to routine tasks that you do multiple times a day or a week. Look at your list and don't panic. It doesn't all need doing at once. I'd like you to pick one thing you could tweak by the end of this week, one thing by the end of the month, 
and one thing by the end of the year. And if you're up for sharing any or all of these, I'd love to hear how you're getting on. So why not tag me on at SortMySpaceUK and why not throw in a hashtag scurryfunge to get that ball rolling too. Like Rory Sutherland says in his TED talk, sweat the small stuff. It's in the finer details we can make a huge difference. The compound effect of what you start doing today, even making just a one degree incremental change in a few areas of your life, will land you at a very different destination across the coming weeks, months, and indeed years of your existence. Thanks for watching, and I wish you many adventures whilst riding the waves of life. If you want some high quality behavioral science from me and the team at Nudgestock, then check out 42courses.com. And for this weekend only, if you use the code Nunchstock23 at checkout, you'll be in for a fairly pleasant surprise. Aston Martin doesn't run ads anymore. So how is it that people keep referencing an ad from 50 years ago when purchasing a car today? It's because ads work over the long term. 95% of category buyers are out market at any given time. Buyers are either in market or out market. Most buyers are future buyers and future buyers are the source of future cash flows. Shake up your buyer journey, not stirred, and find out what this means for your brand marketing strategy.
Get in, get in, get your bottoms on these seats. There's loads of seats over here. People at the back, people at the back, come sit down as we begin our afternoon segment. And here's where we change gears again. We've done the whole messy world. We've done how you might manage it, some models. We've done measuring the mess with the brilliant Paul, Zach, and others. And now, the very final segment of today, we are going to talk about you. You and your messy humanity. The messy humanity that you share with the people next to you, everyone you love, everyone you don't love, and everyone you've ever tried to influence. So come on in, sit down, listen to the lulling sound of my voice, trying to get you all back in the room. <laughs> for our next segment. And um, you might be feeling a bit hot, a bit overstimulated, maybe even a bit under stress, perhaps. Well, our next uh, presenter hopefully can help you address a little bit of that. Wim Hof wasn't available today, <laughs> but nudge stockers, we have the next best thing. We have our own resident neuroscientist, Ogilvy Iceman. Nick Dockier, consultant in the Ogilvy Behavioral Science Practice. We heard a little bit earlier about oxytocin, dopamine, the vagus nerve. Well, Nick is going to help you check in with your own vagus nerve, right? Get intimate with it and bring us some immediate techniques that we can use uh, to biohack our own messy wiring of our messy bodies, and hopefully bring about ever greater peace and less stress in our lives. So without further ado, Ogilvy Iceman, Nick Dockier! Hello? Can you, there we go. Yeah, apologies, Wim Hof was not available today, but you've got me instead. Ladies and gentlemen and fellow seekers of well-being, today I have the pleasure of talking to you a little bit about stress and also what we can do to fight it. How do we get our bodies to work with us rather than against us? Now, I won't dwell too much on what stress is. I'm sure it's a feeling that most of us here are all too familiar with. Stress activates the sympathetic nervous system. This is where our fight or flight response kicks in. Our heart rates increase and tension builds. It can leave us feeling a, bit, a little bit messy and uneasy. The key, however, to unlocking stress, to combating stress, is something called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the unsung hero of the body's nervous system. It goes from the brain down to various organs within the body, modulating our heart rate, our digestion, our breathing, and even our emotions. When activated, it counterbalances the effects of the fight or flight response to stress. It brings us into a state of calm. You can think of it as Dr. Chill. It's the signal from the brain down to the heart that tells it to slow down. But this begs the question, what can we do to tap into the vagus nerve? What can we do to calm ourselves down and to feel less stressed? Well, there are many known ways in which we can do this, such as meditation, good social connection, healthy eating, healthy eating, um, and just being around good people. However, there is one, one route in particular called the physiological sigh. The physiological sigh has been recently proven to outperform other techniques such as meditation and also other breathing techniques in combating stress. It's been shown to be more effective at reducing our heart rate, bringing down any feelings of anxiety and stress. Now, it's something that we actually do involuntarily when we're falling asleep, but we can do it voluntarily in real time during a stressful event to help calm our heart rates down, to alleviate ourselves of any feelings of stress or anxiety. Now, despite the fancy name, it literally, quite, it literally is a double inward breath through your nose, followed by a prolonged exhale out through your mouth. It looks a little bit like this. 
So you notice it's a double inhale, a large inhale through the nose, followed by a slightly shorter one at the top, and then we exhale slowly out through the mouth. And this can actually bring you into a state of calm, and it can reduce feelings of stress and anxiety. I'd like you guys actually to give it a go with me so you can feel the power of instant stress relief. So just to recap, it's a double inward breath in through the nose, followed by an exhalation out through the mouth. So if you guys are ready, copy with me and give it a go. We'll do it three times, so hopefully you can feel this calmness. So I hope you guys are ready. And again. And one more time. Now, hopefully you guys felt that and you feel a bit calmer. It should, if done correctly, make you feel a little bit calmer. Now, the reason why this works or should work is that the double inward breath through the nose and the exhalation through the mouth in that manner activates, um, activates the vagus nerve. Both, both breaths activate the vagus nerve. Not only this, but this double inward breath and particularly that short breath at the top allows you to clear out all the carbon dioxide that sits within the base of the lungs. It sits within small sacs called the alveoli. Um, they're very, very large in volume. So if you were to spread these out, they'd actually cover an entire tennis court in, the, in their volume. So they hold a lot of carbon dioxide. And so by doing this breath, we are removing excess carbon dioxide, which acts as a stress signal to the body and tells our heart rate to increase. So next time you're feeling a little bit stressed, you can try this just a few times before a meeting, even during a meeting. Um, you can even do it for five minutes before bed, and it will really slow down your breathing rate and bring you into a state of calmness and help you fall asleep. Not only that, you can pretty much do it any time in the day, and as I said, in real time. It really is an instant stress relief tool. So, there is one other technique I wanted to tell you guys about today that we can all use to combat stress. Some of you might have already guessed, based on the lovely attire, what that is. It's cold exposure, ice baths and cold showers. Now, you might be wondering, how can something so seemingly uncomfortable provide any sense of stress relief? Well, it all comes down to the marvelous physiological responses that occur when we expose ourselves to the cold. Allow me to show you. The moment you've all been waiting for, the gown is about to come off. Please stay calm. <laughs> Just to check is the mic. Oh, it's on. Just if you don't believe this is cold, come and have a check afterwards. You can feel it for yourself. <laughs> now, as mentioned, it might seem counterintuitive, but once we get into a cold environment, the fight or flight response kicks into action. What's happening to me right now, and I've got a tracker on my arm. Thank you, Paul Zach. My heart rate is increasing. My blood vessels are also constricting, and adrenaline is searching through my veins. <laughs> but as I said, this might seem very counterintuitive, but bear with me. Once you learn to settle into it, calm your heart rate, calm your thinking, something very magical happens. It's the vagus nerve. It takes center stage once again. It activates the relaxation response. It brings your heart rate down and brings you into a state of calm. Now, more importantly, each time we do this, each time we expose ourselves to the cold and we override the stress response, we are literally training our bodies to adapt to stress. Now, Usually I would have been, you know, been a bit more panicky in the state, but I've done it quite a few times. I've learned to override the stress response, especially in temperatures like this. So in everyday life, in stressful situations, you learn to override the stress response. You become more calm. So you are training your body and your brain to adapt to stress. I urge you guys all to try this, but I still... Checking the temperature? Temp check. Yep. Bloody cold. <laughs> really, really bloody cold, under 10 degrees. So it's pretty nippy, it's pretty nippy out here. But I understand that cold showers, ice baths are still you know, quite a daunting experience, especially if you haven't done them before. But the other benefits are undeniable. They also improve our circulation, they boost our immunity, they make the skin look good. I mean, check me out. But my favorite fact, my favorite fact about cold exposure is around dopamine, the body's motivation molecule. 
So cold exposure like this for two to three minutes, up to five minutes, can boost dopamine by up to 250%. In some studies, 500%. Now, these are levels comparable to that of cocaine. However, this is not a simple rise and crash in dopamine. It's a sustained rise that goes up and takes about three hours to come back down. It's, this really is the body's natural high, and I urge you all to embrace the cold safely and give this a try for yourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we've learned today in a very short amount of time that the vagus nerve, the physiological sigh, and cold exposure offer profound methods for taking control of our stress response. As we practice these and we learn more about the body's inner mechanisms, we can learn to take control of our very own stress response and in everyday life, approach a state of calm and serenity. Thank you very much. Stay in, stay in. We've got to get, we've got to get a picture of this. Here we go. Nick, Doc here, everybody. We've oh, Bobby's Iceman! We've never had a speaker in a bath Come before. and test that water later, because it's, it's I think we'd all like to. Who's going to have an ice bath when they get home? At least a colder shower than normal, yeah? <laughs> and I know what you're all thinking, which is, where can I get one of those amazing dressing gowns? Well, I have news for you, Nudge Doc. This is your very last chance to tweet us with hashtag Nudge 2023. We have two to give away, two dressing gowns, handmade. They look fabulous, as I'm sure you can see. All you need to do is tweet us with your messy moments, and you too could be chilling in one of those like a B-side legend. And he is single as well, if you want to tell your friends. <laughs> For now, till the For end now. of the day. <laughs> um, we're now delighted to introduce to the stage, the Nudstock stage. Uh, another B-side legend. Another B-side legend. She's going to tell us how to harness our messy humanity by talking about the relationship between what we eat and what we think. She's a psychologist, an author, and has wrote several books that are on sale at the back of the room. She's going to talk about um, your deeper humanity right now. Please welcome to the stage, Kimberly Wilson. Okay, team. So uh, I'm going to embrace my own little messiness. This title is wrong. This isn't exactly the talk you're going to get. I do talk about the kind of nutrition that is supportive of brain health, but I thought, especially for you, I would talk about how food shapes your behavior. And I mean very, very specifically how food shapes your behavior, not how the environment shapes your food choices, but how food might be having an effect on who you are and how you behave. So what is your brain on food? I'm going to start, we're going to it's literally a whistle-stop tour. But we're going to go through the mechanics of hunger. We've all heard of it. Is it legit? And if it is, what's going on? Malnutrition and aggression, so really honing in on this special group of studies I call the prison studies. And then we're going to look at the relationship. This is a kind of very leading-edge research. It's very, very early on, but it's very, very interesting. Look at the relationship between food and our experience of fairness. Hockey. So, Hanger, broadly speaking, that feeling of irritability, anger, agitation, distress, unpleasantness that we get that is associated with hunger. Hunger being the physiological state of needing to eat. Is it legit? And actually, why, why, would, why is hunger so distressing is perhaps where we should start. So hunger is distressing essentially because you need to eat to live. Hunger is an evolved survival message, say, to motivate you. It's supposed to be uncomfortable, because if it wasn't uncomfortable, you wouldn't be motivated to get up, to move, to seek out food, and to consume food. So there is a reason that hunger is unpleasant, we don't like it, and we're motivated to do whatever we can to make it stop. But what about this relationship, this colloquial, you know, everyday association we make between hunger and aggression? Is it legit? Is it a thing? So we think so. Uh, for a long time, it was just kind of something we would talk about between ourselves, but there seems to be growing evidence of this association. So first of all, we see an association between increased aggression and hunger in animal models, from flies to goats. When animals become hungry, they become more aggressive, they become bolder, they become a little bit more territorial and intense. And a, <laughs> this gives you a little bit of an insight into the way psychologists work. So what they did was, uh, 
there's a group of studies which really, really we wanted to test people's relationships, so we'll get into those in a moment. Um, but first of all, we start out with 64 European adults. So it's a small study, but it's a kind of uh, a test of uh, whether this works in an ecological setting, in a real world setting. Asking people to give repeated me measures at different time points of their hunger and their mood. And what they found was that hunger it was responsible for about half the variance in your irritability. How hungry you were could answer the question as to how, about 50% of the variance into how irritable and moody and aggressive you would be. In a study of women, there was a higher association, and this was only done in last year, published last year, a higher association of tension, anger, fatigue, confusion, poorer positive emotions when these women were hungry compared to when they were satiated. So we see these associations between the physiological state and the mood state. So what might be going on? So one of these issues is a concept called valence. I'm not sure, anybody familiar with valence? Okay. So valence is a psychological paradigm which speaks to your physiological state of pleasantness or unpleasantness, right? So uh, hunger is a state of unpleasantness. A full belly is uh, a pleasant state. Uh, being, you know, getting into bed after a really long, tiring day is pleasant. So it's a state of positive valence. And when we think about emotional states, what we're coming to understand is that emotion isn't just neck up. Emotion is a synthesis of the information coming from your body, how it's translated into your brain, and combined with the available emotional concepts. So the, the mood state that you are in is going to be influenced by the physiological state you are in. Now, some of that physiological state will be conscious to you. You will know if you're hungry. You'll know if there's a stone in your shoe. You'll know if your trousers are too tight, and that, that will start to affect your mood. But uh, the vast majority of it is unconscious. You don't know the exact glucose level uh, in, your, of, in your bloodstream. You're not sure exactly where or the effects of various nutritional uh, components and what effect they might be having on your physiology. Your brain does. Your brain is making an interpretation, but you won't know that consciously. And we can map mood states in, uh, across uh, valence, and arousal. So arousal, you can think of as energy. How energetic am I feeling? And so high arousal but poor valence are feelings like anger. I've got a lot of energy, but I feel terrible, right? Whereas high arousal but high valence is excitement, feeling energetic, ready to go, happy, joyful. This combination of what's happening in your body, consciously and unconsciously, with your energetic state, your state of arousal, and your available emotion concepts will inform the emotional state that you enter into, what your brain tells you you are feeling. What else might be happening? Well, cortisol plays a role. And we think about cortisol as a stress hormone, and it is. But actually, one of cortisol's main jobs is regulation of blood glucose. It, we, the, the full name is it's a glucocorticoid, so there's a clue in the name. Because what happens when you're stressed, and stress is really, am I having to face a challenge or do I need to get out of the way? When you're facing that, that conflict, that decision, what needs to happen is your brain needs sugar. Sugar is the, glucose is the preferable mainstay uh, fuel source for your brain. If you're having to make a decision, if you're having to think of an escape route, if you're having to think of the right words, if you're having to give a talk, your brain needs more glucose. And what will happen is that it will release cortisol to help release glucose from your bloodstream. And so that happens at the same time when you're hungry. Because when you're hungry, what will happen is that your cortisol will rise in order to produce, to release glucose from the liver to give you energy. So when you're hungry, you get this rise in cortisol, which gives your brain needed energy, but it also then comes along with this physiological experience of negative valence, of agitation, of difficulty, of unpleasantness, of restlessness, of listlessness. Um, these are the, the mean studies <laughs> that I was talking about. They got a group of long married couples, average of 12 years, 
and ask them to test their morning and evening cortisol levels for three weeks. And because psychologists are evil, then gave the, all the partners a voodoo doll of their partner. And they asked them, when you get angry with your partner, just stick a pin in the voodoo doll and just tell us how many pins are in there. And they used the count of pins as a proxy for the amount of anger, and they found this correlation, this relationship between cortisol levels, as recorded in these uh, over the cross, across the three weeks, and the level of pins. And similarly, uh, partners were more likely to blast their partner with a loud noise when they had higher levels of cortisol in their bloodstreams. Why is this relevant? And this, I have to put my hand up. I, at every opportunity, I, I want to make the social argument. This isn't just about individuals. We are responsible for each other. This is really important when we, if any of you are in a position to think about food insecurity, hunger, and child hunger, because what we know is that any child, a child doesn't necessarily have the emotional awareness or, or understanding or just the emotional regulation skills to understand that their hunger, that their irritability, their moodiness, the fact that they're kicking the table, elbowing the per person they're sitting next to, is associated to their physiological state. It's up to adults to make that association and to advocate for the well-being of children. So I'll just take that moment to say that. Um, but we know more broadly in terms of long-term mental health outcomes that independent of factors around socioeconomic, um, poor socioeconomic standing, uh, Poor poverty in general, living in a crowded uh, home, not having your own bed, independent of those factors, hunger is associated with more anxiety, more, irrit more irritability, uh, more internalizing behaviors, and greater psychological risks down the line. So hunger is a source of toxic stress, and toxic stress is the kind of stress that you don't have the opportunity to recover from. You know, we're adapted to have peaks of stress after which we can rest and recover. Chronic hunger is a toxic stress that can lead to corrosion of mental health. And actually, high cortisol for a long time is, is damaging to synapses. It's damaging to the structure of the brain. All right, let's move swiftly on to the prison studies. So um, I worked in prisons for a number of years. I ran a therapy service there. And while I was working there, there were some studies that came out that were really actually very pertinent to the work that I was doing. Prisons are dangerous places. They are full of angry people. Um, they are full of angry people who have drugs coming in a lot of the time. They are full of people, more broadly, who've experienced a lot of trauma. Um, and who haven't had the opportunity, the skills, the investment, the compassion to have to process that trauma. And often that trauma then is externalized in aggressive behavior. Prisons, uh, uh, you know, the MOJ is constantly looking for ways to manage safety because safety is expensive. Whether you're paying compensation to members of staff who have been harmed or assaulted, whether that's uh, trying to recruit people to work in the prisons who have left because morale is so low. It's very expensive. Aggression and violence in prison is very, very expensive, and it's, it's a big problem for the MOJ. So this group of studies is really interesting. They reach back to 1997, um, and most recently 2020, and they are all at least double-blind randomized trials. One is triple-blinded. And basically, blinding is really the level of awareness of the people participating, that what they're getting is the active treatment. So the participant is blind if they don't know whether they're getting the actual supplement or a placebo. The practitioner is blind, and that would be double-blinded, if I don't know whether I'm giving them the active substance or the placebo. So what the, the blinding allows us to have a bit more rigor in not biasing the outcomes and being a bit more certain, or a bit more confident at least, that the intervention is responsible for the outcome. And these are really important outcomes. So they've looked at 62, 200, or, you know, 200 on average uh, violent male offenders, and they've given them, randomized them into two groups. They say, this side of the room, you're all violent offenders. Um, <laughs> this side of the room, you don't know it, but you're all getting vitamins. This side of the room, you don't know it, but you're all getting a placebo, just a sugar pill, it does nothing. After two weeks, 12 weeks, you guys, having been terribly violent for a long time, are now 
less likely to get involved in an act of aggression. And that is objective um, incidents of violence. So what they do in prison is you have a logbook at the end of the wing, and you can count the number of violent incursions that have happened on that wing. And simply through the intervention of nutrition, and the prison population is a group with very, very poor nutrition, both in the prison, but also historically, simply by improving nutritional status, we get a 30% reduction in objective incidents of violence. So when we're talking about a cheap, accessible, low-risk intervention for something like violence, and the thing about violence is we tend to think of it as a volitional act, right? And certainly our judicial system thinks of it as a volitional act. You decide to punch someone in the face. You decide whether you're going to walk away. We have a judicial system that is based on volition, and the idea being that you have the knowledge and you have the moral awareness to make a decision about what you're going to do. You know right from wrong. And if you do wrong, then it's because you've decided to do wrong. But what that premise says, or what it assumes, is that the, the machinery that is doing the decision-making is working properly. Right? The fundamental assumption is that the machinery, the brain, that is making that decision is working properly. And I think what this group of studies does is to really question that basic premise. If someone is really, really nutritionally depleted, is the machinery of decision-making really working as well as we would like it to be? And it raises quite difficult questions, very messy questions, about what we mean when we say volition, decision-making, and choice. Speaking of which, this, I, this is really lovely, but it's, it's a very early study, so I'm not going to... Don't go home and change your diet based on this study. It's just a very interesting look into what might be happening. And what I love about it is really this... It moves us away from this dichotomy, this dualism we have that decision-making is neck up and the body is just surplus to requirements. Of course, the body doesn't work that way. Your brain is fed by everything that you eat. It is affected by your immune system, your microbiome, your stress levels, the hormones you're cycling through at whatever time of the month. Your brain is affected by all of these things. And so we need to start opening our, our thinking, and certainly our research, to the idea that what happens in the body might be affecting what happens in the brain. So in this study, participants, again, were split into two groups. So the violent guys were going to give you a high-protein breakfast, and you guys, you're going to get a high-carb breakfast. And then we're going to play a game. And this game is essentially a game of fairness. So what will happen in this game is that, let's say, you and I are playing a game. And the uh, researcher gives you 10 pounds and says, you can decide how to split it with me. You can split it any way you like, absolutely any way you like. You can keep nine, I get one, that's fine. I can choose to accept that offer or reject it. If I reject it, neither of us get anything, right? So it's really a test of fairness, my willingness to accept an unfair offer, yeah? Because really, the, the most logical thing to do would be to split 50-50, and that's the most fair thing, and we both go away with something, we walked in without any money at all, so now we've each got a fiver, but that's not necessarily how humans work. Um, so we have a look. So I can choose to punish you by rejecting the offer, we both go home with nothing. That's, what they found was that there was a difference in the tendency to accept or reject the unfair offer dependent on the type of breakfast the person had had. So player B, if they'd had a high-protein breakfast, so I'm player B, they were much more willing to accept the unfair offer. Much more willing to say, OK, I'll just take the pound then, <laughs> but nothing, than if, than if I'd had a high-carb breakfast. Um, we've got 45 seconds left, so we can certainly talk about the hypotheses, the ideas about what might be happening behind that. So high-carbohydrate breakfasts seem to increase the availability of serotonin in the brain, um, of tri tri tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin. High uh, protein increases the availability of tyrosine, which is a precursor to dopamine. 
And it may be, and this is still a working hypothesis, it may be that the difference in the availability of those amino acids and then the neurotransmitters that they go on to make makes a difference to your sensitivity to unfairness in the real world. And where that's an interesting question is one, our general food system, which tends to be pretty high in sugar, pretty high in carbohydrates, what does that mean? But also, on a smaller level, lots of people moving to these high-protein, carnivore, keto-type diets where there's a high availability of protein. Is that shifting the kinds of decisions they're making in the world is an ongoing question. So a very, very quick whistle-stop tour. The summary, our brains are made of food, and the quality and, uh, of nutrition has a profound effect on its structure and its function, not just what it looks like, but how well it works. The nutritional status of our brains, and I call them brain bodies because I try to get away from this kind of separation. They are one thing, you are one organism. It's constantly and unconsciously being influenced, influencing our moods, decisions, and behaviors. And the nature and quality of the food environment may be shaping our society at large in ways that we haven't even thought about. So that is me. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm we're taking questions. That was absolutely sensational. <laughs> um, I've always been a big fan of Edward de Bono, who uh, died, I think, last year. But when, at one point, Edward de Bono recommended that the problems of the Middle East could be solved by giving them Marmite, <laughs> Uh, I thought he was he completely jumped the shark. OK, I have to admit. But there is some sort of vitamin deficiency, which I think comes with eating unleavened bread. Is that right? So the, the data around Marmite is really interesting. And that looks, essentially, Marmite is a food stuff that is naturally high in B vitamins. And when they're looking at studies and correlations of the association between stress resilience and, um, and diet, B, what they use as the best intervention to test it against is Barocca. So we know there is good evidence, and I'm not funded by Barack, okay. <laughs> but we know that there is evidence that increased uh, availability of B vitamins increase, increases stress resilience. And so Marmite has been associated in some studies with increased stress resilience and reduced in, uh, severity of anxiety. So this is, I mean, this is <laughs> genuinely extraordinary because, I mean... Uh, I only started to discover this, and I discovered this whole field, by the way, almost accidentally, because a group of neuroendocrinologists from the University of Cork, who you've probably come Oh, from, yes, Dr. You know Cryan. Them. Yeah, Dr. Cryan, got in touch with me um, discussing faecal transfer or faecal transplants, where if you actually effectively replace someone's biome, in, I, I suppose it's the microfauna. They call them crapsules. Crapsules, exactly. <laughs> uh, now, uh, he didn't want me to undergo this, but he did actually uh, want me to rebrand faecal transplants, which I, I think makes sense, because it can't really be any worse, can it? But um, what's so interesting is that effectively the part of the, the... There's almost what they refer to as a second brain, mm -hmm. which is the part of the brain that actually encompasses the digestive system. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of whole neuroendocrine system, which takes up an extraordinary part of brain energy and processing, and yet, of course, all operates pretty much below the level of consciousness. Absolutely. So it's, this is absolutely fascinating. T -t -t OK, you've got to tell them a bit about faecal transplant. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I've teased them with that concept. But it seems that you can actually take on the elements almost of the personality. It's, it's really extraordinary work. And they've used it. So faecal transplants um, essentially are taking the and they, they literally take a stool sample from someone who is healthy. And you've really got to, you know, the, your, back, your family history has to be pretty stringent, no history of things like MS or diabetes or kind of those sorts of things. Um, they take the a stool sample and they clean it up and then they, um, they kind of repopulate the bacterial composition there and they put it into a capsule. And then for people particularly who have C. diff infection, which is a very kind yeah. of dangerous um, gut infection, they found that this transplantation, um, either from the bottom or from the top, <laughs> can uh, improve survival rates of C. diff, but certainly in animal studies, what's been seen is shifts in what we might call the animal equivalents of depression and anxiety. Um, and I think that's how John got into the research area, was that he was working on stress, and he was starting to see this relationship between the gut microbiome and stress outcomes. And, and really, that 
what there seems to be this way in which what happens in the gut can actually shape the morphology of the brain in utero and in early development. So what's happening in the gut is somehow being translated into the brain and shifting the way that it develops. That's absolutely freaky. Good, I've got to ask, because otherwise <laughs> the people watching online won't get jealous of you in the hall. Any questions directly? Anybody want to stand up and ask a question? How many minutes have we got, just quickly? One. One, no, okay, none, okay. None, none minutes. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this, this question in terms of, for example, violence and prison mm. diet. Now, my colleague Chris Graves was saying the problem with doing that in America was people would claim it was mind manipulation. I don't really see how you'd see that. <laughs> uh, that seems to be taking an extremely strong opinion. Mm. But why, my suspicion is that actually Ed, Edward de Bono probably read the earliest of the four studies, mm -hmm. which is where his conclusions came from. Um, why is that, that? Those are extraordinarily high figures, by the yeah. way, a double blind I, trial. Absolutely. Why is it that this is practiced so little and so little known? This is my perennial question. This is yeah. what fills me with constant rage. You know when the Hulk says, I'm always angry? This is me, like, yes. in a constant state of rage, because it's just extraordinary, especially when you've worked in the prison system and you've seen the level of harm. And, and I'm not saying it's a magic bullet and it's going to fix everything, but we have the opportunity to intervene in a way that is low cost, it's really accessible and it's low risk. There are, you know, with other yeah. interventions, medications, you have risks of things like tardive dyskinesia and, and um, people becoming very sleepy, people having very flattened affect, they feel bad. That doesn't happen when you're giving people nutrients. So it might not fix everything, but it, A, it might help, and there aren't really any side effects. It is an extraordinary, I think, dereliction of duty that the MOJ, that part funded the second study, the 2002 study, has done absolutely nothing on this. So, so, so hold on, they funded the study, yeah. they got those results, yeah. the cost of the intervention is absolutely minuscule, uh -huh. so the, the, effectively the return on investment would be colossal. Enormous. 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 And yet nothing has happened. Okay. <laughs> That's the big behavioural question, actually, at the end of this day, which is how on earth you can discover something so profound and actually do nothing with it. And we often have this worry, which is that actually people in, you know, people in certain government positions want the, the solution to be commensurately expensive yes. with the problem. Or, or even just novel. And Sorry, it was yeah. the Home Office, not the MOJ, so I should correct that. They want it, you know, it's not, a, it's not a magic drug, it's not a new patentable drug, it's nothing, it's, it's food, it's nutrients. And I think there's, that's part of the issue is that it's, it's so ubiquitous and it feels so every day that we don't really believe that it could be having this profound an effect. And also I think, particularly with the prison population, there isn't much sympathy for prisoners. If we were talking about children, if we were talking about the elderly, if we were talking about pregnant mothers, and I talk a lot about them as well, I think there's much more sympathy, but I think that you don't garner much sympathy, particularly in an election cycle, by saying, let's be nice to criminals. No, ah, interesting. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. That was absolutely sensational. Thank I'm you. still a <laughs> Thank you so thank much. You very much. Absolutely Pleasure. wonderful. That's probably that. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Wow. Charged up again, uh, Nudge Stockers. The hanger is real. It's legit. You know now and get some vitamins inside you. You have an excuse. This is our last chance to win one of our Nudge Stock dressing gowns modelled by Nick Docker again. He's going to keep it on this time. <laughs> it's, um, it is very, very luxurious. And you could be luxuriating it in it at the end of a long day after a soporific bath, okay? Which Nudge Stock, if I get a little bit ASMR right now, <laughs> brings us to our final speaker of the day. He's a man that at least a third of you would love to have a little private chat with. Why? Because every single day, our messy human minds require a good sleep in order to function properly. Yet, the Sleep Council says, some 30% of us sleep badly every single week. Here to help you understand your <laughs> sleep, we're gonna help, he helps thousands of people in his personal practice, is a regular on BBC Radio 4, author of two books that you can buy at the back. You are moments away from a better night's sleep. Please welcome our next speaker.
Well, I, I think I've just witnessed my worst nightmare, which is getting up in front of a room full of 400 strangers in a dressing gown and having to get naked. So thank you for that. That's kind of calmed my nerves significantly. So um, I'm going to be starting off, really, by talking a little bit about how sleep can be messy and how good sleep can actually tidy up your life a little. And I think that, really, the next two videos that I'm going to show you are perhaps the most potent illustration of how sleep can be messy. These two videos are of individuals, and you'll notice in the videos that their brain waves are being recorded. We know that they're in the very deepest stages of sleep, so really deep sleep, what we term stage three, or uh, slow wave sleep. And yet, they're Please. doing this. No, Mum! No! Mum, stop. Mum, please stop me. If I press it, yeah. I'm going to die. No, you're not going to die. No, yes, I am. No, you're not going to die. So, so this young boy is in very, very deep sleep, clearly is engaging with his mother, not entirely sensibly, but is talking, is looking around, can obviously see. When he wakes up, he can't remember anything that's happened. So this is an example of a sleep terror. This other gentleman is, again, in very deep sleep. Given for thinking that actually he's awake. He's behaving as if he's awake, although not entirely sensibly. He certainly looks awake. So I think what these two videos really very much demonstrate is that sleep, firstly, is not simply an off state of the brain. It's not simply a point for eight hours during which you go offline and nothing happens in your brain. There's lots of things that are happening in your brain. And what we now know, and we've known for quite some time, is that there are various stages of sleep through which we cycle over the course of the night. So for the average person in this room, the likelihood is that you will go through about four or five cycles of sleep, with the majority of your deep sleep being in the first half of the night. Every 90 minutes or so, you'll go into REM sleep, which is the stage of sleep that we most associate with dreaming, dreaming of a narrative structure, so those plot-like stories that evolve over the course of the night, and then you'll dip back out of REM sleep, back into non-REM sleep, doing the majority of your dreaming, the majority of your REM sleep, over the course of the night. But even that is a gross oversimplification, because what those two videos show us is they show us that actually sleep does not affect the whole of the brain at the same time in most individuals. And in actually, in those videos that I showed you, those individuals exhibit something called local sleep. In those individuals, the parts of the brain that we're recording from, what constitutes very deep sleep, are the parts of the brain, the frontal lobes, that are responsible for rational thinking, for planning, for uh, consciousness, for awareness, for judgment. And also, other parts of the brain, this area called the hippocampus, which is the area of the brain that's responsible for memory, which is why many people who exhibit these kinds of behaviors, and the sorts of things that people do is sleep walking, sleep talking. I've seen people ride a motorbike in their sleep, drive a car in their sleep, uh, rewire televisions in their sleep. So some of the stuff that people can do can be really quite complicated indeed. Yet the parts of the, uh, of the brain that exhibit some waking behavior are the parts of the brain that are responsible for vision, for movement, and importantly, for emotion, which is this area of the brain called the limbic system, which is often why individuals who exhibit these kinds of behaviors in sleep uh, exhibit very, very strong emotions, fear, anger, that kind of thing. So we've moved on a little bit from sleep just being an off state. We've moved on a little bit from there just being these three or four stages of sleep overnight to understanding that actually different parts of the brain can exist in different stages of sleep or indeed wake at the same time. We've known this for years in animals. So animals like dolphins, like whales, like certain birds, certain amphibians can sleep with one half of their brain at a time. And you can understand why they might have evolved that process. 
because they still need to be able to surface, to breathe, if they're aquatic mammals. They still need to be aware of what's going on around them whilst they're sleeping. So it really demonstrates that evolution has certainly demonstrated that sleep is of utmost importance if it's gone to such lengths in order to allow these organisms to sleep, even when they're having to do all of this. So what about in humans? Can we sleep with half of our brains at the same time? Well, we can't, but there is some evidence that actually, and many of you will have experienced this, when you sleep for the first time in a strange environment, in a hotel room, your sleep will be of less good quality than at other times. And by the time you then get to your second or your third night, actually your sleep gets much better. And what we can demonstrate is that in that first night in a strange environment, actually in your dominant hemisphere, in the dominant half of your brain, the sleep is much less deep than it is the second or the third night. So we do have some of those mechanisms available to us to control the different halves of our brain simultaneously in sleep. But perhaps more importantly, what we're now beginning to understand is that sleep affects all of you. Now, I'm very used to giving talks to patients, to patient groups. And at this stage, about 70% of people are already asleep in my talks. So I'm quite pleased to see lots of open eyes. But actually, what we're now beginning to understand is that all of us are a little bit asleep, even when we're wide awake, that constantly the outer lining of our brains, the cerebral cortex, is dipping in and out of sleep, little islands of sleep. That, so basically radio silence in small clumps of neurons that are there whilst we're fully awake. And actually, as we get more tired, as we t take up particular cognitive tasks, those periods of radio silence, those areas of the brain that are involved in those islands of sleep, get larger and larger and longer and longer, which is perhaps one of the reasons why our cognitive function declines when we're sleep deprived or when we're fatigued in other ways. And in fact, this has been demonstrated not only in humans, but also other mammals like rats and mice. And it may be that this concept of local sleep is actually applicable to the vast majority of people who say they don't sleep well at night. So insomnia is an incredibly common condition. It affects about 10% of the adult population on a chronic basis. About 30% of the adult population will experience a period of insomnia in any one year. But actually, for the most part, when we record people's brain waves and they say that they've had a very poor night's sleep, that they've had very limited sleep, the total duration of their sleep is actually not that much different from normal individuals. And many of the individuals that I see in my sleep lab who we bring in and record who complain bitterly of having slept only one or two hours, when you pull out the hypnogram, that graph that I showed you earlier, it demonstrates that they slept seven and a half hours, and they are convinced that you must have been recording somebody else. So, so actually, what do we think is going on in these individuals? Well, actually, that's also another example of, uh, of local sleep, in that for those individuals, some more recent work has demonstrated that whilst the majority of the brain remains asleep, those parts of the brain that are responsible for awareness, for consciousness, seem to be exhibiting some sort of waking behavior. So you are actually asleep, although you are aware while you're asleep. So this concept of wake, REM sleep, and non-REM sleep is really even more complicated because there are all these areas of overlap, conditions that some of you may have experienced, things like sleep paralysis or hallucinations as you drift off to sleep or wake up. These all happen at the inter, uh, interface between these different stages of sleep. And so sleep is really very messy indeed, even for the majority of us, for those of us who don't have any sleep disorders. So what about what impact sleep has on our messy world, on understanding our messy world? Well, in our day-to-day -day lives, we consider the way that we understand the world to be a case of our senses, our eyes, our ears, our skin. Uh, other sensory organs, taking information from all around us, funneling it to our brains, and that's how we know what's going on in the world around us. But actually, the reality is somewhat different in that our current understanding of how we understand the world is that the brain is actually a prediction machine. Everything that we experience is really what the brain predicts. 
And it's only when there is a major clash between what our sensors are providing us and what our expectation of the world is that we change our minds. And that's one of the reasons why many of the illusions that you'll be familiar with that you see in the textbooks or on usually the Daily Mail uh, scroll bar of shame that you see um, work, because those are essentially when we are predicting what we're going to see rather than seeing what's actually on the piece of paper or on the screen in front of us. So why do we need to predict? Why does the brain need to work in this way? Well, there are three major problems with taking all the information that's around us and reconstructing our world at any given moment. The first is that the system hasn't got enough bandwidth. Our nervous system is unable to take all the billions, the trillions of bits of information that are happening on an instantaneous basis, funneling it to the brain, and then reconstructing our world on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. The second issue is that, in reality, we all live in the past. And there's a really good illustration of that at the moment if you're watching Wimbledon, because if Andy Murray is serving at you at 131 miles an hour, essentially, by the time the light leaves the ball as it's leaving his racket, it's reaching your eye. Those electrical signals are reaching the areas of the brain that are responsible for conscious vision. It's about 140 milliseconds. So essentially, by the time you're aware of the ball leaving his racket, the ball is hitting you in the face. So we're always living a little bit in the past. And obviously, that has got major implications for our survival. You know, if we only see the saber-toothed tiger jumping out from behind a rock um, by the time it's got its, its teeth wrapped around our neck, that's not very good for our evolutionary uh, perspective. The third issue is that our entire world is ambiguous. And so what I mean by that, this is a really good illustration. So if you see a red bus, a red bus in the distance, well, it could be a big, full-size red, red bus in the distance, but it could also be a little toy bus that's close to you. So really, there is ambiguity in all the sensory signals that are coming into our brains. And as a result, our nervous system needs to take shortcuts. It needs to have a prediction, a model of the world upon which it bases those predictions. And that's one of the theories as to what happens in, sorry, uh, let me just go back one sec. That's one of the theories as to what happens during dreaming. Dreaming is an offline state during which we integrate all of our experiences of life, all our experiences of the day, and tweak that internal model of the world, because that internal model of the world changes. It changes according to our experiences. And these are the sorts of illus illusions that I'm talking about. So this is the rotating mask illusion. We are so hardwired to recognize faces that even when we know we're seeing the inverse of a face, we reconstruct that face as pointing outwards, because we're not used to seeing inverted faces. So despite looking at this mask from the back, it is still perceived as being a face projecting towards you. And it's not just vision that is liable to these illusions. Uh, hearing can also be liable to these illusions as well. So this is uh, something called the McGurk effect, which some of you may be familiar with. Ba, 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 ba. Ba ba, ba ba, ba ba, ba ba. 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 Ba ba. Faces now, ba, and hear ba, what he's saying. Ba ba, ba ba, ba ba, ba ba, ba ba, ba ba. So, so ba, in, ba, ba. I'm going to shut him up. Um, so, so, so in 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 all of those clips, the sound is exactly the same. It's da 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 da. But depending on what you expect to hear based upon the movements that his lips are making, you will hear different things. And I think that's a really powerful example of how expectation trumps reality. So sleep is not 
is obviously important for our understanding of the world. It's, understand, it's important for our physical health. So it's been linked with pretty much every condition uh, that you can imagine, blood pressure, heart disease, weight, diabetes, even cancer risk has, uh, has been associated with circadian rhythm. It's very important for psychological health. Uh, there are very strong links to anxiety and depression, and those links are not just the case that if you are anxious or depressed, you will sleep badly, but also that if you sleep badly, you will get anxious and depressed. And obviously, as I already alluded to, a whole range of cognitive effects, so alertness, vigilance, creativity, and learning. Um, and indeed, many of you will have come across the increasing evidence that sleep disruption and sleep deprivation is associated with cognitive decline and conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So, the big question, how do I improve my sleep? Well, as I said, insomnia is incredibly common. We know that for the vast majority of people, there are really three major things going on. So the first are of conscious psychological factors. So once your sleep has been disrupted for a little while, a lot, a lot of people lie awake in their beds, they feel anxious about the not prospect of the night ahead, they feel anxious about the possibility of not being able to fall asleep, they feel frustrated, or worried about whether or not they're going to be able to perform the following day. And increasingly, with the books and the programs and the um, articles that are out there, worried about the long-term repercussions to their health. But actually, that's only part of the picture. There are a whole range of unconscious psychological factors. So many of you will be familiar with the conditioned response that was described by Pavlov, who rang the bell when he fed his dogs. So we have a very strong conditioned response to bed. We associate bed, for most of us, with being a place where we drift off to sleep, where we uh, fall asleep easily. It's a place of relaxation. But in individuals with insomnia, that, con that unconscious conditioned response has been replaced by a negative conditioned response. So our brain begins to associate bed with being a place where we're awake, where we're hypervigilant, whereby we're uh, exhibit high arousal levels, so we're looking around for danger. And that is probably, those unconscious psychological factors are probably the strongest issue in individuals with insomnia. And if you are very sleep deprived, then you will exhibit changes in terms of certain hormones, hormones like adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, all of which are very conducive towards insomnia. And so people end up in this terrible, vicious cycle. So. How do we try and treat insomnia? Well, a lot of you will have gone to your GP and been told, well, you need to concentrate on your sleep hygiene. You know, make sure that your bedroom is dark, uh, that it's not too hot, not too cold. Don't drink coffee after midday. Don't have a cigarette just before you go to bed. But actually, while sleep hygiene is really important if you occasionally have a bad night's sleep, it's not going to make the difference between you sleeping like a baby and continuing to have terrible insomnia. It's going to be useless at doing that. And actually, what has happened over the last 20 or 30 years is that whereas in the past you would have been doled out sleeping tablets to help you sleep, we now know that sleeping tablets, not only do they have direct consequences of habituation, dependency, um, uh, an increased tolerance, they don't replicate normal sleep. And in the long term, they're increasingly being associated with cognitive decline, once again, conditions like Alzheimer's disease in the long term. And so there's been a real sea change towards dealing with insomnia. And we now really utilize a technique called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is a non-drug-based technique to try and improve people's sleep. And actually, CBTI, for short, is as effective, if not more effective, than pretty much all drugs that we have available without any of the Ill, Ill effects. And is cheap and often free. There are digital versions of it that are available on the NHS. Uh, it can be delivered to you by a practitioner, but there are many avenues down which to proceed if you are uh, having insomnia. Essentially what CBTI is, it's a form of brain retraining. It's trying to re-establish that positive connection between bed and sleep rather than bed and awake. And I think I'm going to leave it there because I'm exactly out of time. Thank you. Uh, do add on Slido if anybody has any questions or see Guy afterwards.
Do you, various strange thinkers, I think Buckminster Fuller was one of them, experimented with what he called the Dymaxian sleep method, which was sort of 30 minutes at a time or something strange. Yeah. Uh, um, at frequent intervals throughout the day. Do you not really support any of those? Do you think there's no real substitute for... Yeah, I, I think there's no... Uh, so, so a lot of people have tried experimenting with their sleep patterns over a number of years, and, and as you know, there's been a lot of attention on this sort of two-phase sleep that apparently was uh, in vogue in the medieval times. But actually what we know is that you need you need seven and a half to eight hours sleep. For most people, there's a huge amount of inter-individual uh, variation, and actually a, s a significant chunk of that needs to be in one go. And then actually it's that cycling between REM and non-REM that is responsible for many of the restorative functions of sleep, both neurological and uh, physiological. Um, now, the big proviso to that is that there is actually fairly good evidence that a siesta is very good for you. So, so the Spanish have clearly got something down pat, which is probably why they live much longer than anybody else, in that, uh, you know, a, a sleep in the afternoon is very good for your blood pressure, it's very good for your mood, it's very good for a range of cardiovascular parameters. So, but, but, but to do this kind of uh, ubermensch method, which is kind yeah. of sleeping for 30 minutes every, every four hours, is not a good use of your time or energy. The siesta, the problem I have with the siesta, I, I may just be too northern European, but when I wake up, I enjoy it at the time, but then when I wake up, I feel like shit for an hour. <laughs> uh, it may just be Protestant guilt, I suppose. Well, but, uh, I, no, I, I, I think you've got to get, you know, as I alluded, the, the, yeah. the brain is a creature of comfort, and it likes to, and it gets used to certain patterns of doing things. I think the key thing with, with uh, any nap, actually, is that... You, what you don't want to do is you don't want to wake up out of very deep, the, the deeper oh. stages of sleep, which you normally enter into within about 30 minutes of sleep onset and then last for about 20 or 30 minutes. So either you maintain a nap that is less than 30 minutes, and generally we say sort of 20 to 25 minutes, to avoid waking up in very deep sleep, or you uh, have a, a longer nap for an hour and a half or two hours so that you're getting through that very deep stage of sleep. But actually, that phenomenon which you... That may be what I'm getting wrong. Well, I think you're yeah. describing... We don't say feeling like shit. We call it sleep drunkenness. Oh, yeah. interesting. So, yeah, that, so that's, 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 that's a technical even term, term for it, yeah. So I have got some questions flowing in here. Uh, what makes some people more prone to sleepwalking, sleep driving, night terrors and so forth? So, so we think that a lot of it is to do with genetics, in that sleepwalking and night terrors is often uh, reported by individuals who have a family history of it. But we know that a range of other conditions can also increase the likelihood of triggering these events. So occasionally I see people who have been started on certain drugs and develop sleepwalking or who develop sleep apnea, so that's very loud snoring associated with choking or other conditions, because what those conditions do is they increase the likelihood of a partial awakening when you're in very deep sleep. Ah. So, um, uh, do you think smartwatch sleep tracking has any value? That's another good question that's come in. Yeah, so, I mean, I get asked this all the time. I think that if you've got insomnia, then sleep trackers are the tool of the devil. Ah. And uh, because essentially what they do is they uh, increase your focus and anxiety about sleep and they cause people to obsess about sleep. I think sleep trackers are kind of interesting. I would prefer if people used them in a, as a sort of you know, research tool rather than um, on a regular basis. If you don't have any issues with drifting off to sleep, that's fine, carry on using it. You know, the, 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 what you have to remember is these are intrinsically different from other devices that we use to metricize our lives. You know, if we use a, a, a step tracker and our step tracker tells us that we've only done 5,000 steps, then we can get up off the sofa and walk another 5,000 steps. If a sleep tracker is telling you, well, you haven't slept enough because you've got insomnia, then what are you going to do? You're not going to, you know, you can't then go back to bed and sleep because you've got insomnia. That's the problem that you've got. Now, I've got another, another fantastic question, comment here from someone who said that the McGurk effect didn't work for them at all, which may mean, it's from Anonymous, which may mean you're a psychopath <laughs> um, because there are certain illusions that don't actually work uh, I think that's true, isn't it, rather, yeah, rather I, annoyingly? I, I, so, uh, there's some... <laughs> anyway, we've got a, we'd expect to have several psychopaths in the room, statistically. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, one or two percent of the audience will be psychopaths. But, but actually, the, 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 you know, the, these, um, 
you know, what you have to remember is that, the, that, that it's a balance between the inputs coming in and the, uh, and the prediction model coming down. Yeah. And, so, and we know that there are certain groups of individuals in whom the, um, the, in, the external information coming in overrides that. So, for example, people with mild autistic spectrum disorder, for example. Um, and, you know, actually, for, uh, in psychosis, in the use of psychedelics, that internal model is stronger than the external inputs coming in. And which so, is why, effectively... Which is why you then start hallucinating. Because, by the way, anybody interested in this, there's a very good book, I think Andy, Andy Clark is the guy at the University of Sussex, yeah. is that right? Which, yeah. is, which is taking from... Actually, Helmholtz in the 19th century, this idea of the brain as prediction engine. And your, your take on that is that sleep is very much where we kind of reset our kind of prior, our Bayesian prior assumptions. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, that, yes, that is the way that I would envisage it, that actually one of the fundamental roles of dreaming is, is to retweak yeah. that prediction machine That's based upon our based upon our experiences of the day. I mean, if, if, if the sign, uh, if, by the way, if the McGurk effect didn't work, there's another thing called sine wave speech, which is fascinating because it reduces a human, a, a human spoken sentence to a kind of sine wave noise. It sounds just like modem noise. I know the younger people haven't got a clue what modem noise is, but it sounds like modem noise. Then you hear the sentence spoken as it was originally. After that, it's impossible to unhear that spoken sentence from the sine wave noise. So suddenly, second time round, your brain makes perfect sense of this kind of sine wave speech, and which is, I suppose, further evidence for this. I mean, the YouTube, if anybody's interested, YouTube is full of these kinds of videos, and I would strongly encourage you. If the McGurk effect didn't work for you, then uh, have a look on YouTube, and if they don't all work, then you need to see a psychiatrist. And there's another great one, by the way, called um, Sesame Street Drops the F-Bomb, in which Grosvenor, Grover in Sesame Street appears to say to almost everybody, that's a fucking excellent idea, uh, when he obviously didn't. So that's, that's a further bit of entertainment. But this is, oh, sorry, right, OK. So. I'm so sorry. Professor Guy Leshner, we could talk to him all day. At least a third of you want to have a chat. Please don't mob him too badly. But um, Professor Guy, thank you so much. And we'd just like to in introduce back onto the stage for a minute or so. Rory, you can stay right there. I can stay there. Uh, okay, we've got right. Professor Paul Zach with a little bit of intel, a little bit of immersion from, uh, from the day. So inquiring mind, minds want to know, is this a great day or just a so-so day? So immersion is normalized to run from zero to 100. Higher is better. 100 is the maximum. 82 is the best event I've ever seen. Woo! Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> now, why is it so high? That's the next question. So I'm showing you the two highest. Next slide, please. The two highest ones. Oh, do I have to do that? There they are. Oh my God, I'm number one. <laughs> well done. How did that happen? Part of that is that relevance I talked about. When I, I was measuring myself, so it was really relevant to me when I was speaking, but hopefully also relevant to other people. So throw me out. Mimi Turner was number two. Awesome day. Thank you guys so much. What a pleasure to be here. Oh, only that. six people were measured, so it's not really valid. It's just to show you how fun it is. <laughs> Thank you. You Fantastic. need to talk to him about measuring your stuff. But this is come to the end now. God, can you believe it? It's like, fuck it. Uh, um, <laughs> anything could happen. And... We're coming to the end, so we've got some tweets. We've called out, we've got some tweets, we've got some tweets that have come in, and I think our winners of the day are not these guys, but thank you very much. Our two winners of the two dressing gowns are Copy Claire at Bartle Beans and Human Hat Stand at Johnny Ego. You've got the world's most expensive dressing gowns coming to you very soon. <laughs> Don't tell our finance director. Um, and that's almost a wrap, Nudge Doc. <laughs> uh, we've got some closing remarks. What were your best bits, Rory? Um, it's impossible to um, actually uh, effectively narrow in on any one thing. But I think the one final thing I, I, I thought uh, was that it's Everything we saw today was effectively a restatement of that fact that when you sit down to solve a problem, as distinct from winning an argument, have no preconceptions as to how that problem is going to be solved. 
You know, no, no, no one would necessarily think prison violence, we need to get a dietician in. I actually met in the audience today one of only 50 um, behavioural optometrists in the UK. Okay? <laughs> That's our messy moment which, right which there. Is, which is an absolutely perfect moment. That actually the first thing you can do is actually just reason backwards. We've got police in the audience, haven't we? That, that's because they're actually paying to attend, not because we obviously were <laughs> not expecting because we don't trust you. major crowd <laughs> disobedience or rioting. Um, but if you look at a criminal investigation, you kind of work backwards. You cover all the bases sensibly, but then you invest disproportionately more effort investigating alleys which just appear promising. But you don't, don't start off with a preconception about how the crime is going to be solved, which is why I think the Sherlock Holmes quote is so apposite. And what I think we learned today was that there are actually hundreds of different ways we could solve problems. What tends to happen, by the way, in politics, I think, is that economists and lawyers have a monopoly on defining the problem and unsurprisingly tend to define the problem in ways in which economics and law have a leading role to play. But actually, there are hundreds of other opportunities to solve problems obliquely and laterally, and we're just not exploring them enough. Marmite, taking the lead out of petrol. I actually wooed my husband with that piece of knowledge that About the lead taking the lead out of petrol would reduce, reduce the crime rate. I mean, he literally fell in love with me because I knew that in, in piece of information. Worth knowing. It's really interesting, diesel. Your best um, bit, Tara? Uh, Nick in the ice bath. It's bloody cold, put your finger in it. <laughs> I, I mean, it's wait to get astonishing. It. Uh, but I think, yeah, vitamins for prisoners and better night's sleep. And God, haven't we learned a lot today? Yeah, my head is as fried as the screen is, I think, <laughs> for very similar reasons. Uh, but my favourite moment fans. in the lobby, that's been the lesson of the day. Fa we need, we more fans. We knew we had no stock fans, but we needed more, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, we all want to say a massive thank you to the people that put today on. A huge a round of applause piece to the team that put it on. And <laughs> including the tech team. And as well, Anna Kearns, who is the... Um, the big brains okay. behind that shot. She's and the big end. coming on stage. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, our sponsors, who've helped keep our feed free for everyone at home all over the world. Thank you to all of them. Um, thank you for being here. What do you want to see next year? Tell us. We're really interested to hear. But I think that's it. I've thrown all my paper on the floor. We've got messy. Hopefully, you're all feeling a little bit messier than you were when you came in this morning. Rory? All that remains to be said is see you next year.